kindly be, uh, be seated. We are starting the event in next two minutes. So I request everyone to please settle down. I hope we had enough time for selfies and all in the morning. We utilize that time for the pictures. So we can settle down now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this beautiful city of hey. Shall I please request everyone to settle down so that we can start the event? Kindly be seated. I, Dr. Monica Kathuria, and my colleague, Dr. Lakshmi Mahato, welcome you all on behalf of NCH to this grand conglomeration of dignitaries and experts from all homeopathic colleges and diversified organizations from all over the country from homeopathic fraternity to attend this special event of orientation and interactive meet for principals of homeopathic medical colleges organized on 24th and 25th January 2023. We wish you all a very productive conference with exciting and encouraging discussions an exchange of knowledge and information so that we can anticipate a future of groundbreaking innovation in the field of homeopathic education and clinical care. To begin with, let me welcome our dignitaries and guests of honor on the stage. Let's first welcome Dr. Anil Kurana, Sir Chairman, NCH. He is there with us as the leader today on the stage. He's an internationally acclaimed personality in homeopathic fraternity. He's an epitome of dedication and diligence towards his profession and extending homeopathy to newer heights. Then we have with us Chief Guest for the event, who's present with us on virtual platform, Vaidya Shri Rajesh Kotechaji, Secretary, Ministry of Irish Government of India. Virtual mode. Next is our guest of honor, Dr. Ashok Varshne, Member, Advisory Committee, Ministry of Irish, Government of India, is here to grace the occasion. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm just introducing you to the dignitaries. And next is Sri Rahul Sharmaji, Joint Secretary. Ministry of Irish Government of India. He has also joined us on the virtual mode as our guest of honor. I heartily welcome Shri Pratik uh, Hajela ji as our special guest today. He is the Principal Secretary, Department of Irish Government of Madhya Pradesh from Assam Meghalaya Kedar, 1995 batch. We also have on virtual mode with us Srimati Sonali Pongshe Vayangankar, our guest of honor. She is Commissioner. Directorate of Ayush, Government of Madhya Pradesh, Indian Medicine System and Homeopathic Department. Next with us is Dr. Subhash Kausik, sir. He is Director General, Central Council of Research and Homeopathy. Next, Dr. K. R. Janardhanan Nayar, sir. He is President, Medical Assessment and Rating Board for Homeopathy, National Commission for Homeopathy. Dr. Pinakin N. Trivedi, sir. He is President, Board of Ethics and Registration for Homeopathy, National Commission for Homeopathy. Dr. Tarakeshwar Jain, sir, President, Homeopathic Education Board, National Commission for Homeopathy. Dr. S.K. Mishra, sir, he is Principal and CEO, Government, of, Government Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, Bhopal. And Dr. Uh, Sanjay Gupta, sir, he is Secretary, National Commission for Homeopathy. We welcome all the dignitaries on the stage. Since no academic celebration is complete without remembering our beloved country, so let us all first stand for national anthem for our beautiful land of Bharat. Yamuna Ganda, Uchana 
This song always gives me goosebumps. It was really a great beginning of the day. To proceed further, dear God, into your hands we place our worries, cares, and troubles. Into your wisdom we place our path and goals. Into your love we place our light. So to begin the uh, session further, I would uh, like all the dignitaries to uh, proceed towards the lamp lightning and garlanding of the bust of Master of Homeopathy, Master Honeyman, and Ma Saraswati. Om Shubham Karoti Kalyanam Arogyam Dhanaspada Shatra Buddhi Vinashaya Deepa Jyoti Namostute Folding our hands before the light that brings prosperity, auspiciousness, good health, abundance, of wealth and destruction of enemies inflict. So let's welcome this group with Ma Saraswati Vandana. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you. 
डॉक्टर रोहित रोडे डॉक्टर शालिनी मिश्रा डॉक्टर सिमी जैन एंड डॉक्टर लागुनी बैनर्जी प्लीज गिव दम अज राउंड ऑफ अपॉर्ड्स फॉर दिस ब्यूटिफुल रिसिटेशन now without wasting any more time let us start the formal program and may i please welcome dr tarkeshwar jain president heb ncs to deliver the welcome address warm and beautiful from the city of lakes uh, the heart of india bhopal i welcome you all on behalf of uh, national commission for homeopathy we are really privileged to uh, be here indeed and enjoying the beauty of this campus but uh, today with us we have some very important dignitaries some of them have joined us virtually and some are physically present so i take pleasure and i feel privileged to first of all welcome our very own vaidya shri padam shri rajesh kotecha ji who is the secretary of ayush ministry of ayush we have with us uh, he is also joined virtually uh, shri rahul sharma ji who is the joint secretary of ministry of ayush government of india new delhi we are also privileged enough to have with us representation from the mp government in the form of shri pratik halija ji who is the secretary of department of ayush government of madhya pradesh we have with us uh, our one of the backbone for ayush system and who is also the member of ayush advisory committee of government of india shri ashok vashne ji uh, we have also uh, uh, feeling lucky enough to have with us madam sonali ji who couldn't come personally because of some other assignment but she has also joined virtually and she is the director of uh, department of homeopathy commissioner and uh, uh, we have with us our own chairperson uh, who is leading nch in a very uh, democratic way and uh, he is certainly directing uh, for the major reforms which are going to take place in the coming time in the system of homeopathic education dr anil khurana ji my both the colleagues uh, president medical assessment and rating board of homeopathy dr kana k r jardan nayar president board of ethics and registration of homeopathy dr pinakin and trivedi uh we want to convey our thanks also and uh, we welcome and uh, it is indeed a pleasure for us that uh, dr sk mishra who is the principal and ceo of comet homeopathic medical college he has not only facilitated this event but made all the efforts to organize this event as we really wanted to make it happen so thank you very much and we welcome you sir we have with us uh, dynamic director general of ccrs central council for research in homeopathy dr subhash kaushik thank you for coming over here sir we have many other guest uh, who are present in the audience also like we have dr pankaj sharma who is the deputy director in madhya pradesh we have a principal of ayurveda college which is situated in the campus of this uh, beautiful land we have former registrar dr aisha ali we have both the commission members here dr hitesh kurohit dr gautam mesh we have our own education board member dr m jatkar and the entire team of uh, nch but one name i forgot to mention uh, which i should definitely thanks also and welcome also our dynamic secretary dr sanjay gupta who has taken all the pains and uh, all the hard work he has put along with the entire team of ghmc to make this event happen in the beautiful city of bhopal and then least but not uh, last but not least for which i am mostly thankful to and i really feel pride and welcoming the entire galaxy of principals of government and private homeopathic medical colleges of india thank you very much to you all for coming in such a large number on a very small request and a very Uh, brief request other i can say the timeline was very not very high while inviting all of you but all of you have made efforts in reaching to this city of lakes and uh, i am very sure the purpose for which this meeting is directed we have kept it as the orientation interaction meet with the principals of homeopathic medical colleges of india and i am very sure with the active participation with the active presence of you all 
we will certainly be able to fulfill our goal, our objective for which the commission is directed to and for which not only commission but rather we all are directed to. So welcome you all, all the con consultants of homeopathic boards and uh, entire team of GHMC who are along with uh, in, the, in the leadership of Dr. Parihar and Dr. Juhi Gupta and other faculty members of uh, this college. They are working tirelessly for uh, for a week time, day and night they are working and uh, they have made this event to him. So thank you very much to all and once again a very warm welcome from the National Commission for Homeopathy all. Thank you. Thanks a lot sir for these welcoming words. Now I would like to invite Dr. Anil Parana sir, Chairperson National Commission for Homeopathy to give the keynote address. Thank you. Respected our dynamic secretary Param Shri Brother Arish Kotechaji, Joint Secretary Sri Rahul Sharma Ji, Dr. Ashok Varshne, Sri Pati Khajera Ji, Dr. Swash Kaushik, my colleagues from NCH, Dr. Aske Mishra, all principals and faculties of Homeopathic Medical Colleges all parts of the country, and the media persons. We know that the National Commission for Homeopathy has been constituted by an act of parliament, known as the National Commission for Homeopathy Act 2020, which came into force by Gazette notification on 5th July 2021. The National Commission for Homeopathy is working uh, with the specific objectives of improving access to quality and affordable medical education in homeopathy, and ensuring availability of adequate and high quality homeopathic medical professionals in all parts of the country, making services of homeopathy medical professionals accessible and affordable to all the citizens and to contribute in achieving national health goals. Also encouraging homeopathy medical professionals to adopt latest medical research in their work and to contribute to the research. Objectively assessing medical institutions periodically in a transparent manner. Maintenance of homeopathy medical register enforcing high ethical standards in all aspects of medical services and to establish effective grievance redressal system. With these objectives, NCH is framing policies and coordinating the activities of three autonomous boards for regulation of educational factors of homeopathy. The Homeopathy Education Board has drawn minimum essential standards for the colleges so as to provide quality education at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. The board has also developed competency-based dynamic curriculum for homeopathy, which would meet the modern requirements for a student to improve knowledge on all aspects of medical subject. And you will see uh, how we have developed this kind of a CBDC in the sessions today. This will further be subjected to a good quality research outcome and output for the development of science and for acceptance of the same globally. So linking research with an education important component in our curriculum. Electives in s related subjects will enhance the skill building in specific areas. Similarly, the Medical Assessment and Rating Board for the Homeopathy has drafted guidelines for assessing the colleges to see the compliance to minimum essential standards to be achieved by the colleges which, which will facilitate quality teaching and share of sharing of knowledge through well-placed infrastructure. And that's why uh, the MARG is going to rate the medical institutions in such a manner that institutions may feel self-regulated. That is our ultimate aim to see that our uh, rating criteria is, is uh, framed in such a manner that you self-regulate yourself that how, where you stand at this point of time. 
Uh, Board of Ethics and Registration for Homeopathy shall also facilitate easy online registration and make practice easy, but see that uh, ethics are followed in research and practice throughout the country in the interest of public. We know that homeopathy in India and homeopathy as such is perhaps witnessing one of its biggest challenges since independence. Poor doctor patient ratio is a reality in India. The greater challenge in the rural urban divide and the poor training and quality of new graduates. NCH will ensure that a minimum standard of quality is maintained and medical graduates are sensitized to country's health needs. Education board will determine the standards of education. With the regulation made under this act, NCH will see that students develop appropriate skills, knowledge, attitude, values and ethics among the postgraduates and super specialty students which enables them to provide health care. Some important expected outcomes which we are going to see in the near future, like national exit test proposed by the bill. Next has been conceptualized as a single test, which will act as a common final year graduate medical exam and be used for granting medical license as well as admission to postgraduate courses. Similarly, a national teacher's eligibility test shall be conducted separately for the postgraduates of homeopathy who desire to take up teaching profession in that discipline in accordance with the regulations made under this act. Steps will also be taken for drafting guidelines for integrative care in various diseases for vaccine clinical benefits to patient care. And that's why uh, there is the current era, the policy of government is going towards taking up an integrative health care. So this will further facilitate that we should uh, acquaint ourselves how we can proceed into this manner. It is imperative that reforms in homeopathy education are need of time and should be aligned with the modern science of human physiology, genetics, immunology and behavior and above all for the purpose of addressing the healthcare needs. Ethical conduct and linking research with education is first for the development of science which needs further. So what do we expect from you? The principals as administrators of homeopathy colleges it is their duty to provide quality infrastructure for training to students for utilizing the same for betterment of human health. Processes of patient's care should be made easy and comfortable to the patients. Faculties are expected that they should keep their upkeep their knowledge regularly and thoroughly. This is how they are they can motivate students towards developing learning attitude and simultaneously they get uh, get respect from their student community. And that's why in the near future, you will see a, a chain of such uh, orientation and training programs for the faculties according to the CBDC. Students of homeopathy, a good physician is treats the disease. A great physician treats patient who has disease. And that is what the basic core criteria of homeopathy. So student must acquire the knowledge with full diligence and sincerity to become great physician. So I conclude by saying that Homeopathy has great potentials, which needs to be highlighted before the policy makers for public benefit at large. Further, to enhance the credibility of homeopathic system of medicine, I strongly believe credibility in today's world depends on claims made on scientific basis. I insist on imparting research training in homeopathy, which will facilitate generating evidence for homeopathy. Homeopathy has won the faith of people due to adherence to the principles of homeopathy by the fraternity in day-to-day -day practice. Colleges should emerge as temples of learning for which principals and all faculties have a greater role to play and I hope participants will be thoroughly sensitized toward expectations of the Government of India, Ministry of Ayush and NCH in achieving goals set for us, providing quality education and coming out with such products who are skilled enough to address the needs of the public health and in the development of science of homeopathy with scientific evidences. I hope the deliberations of today and tomorrow will be highly meaningful and you carry a strong message from us what kind of a strategy and what kind of a future vision we are moving about. I expect a lot of cooperation from the principals and faculties and also of the students. And there is going to be a very strong uh, education life cycle management system which we are going to talk today about. This, is, this will be a complete uh, sea change in the uh, curriculum that you all will be joined uh, 
uh, online through that particular EL system, Education Life Cycle Management System, from student entrance to its exit from the college, all s uh, stages of that going through process of learning will be tracked for each student as well as what kind of a teaching is going on through the faculty that all going to be tracked for this that particular one platform system. And the registration system will also be online. So thank you, thank you for coming here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for inspiring words. And now I welcome Dr. Ashok Vashne, Member Advisory Committee, Ministry of Irish, Government of India, our guest of honor, to kindly say a few words. पर उपस्थित नेशनल कमीशन फॉर होम्योपैथी के चेयरमैन डॉक्टर अनिल खुराना जी मध्य प्रदेश शासन के प्रिंसिपल सेक्रेटरी श्रीमान प्रतीक हरियाला जी सीसीआरएच के डायरेक्टर जनरल डॉक्टर सुभाष कौशिक जी डॉक्टर के आर जनरल नायर जी डॉक्टर राहुल शर्मा जी National Commission for Homeopathy Care Secretary Dr. Sanjay Gupta Ji, Yagya Principal Dr. S.K. Mishra Ji, Pura Desh Bhar Se Aai Uwe, Homeopathy Ke Vikas Ke Liye, Aagle Do Din Me Chintan Manthan Aur Kuch Naya Karne Ke Liye, Aise Sabhi Bandhu Bhagni Gaan. ऐसा मेरा परिचय कराया कि मैं होम्योपैथिक प्रैक्टिशनर भी नहीं हूँ डॉक्टर भी नहीं हूँ बेसिकली बाय केमिस्ट हूँ लेकिन आपके जैसे मेडिकल फर्टिलिटी के बीच में ही काम करता हूँ और पूरे देश भर में जाना होता है और अलग जगह अलग अलग जगह पर सबसे मिलना भी होता है एक सोशल वर्कर के नाते से मैं इस शॉप को कैसे देखता हूं मैं एक दो तीन मिनट में अपनी बात रखता हूं प्रत्येक व्यक्ति परिवार समाज संगठन उद्योग यहां तक कि प्रकृति में भी निरंतर विकास की प्रक्रिया चलती रहती है और यही क्रमिक विकास इवोल्यूशन कहलाता है और उसी के क्रम में कुछ स्थान स्थान पर ऐसे टर्निंग पॉइंट्स आते हैं जो उस विकास को एक नई दिशा देते हैं यह विकास चलता रहता है यह रुकता नहीं है ठीक वैसे ही जैसे हमारे हाथ में मोबाइल है उसकी बैटरी है हम उसको चार्ज करेंगे हम प्रयोग करेंगे तो खर्च होगी नहीं करेंगे तो भी खर्च समय का भी वैसा ही है और किसी भी पद्धति का विकास यह उसके प्रयोग करने वाले व्यक्ति उसके बारे में जानकारी उसके बारे में रिसर्च वर्क उसकी एजुकेशन इसके साथ आगे बढ़ती है जितने भी मैनेजमेंट ग्रुप्स रहते हैं उनको एक एनालिसिस पढ़ाई जाती है इसको हम लोग बोलते हैं स्वॉट एनालिसिस एस डब्ल्यू ओ टी हम अपने इस पूरे विषय को और वर्तमान की परिस्थिति को इस स्वॉट एनालिसिस पर इसके पैरामीटर्स पर रख करके देखें तो हमको वस्तु स्थिति ध्यान में आएगी कि आज की अवस्था कैसी है Sort S stands for strength, W stands for the weaknesses, O stands for the opportunities, and T stands for the threats. Our strength is that we are all homopathy experts here. One point. Homopathy is simple, for the society, is acceptable, and in the whole country, and in the whole world, 
उसके बारे में अच्छी एक्सेप्टेबिलिटी है जानकारी भी है थोड़ी बहुत कुछ कुछ काम भी हो गए हैं वीकनेसेस मैंने और भी स्ट्रेंथ है वीकनेसेस हमारे पास आने वाला विद्यार्थी वो नीट के एग्जाम को क्लियर करके आता है जिनको हायर मार्क्स मिलते हैं वो एमबीबीएस में एडमिशन लेते हैं जिनको लोअर मार्क्स मिलते हैं थोड़े कम रहते हैं वे आयुर्वेद होम्योपैथी अदर स्ट्रीम्स में आते हैं ऐसे बहुत कम विद्यार्थी हैं अगर इस वर्ष को छोड़ दिया जाए तो कि फर्स्ट प्रायोरिटी में वो होम्योपैथी अटेम्प्ट करते हुए और इसके कारण से जैसे एम में प्रवेश लेने वाले विद्यार्थी के मन के अंदर एक सुपीरियरिटी कॉम्प्लेक्स रहता है कि उसने हायर मार्क्स गेन किए हैं इसलिए एमबीबीएस में एडमिशन मिला है और ये सुपीरियरिटी कॉम्प्लेक्स इतना अधिक होता है कि वह सोचता है कि जितना मैं जानता हूं दूसरा कोई भी नहीं जानता भगवान भी नहीं जानता और जीवन भर उसके साथ रहता है ऑन द कॉन्ट्रेरी आयुर्वेद होम्योपैथी में प्रवेश लेने वाला विद्यार्थी उसके मस्तिष्क में हमेशा है मेरे मार्क्स कम आए तो मुझे होम्योपैथी में आना पड़ा या आयुर्वेद में यह जो भाव है इंपीरियरिटी है यह उसके साथ जीवन भर रहता है यह एक कठिनाई है वायुमंडल भी उतना अच्छा नहीं अभी नहीं बन रहा है अभी तक नहीं था ओ स्टैंड फॉर अपॉर्चुनिटीज वर्तमान की अपॉर्चुनिटी देखें तो हमको ध्यान में आएगा कि इससे अच्छा अवसर शायद पहले नहीं सौभाग्य से कहें दुर्भाग्य से कहें कोरोना के कालखंड में होम्योपैथी के क्षेत्र में वर्ल्ड वाइड एक्सेप्टेबिलिटी बढ़ी लोगों को ध्यान दे रहे प्रिवेंटिव एस्पेक्ट्स के लिए भी अलग अलग प्रकार के प्रयोग हुए हैं उसके रूप में भी सबको ध्यान में आएगा होम्योपैथी हमारे लिए एक बहुत बड़ा साधन हो सकती है और एक पहलू है गवर्नमेंट का सपोर्ट और नई नई योजनाएं जो इस समय हमारे लिए उपलब्ध है व्यवस्थाएं भी ये आज की अपॉर्चुनिटी है हमारी वीकनेसेस में और एक है कि हमारे पास जो काम करने वाले हमारे साथ रहने वाली जो फैकल्टी है वह उनमें से बहुत कम ऐसे रहते हैं जो रिसर्च ओरिएंटेड रहते हैं रहते हैं पर्याप्त रहते हैं लेकिन तो भी बहुत कम है जितनी आवश्यकता है उसकी तुलना में बहुत कम है फैसिलिटीज भी कई बार कम रहती हैं, यह भी हमारी एक समस्या है थ्रेट्स थ्रेट्स के बारे में अगर कहें तो हमको सबके साथ कॉम्पीट करना है आगे आने वाली जो चुनौतियां हैं स्वास्थ्य के क्षेत्र में होलिस्टिक हेल्थ सिस्टम है उसमें अगर हमको इंकॉर्पोरेट होना है तो हमको सबके साथ बढ़ना पड़ेगा नीति आयोग पिछले लगभग दो वर्षों से यह इस प्रयास में अढ़ाई वर्ष से कि कैसे सब प्रकार की थेरेपीज को एक साथ एक फॉरम पर लेके आए और इसीलिए धीमे धीमे आयुष एक्शन के जुड़े जितने भी सिस्टम्स हैं उनको प्रोत्साहन मिल रहा है कि जल्दी जल्दी आगे बढ़ते जाए क्वालिटी ऑफ एजुकेशन अलग 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 प्रकार के सिस्टम्स रिसर्च कुछ ऐसे स्थान ऐसे लेबोरेटरीज कि जहां पर हम रिसर्च एक्टिविटीज कर सके ये प्रयत्न चल रहा है सबके साथ कॉम्पीट करना है तो हमको पहुंचना एक चुनौती है और दूसरी एक और बड़ी चीज है जो इंटेलेक्चुअल वर्ल्ड है उस इंटेलेक्चुअल वर्ल्ड में ऊपर से तो एक्सेप्टेंस दिखाई पड़ती है लेकिन जब प्रत्यक्ष करने का विषय आता है तो उतनी स्वीकार्यता नहीं है जैसी चाहिए यह हमारे लिए चुनौती है शॉर्ट एनालिसिस का नियम है स्ट्रेंथ्स के पॉइंट्स को बढ़ाना वीकनेसेस को कम करना अपॉर्चुनिटी का लाभ लेना और थ्रेट्स को फेस करना मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि यह जो वर्कशॉप है 
और जो इसके टॉपिक्स हैं जो मैंने पढ़े हैं थोड़े बहुत उसमें मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि यह हमको हमारी वीकनेसेस को कम करने में अवसर का लाभ लेने में और थ्रेड्स को कंपेंसेट करने में फेस करने में सहायक होंगे लेकिन इसके लिए कुछ पहलू और चाहिए जो बहुत आवश्यक है विषय तो है कानून भी है व्यवस्थाएं भी है लेकिन हमारा इनिशिएटिव कैसा है कितने इनिशिएटिव से काम करते हैं अपने विषय पर ही हमको कॉन्फिडेंस है क्या ओवर कॉन्फिडेंस तो नहीं चाहिए हाँ कॉन्फिडेंस अवश्य चाहिए क्रिएटिविटी का प्रयोग करके हम कैसे उन्हीं व्यवस्थाओं को आगे बढ़ा सकते ऐसा नहीं कि हमारे पास व्यक्ति नहीं है व्यवस्था नहीं थोड़ी थोड़ी हर जगह है ये हमारी क्रिएटिविटी और इनोवेशन है कि उनमें से ही अच्छे व्यक्ति ढूंढकर हम प्रोत्साहन दे सके आगे बढ़ा सके और हमारी सबकी अगर लीडरशिप क्वालिटी रही तो अवश्य ही यह जो आज से लेकर कल तक की वर्कशॉप है यह बहुत सार्थक होगी और होम्योपैथी के क्षेत्र में एक माइलस्टोन के रूप में साबित होगी इस मनस्थिति के साथ और आगे बढ़ने के संकल्प के साथ अगर हम यहां से रहे तो मुझे लगता है इसकी सार्थकता होगी इसकी सफलता की शुभकामनाएं करते हुए मैं अपनी बात समाप्त करता हूं भारत माता की Now I uh, welcome uh, Shri Pratik Khajela Ji, who is with us as a special guest, Principal Secretary, Department of Ayush Government of Madhya Pradesh, to kindly say a few words. कौन सी language में आप लोग prefer करेंगे हिंदी या English? हाँ? Both okay. Let's be bilingual then. क्योंकि मध्य प्रदेश में हम काफी हिंदी का प्रचलन बहुत है और इस भाषा में बात करने से बात बहुत लोगों तक पहुंच पाती है इसलिए मैंने सोचा लेकिन आज यहाँ पे कुछ गेस्ट बाहर के भी हैं तो इन दैट मींस व्हाट वी डू इज दैट वी हैव अ मिक्स ऑफ इंग्लिश एंड हिंदी सो रिस्पेक्टेड राज्य राजेश कपूरता जी सेक्रेटरी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ आयुष गोविंद पंडा श्री राहुल शर्मा जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी आयुष गोविंद पंडा डॉक्टर अनिल खुराना चेयरपर्सन नेशनल कमीशन फॉर होम्योपैथी डॉक्टर सुभाष कौशिक Director General CCRH, other dignitaries on the dais, and principals and faculty members from around 140 um, government and private homeopathic colleges across India, and all other guests present here. Firstly, let me welcome you all to Madhya Pradesh on behalf of the state. On very warm welcome to all our guests who have come from outside MP and those from MP also I welcome you all to Bhopal. Madhya Pradesh is the tiger state of the country. Highest number of tigers we find here and in fact you might find some of them just within one to two kilometers from here. A few months back there were three tigers who were reportedly staying or camping for a few days right in the hill next to this villa. Apart from that, there are many other features of Madhya Pradesh uh, which you might find interesting. Ayush is also very welcome in this state. The people of Madhya Pradesh have been practicing Ayush systems for a fairly long period of time, particularly Ayurveda, Yunani, and homeopathy. So, a very warm welcome to all of you. Dr. Ashok Vashne, some time back, he mentioned that when a student or a candidate appears for the NEET examination, what is usually in his or her mind is that he is some uh, usual allopathic doctor, maybe have a clinic of his own or he has a good practice in his area. Then he doesn't get so many marks and then he gets either Ayurveda or Homeopathy. And 
after passing out, they still continue to open their clinics. But I feel that many of them, they do not practice the passion that they have learned. And they start practicing medicine. Maybe on the outskirts, or maybe in those localities where uh, the regular Ayurveda, uh, allopathic doctors don't practice, in those areas they start practicing. And that's where they come into conflict with the allopathy doctors when they will get reports that some people say that well, these people are not practicing, uh, they are not competent to practice this medicine. So, <coughs> my first request to the principals and faculty members here is that kindly inculcate a sense of pride in our students. Please inculcate in them a sense of pride and also remove any sense of inferiority that they have. I have a strong feeling, and actually it is proven also by a number of our experienced principals, that Ayurveda, Homeopathy, Yurani, Siddhavi and us, I have not uh, much fellowship with it, Homeopathy and Allopathy, they are all complementary actually. There are a number of diseases in which Allopathic, conventional allopathy is not helpful. And let me uh, share with you all that about one and a half years, maybe just about two years back, we had realized that there are a number of medical conditions or diseases in which Ayurveda is very helpful, homeopathy is very helpful, in skin diseases, hair problems, spine, fistula, old wounds, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, infertility, joint pain, digestion issues, and chronic kind of ailments. Lekin hota ye hai ki hum sab ko agar kidney stone hota hai to malum hai ki hum ko kidney stone ke liye kis doctor ke paas na jana hai kis hospital mein jana hai agar humko heart ka koi issue hai to cardiologist hota hai humko malum hai aur hum us doctor ke paas mein ya hospital mein chale jate hain na bhi ho to hum kisi anya hospital mein jate hain aur wahan pe fir wo humko us specialist ki taraf jo hai wo bata deta hai lekin ayurved ka doctor ya homeopathy ka doctor mujhe kaha milega ayurved ki dawaiyan mujhe kaha milegi homeopathy ki dawaiyan mujhe kaha milegi agar main yaad karne ki koshish karu to sab mushkil hota hai aur main kisi se pooch paach ke jaise taise jo hai fir main apna kaam karata hu allopathy ki dukane medicine ki dukane to nazar wahan hamari aur kahin nahi mil sakti to aise mein maine socha ki jab mere ayur sector mein ऐसी बीमारियों का इलाज है तो क्यों ना मेरे लोग उन बीमारियों से निजात पा सकें और उसको रिलीव कर सकें इफ माई आयु सिस्टम हैज द कैपेसिटी टू गिव रिलीफ टू दैम इन केसेस ऑफ सच डिजीज और डिसऑर्डर्स वाई शुड आई लेट दम सफर एज प्रिंसिपल सेट की आई इट इज माई ड्यूटी टू एंश्योर अर्लियर आई वॉज इन हेल्थ डिपार्टमेंट ऑल्सो इट्स माई ड्यूटी टू प्रोवाइड हेल्थ to all the people of my state of my country to maine socha ki kis tarike se hum apne in doctoron ko mareezon ke paas pahuncha sake kaise kaise wo setu banne ka kaam kar sake how i am able to bridge that gap between the patient and the doctor with that intention we opened we started an app which is called uh, ayush cure आयुष इज ए वाई यू एस एच क्योर इज क्यू यू आर ई वैद दे आपके द्वारा आयुष क्योर वैद दे आपके द्वारा दिस इज अवेलेबल इन गूगल प्ले स्टोर इन विच अबाउट हंड्रेड स्पेशलिस्ट ऑफ आयुर्वेद यूरानी एंड होम्योपैथी वर्किंग इन माई गवर्नमेंट मेडिकल कॉलेजेस आई हैव नाइन गवर्नमेंट मेडिकल कॉलेजेस इन द स्टेट सेवर ऑफ देम आर इन आयुर्वेद one of them is this one where we are sitting right now kushinar ayurved medical college and hospital one is 
Madam Holokati, uh, which is the co-host today uh, for this uh, Tuesday meal. And there is another Unani Medical College in Hospital, which is right next door. Uh, all, the, all those three are located in the same area. So we have around, uh, we have nine medical colleges running. So in ke 100 specialists ko humne usme onboard kara, us telemedicine app me, Ayush ke aur Vaidya ke baad, aur COVID ke time mein humne usko start kara tha, to abhi to humne usko nishul kara kha hai, free of cost. Abhi May charge nominal amount in the days to come. But uh, considering the fact that it was COVID time when we started this app, it is as of now free of cost. And uh, you will be happy to note that 55,000 downloads have happened so far. About 17,500 consultations also have happened. And people have got a lot of relief in the kind of diseases that I have just mentioned. Humapati College Hospital जो है मेरा यहाँ भोपाल में इसमें इसके डॉक्टर्स के द्वारा भी बहुत कंसल्टेशन टेलीमेडिसिन के माध्यम से किया गया है और शायद आपको आश्चर्य होगा कि ये जो साढ़े सत्रह हजार कंसल्टेशन हुए हैं इसमें आधे से ज़्यादा मेरे इस Humapati College Hospital के हुए हैं और वो भी फिजियोथेरेपी जब मैंने शुरू में ऐप स्टार्ट करा था तो मैंने सोचा नहीं था कि फिजियोथेरेपी जो है वो मैं इस वीडियो कॉल के माध्यम से करा सकता हूँ लेकिन अगर आप सोचे तो पहली चीज तो ये कि वीडियो कॉल के माध्यम से हम बहुत चीजें कर सकते हैं मैंने एक कंसल्टेशन अपने सामने कराया जिसमें कि फिजियोथेरेपिस्ट मेरे सामने मेरे चेम्बर में बैठी थी और पेशेंट को उन्होंने कॉल करा तो जिस जिस तरीके का एक्सपीरियंस कर रहे थे पेशेंट भी वही वही एक्सपीरियंस करना था तो ज़रूरी नहीं है कि हम सिर्फ एक दूसरे की शक्ल देख के अपने सिम्टम्स बताएं हम एक दूसरे के को देख के हम उन एक्सरसाइजेस को भी करवा सकते हैं और अगर आप सोचें तो सबसे ज़्यादा ज़रूरत तो फिजियोथेरेपी जिसको चाहिए उसी पेशेंट को होगी टेलीमेडिसिन ऐप से बाकी लोग तो स्वयं चल के हॉस्पिटल आ सकते हैं लेकिन जो फिजियोथेरेपी की जैसे रिक्वायरमेंट है उसे ज़रूर कुछ चलने फिरने की या मूवमेंट की प्रॉब्लम होगी तो इस वजह से फिजियोथेरेपी जो है बहुत इससे यूजफुल रहा कोरोना काल के दौरान एक और बहुत अच्छी उपलब्धि हमारी रही वो थी योग से निरोग कार्यक्रम हम पर काम करना मेरे विभाग को दो महीना पहले मुख्यमंत्री उत्कृष्टता पुरस्कार भी दिया गया योग से निरोग कार्यक्रम के इसमें हमने एक लाख पचासी हजार लोगों को जो कि कोरोना पॉजिटिव थे लेकिन एसिम्टोमेटिक या माइल्ड सिम्टम्स थे उनके और उसकी वजह से उनको हॉस्पिटल में एडमिट करने की ज़रूरत नहीं थी लेकिन हमको इंश्योर कराना था कि उनके सिम्टम्स एग्रीवेट ना हो या हम उनको जो भी सिम्टम थोड़े बहुत हैं वो भी हम उसमें भी रिलीफ उनको दिलवा पाए जल्दी से जल्दी तो हमने टेली वीडियो कॉलिंग के माध्यम से डेली हम इन लोगों को योग का प्रोग्राम पहुंचा रहे हैं अभी वो प्रोग्राम मैं फिर रिज्यूम करूंगा कोविड खत्म होने के बाद में और बहुत सारी चीजें आ गई लेकिन उन चीजों को बहुत सराहा गया लोगों को रिलीफ मिला अभी भी टेलीमेडिसिन आयुष क्योर ऐप के माध्यम से बहुत लोगों को ऐसी ऐसी बीमारियों में हम रिलीफ दे पा रहे हैं जिसमें कि एलोपैथी वाले उनकी कुछ सहायता नहीं कर पाए इसके अलावा डॉक्टर अशोक मार्श ने जो मेरे से पहले यहाँ पे स्पीकर थे उन्होंने कहा नहीं लेकिन कुछ महीने पहले माननीय राष्ट्रपति जी भोपाल में उपस्थित हुए थे और डॉक्टर अशोक वार्षण की जो संस्थान है आरोग्य भारती उन्होंने एक प्रोग्राम यहाँ पे कराया था जिसमें कि माननीय राष्ट्रपति जी उपस्थित हुए थे जिसका कि थीम था वन नेशन 
One health system is in need of the other. One nation, one health system. मैंने कि हम complementary तरीके से अगर हम अलग-अलग testing के साथ में काम करें तो कितना लाभ हम अपने लोगों तक पहुंचा सकते हैं, कितना बेहतर स्वास्थ्य हम उन तक पहुंचा सकते हैं। एक हफ्ता पहले ही आज तेईस तारीख है, चौबीस है, सोला सत्रह जनवरी को यहाँ पे G20 का एक event हुआ भोपाल में। मेरा सौभाग्य था कि मैं उसका organizer था। और आप को हैरानी होगी जानके कि उसका theme क्या था। उस event का theme था Global Governance with Life, Values and Wellbeing। यहाँ life, l i f e का मतलब है lifestyle for environment। और उसके अंदर भी एक session था One Health, Wellness and Traditional Medicine। कुछ दिनों पहले एक वर्ष पहले करीब आप लोगों को ध्यान होगा कि गुजरात में WHO सेंटर फॉर ट्रेडिशनल मेडिसिन खोलने का निर्णय लिया गया है। तो कहने का मतलब मेरा ये है कि एक दूसरे के साथ हम कंपीट ना करके पेशेंट के साथ कंपीट ना करके अगर कॉम्प्लीमेंटरी रोल के साथ में हम काम करें तो कितना बेहतर स्वास्थ्य हम लोगों तक पहुंच इस दिशा में काफी काम कर रही है और भारत सरकार की तो टीम है ही कि आयुष के विंग जो है डिस्ट्रिक्ट अस्पताल में भी खोले गए हैं और खोले गए भी हैं इसके अलावा मध्य प्रदेश सरकार ने एक टास्क फोर्स भी बनाया है जो डॉक्टर भूषण पटवर्धन की अध्यक्षता में है और टास्क फोर्स आज भी क्रिएटेड अंडर चेयरमैनशिप ऑफ एमिनेंट डॉक्टर भूषण पटवर्धन एंड देर आर मेंबर्स ऑफ एम्स दिल्ली एम्स ऋषिकेश प्रैक्टिशनर फ्रॉम हाई सिस्टम्स हाउ डू वी ब्रिंग इन दिस कंसेप्ट ऑफ कॉम्प्लीमेंटरिटी एंड हाउ आर वी एबल टू इंश्योर दैट दी एलोपैथिक प्रैक्टिशनर्स गिव क्रॉस रेफरेंसेस टू आर आईयूज डॉक्टर्स एंड आर आईयूज डॉक्टर्स गिव क्रॉस So that this competition ends and we are able to give the best that we can offer to this world and to, to, and to those people who are suffering. Aapko ye jaan ke bhi bhoat khushi hogi ki ek mahina pehle hi humne isi premises me एक सुपर स्पेशलिटी पंचकर्मा सेंटर खोला है। सुपर स्पेशलिटी पंचकर्मा एंड वेलनेस सेंटर। उसकी बिल्डिंग आप बाहर खड़े होंगे तो आपको दिख जाएगी वो जो बीच में लेक साइड का है, उसको देखने का मिलेगा। जो कि हमने है तो वो सुपर स्पेशलिटी सेंटर, लेकिन आप ना बाहर से ना अंदर से कहीं पे भी आपको वो जो हमारी हॉस्पिटैलिटी है और फूड है, वो भी हमने मध्य प्रदेश टूरिज्म डेवलपमेंट कॉर्पोरेशन को दिया हुआ है। डॉक्टर्स शायद आपको एप्रिल पैंसो में दिखाई दें, लेकिन बाकी कोई वहाँ पे आपको जो टिपिकल एक अस्पताल का लुक होता है, वो आपको नहीं दिखाई देगा। इसको हम वेलनेस सेंटर के रूप वही वेलनेस सेंटर को हमने भोपाल में खोलने का प्रयास किया है। हमने ये कोशिश की है कि जो हमारे मसाज करने वाले लोग हैं वहाँ पे, वो ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा हम साउथ से लाएं, जिससे कि ऑथेंटिसिटी जो है, वो हम डिस्प्ले कर पाएं, क्योंकि वो लोग को एक्सपीरियंस है, वहाँ पे जो है द सिस्टम्स ऑफ प the medicines that we use in that uh, uh, Panchkarma Wellness Center are also of much higher quality than what is available in regular government hospitals. Of course, there is a cost attached to it. We have uh, two suites in which uh, the room in which I am staying, in a room adjacent to that, which is also mine, Sona Organic 
this day. The panchkarma table is there actually. So I don't have to go out and get my panchkarma done in a formal setting. That costs around 4,000 rupees per day. We also have other rooms where the suite is not available, but the panchkarma tables are uh, many in number so that there is no queuing at that time. So, here is the hospital here. If you have a panchkarma, you will have to go to the hospital. And of course, you will have to go to the hospital. You will have to go to the hospital. You will have to go to the hospital. But in the past, we have to go to the hospital. So, what do you think? Wellness may be. जो है हमारा आयुष का बहुत योगदान है। आप लोग को मालूम होगा कि कुछ समय पहले पूरे देश में हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस सेंटर्स खोले गए हैं हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस। जब मैं हेल्थ कमिश्नर होता था तो एनएसएम के माध्यम से हम उन हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस सेंटर्स को खोल रहे थे दस हजार से ज़्यादा हैं मध्य प्रदेश में। और जब मैं आयुष विभाग में आया तो मैंने देखा कि यहाँ पे भी हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस सेंटर जो है आयुष के खोले जा रहे हैं। पहले सिर्फ आयुर्वेद के खोले, अब हम होमियोपैथी के भी खोल रहे हैं। 562 हो चुकी है उनकी संख्या अभी तक, 562 और कुछ दिनों में हम इसको 762 तक ले जाएंगे। और अगर वाकई में देखा जाए, तो वेलनेस एस अ कंसेप्ट, व्हिच पैथी इज मोस्ट but if we have to look at options for boosting our immunity, for improving our general health so that we don't fall ill, then I think Ayush is most definitely suitable for us. And that's how I think that health and wellness centers that we will we are running will be performing much better than uh, what the bank is offering to us. Because the basic basics are different. Another thing that you can tell your students is that over a period of time what has happened is that when the allopathic system, the conventional, uh, this um, uh, the new, new medicine, you can say, these opened around 1950s, 1960s across India. Till that time, many of our health rooms were actually being met via systems of Irish. But when these, when these new medical system, new medicine system came, slowly and slowly, uh, it caused a death blow to the IU system and our IU system suddenly went down. If you look at it, so many of the diseases that have come after that, or health conditions, jo hai, anemia, kuposhan, even for that matter, lifestyle diseases, these things have been increased by this reason. कि जो नया मेडिसिन सिस्टम एलोपैथी का आया, वो उसको एड्रेस नहीं कर सकता, और साथ में जो सिस्टम आयुष का इसको एड्रेस कर सकता था, उसको हमने खत्म कर दिया। तो ये जरूरी है कि हम उसको वापस जीवित जीवित करें, और आप अपने स्टूडेंट्स को ये चीज़ बताइए कि आप उसको जीवित करने में आपका कितना एक चीज और मैं बताना चाहता हूँ कि हमारा जो यहाँ पे होल के साथ में जो है ये एक और चीज जो बहुत अच्छा काम कर रहा है वो है जीरियाट्रिक्स अगर देखें आप तो जो वृद्ध लोग होते हैं वो एलोपैथिक हॉस्पिटल में जाते हैं वहाँ पे तो वैसे ही इतनी भीड़ रहती है और हर कोई इतना जल्दी में रहता है तो इन वृद्ध लोगों को कोई समय नहीं दे पाता। थैंकफुली होमियोपैथी कॉलेज में फुटफॉल कम होने की वजह से हॉस्पिटल में फुटफॉल कम होने की वजह से जब वृद्ध लोग आते हैं यहाँ पे तो उन्हें बेहतर महसूस होता है। अब पता नहीं ये प्रयोग कहीं और हुआ है नहीं हुआ है लेकिन अदरवाइज एक गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का प्रोग्राम है एनपीएचसीई नेशनल प्रोग्राम फॉर हेल्थ ऑफ एल्डरली जिसमें कि जीरियाट्रिक क्लिनिक्स जो हैं वह 
डिस्ट्रिक्ट हॉस्पिटल्स में पहले तो मेडिकल कॉलेजेस में खोलने की बात थी उसके बाद शायद डिस्ट्रिक्ट हॉस्पिटल्स में भी ले जाने की बात थी लेकिन सोचिए यहाँ पे वो जीरियाट्रिक जीरियाट्रिक तो एक सुपर स्पेशलिटी भी हो गई लेकिन बहुत कम लोग उसमें मिलेंगे लेकिन हमारे यहाँ होम्योपैथी के लोग बहुत अच्छे से उन जीरियाट्रिक केयर को देने में यहाँ पर सफल हो रहे हैं तो ऐसी बहुत सारी फील्ड्स हैं जो कि खाली पड़ी हैं जिसमें कि हम आयुष को अगर आगे ले जाएं तो हम स्वयं भी बहुत अच्छा फील करेंगे कि हमने कितने लोगों की मदद की और हमारा देश भी जो है बेहतर स्वास्थ्य प्राप्त करेगा एक चीज़ और मैं आपसे अनुरोध करना चाहूँगा कि चूँकि आप लोग इतने नज़दीक हैं यहाँ पे तो मेरा सुपर स्पेशलिटी पंचकर्मा सेंटर ज़रूर विज़िट करें और विश्वास करें कि आपको बहुत अच्छा वहाँ पर ट्रीटमेंट मिलेगा वैसे तो पंचकर्मा ट्रीटमेंट चार या पाँच दिन के लिए होता है सात दिन के लिए होता है पूरा देखें तो 21 दिन लग जाते हैं लेकिन फिर भी एक डेढ़ घंटे में भी आप अच्छा मसाज और स्टीम ट्रीटमेंट वहाँ पे करा सकते हैं तो मेरा अनुरोध है कि जो हमारी नई फैसिलिटी हमने आरंभ की है उसका आप लाभ लें और जब आप वापस जाएंगे तो आपको अच्छी यादें भोपाल की रहें भोपाल में और भी इंटरेस्टिंग चीज़ें हैं ट्राइबल म्यूजियम है यहाँ पे जो कि बहुत ही खूबसूरत है एक ट्राइबल विलेज पूरा क्रिएट किया गया है वहाँ पे राष्ट्रीय संग्रहालय भी है यहाँ पे लेक है यहाँ पे बहुत खूबसूरत और उस लेक के स्कर्टिंग द लेक देर इज़ अ ब्यूटीफुल रोड कॉल लेक व्यू ड्राइव यू कैन टेक राइड ऑन दैट एट जेसिंग टू दैट लेक व्यू ड्राइव is uh, van vihar which is a national park i think the only capital in the country which has a national park in the heart of the city so you can enjoy that it has got very good wildlife there is safari also available if there is anybody who is interested please let dr sanjay gupta know and i'll coordinate with him and i'll organize uh, that safari also for those who are interested so with these few words welcome to bhopal i hope you have a very meaningful two day session and a very pleasant stay and you go back with very fond memories of my city and my state thank you and welcome you all once again The next distinguished to honor us with his presence is the Honorable Joint Secretary, Ministry of Ayush, Government of India, Sri Rahul Sharma ji. He is an IAS officer, 1998 batch of Charkhan cadre. He will be joining us virtually. Thank you. Thank you. Am I audible? honorable uh, am i audible manish ko bulana hai am i audible yes sir okay thank you uh, honorable uh, secretary ayush uh, government of india uh, dr anil khurana chairman uh, chairperson of national commission for homeopathy uh, shri pratik hajela principal secretary ayush government of madhya pradesh commissioner ayush government of madhya pradesh uh, dr ashok varshne is a member of the advisory committee dr subhash kaushik director general of ccrh uh, dr sk mishra principal of the government homeopathic college dr tarkeshwar jain and dr sanjay gupta secretary nch all principals faculties uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, it's a great opportunity for me 
to be amidst you, though virtually. And uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers and especially Dr. Khurana for making me a part of this important event uh, of a conference of all the principals and national conference of all the principals and faculty. Uh, I'll just put things in perspective. Like last decade, if you all have noticed, you all are part of this Ayush system, that it has been unprecedented uh, reforms in Ayush sector. Whether it is in the area of education, reforms, uh, regulation, research, and finally service delivery to achieve the health policy goals of the country. In this background, organizing such a big event of the acad academicians and management of the colleges and institutions is a very significant event. And that to doing it in Bhopal, which is literally the geographic center of the country, I welcome this decision of doing it out of Delhi. And I am really thankful uh, to Principal Secretary, Government of Madhya Pradesh, for uh, uh, helping in organizing this event. In fact, virtually they are hosting it, and uh, for such a warm welcome to all the participants. Creating new uh, modern institutions like NCH and its three boards, if you look at it, are some of the biggest reforms in the last 50 years, which could have been, uh, which would actually bring in huge transformation in homeopathy education and uh, education delivery and research in the country. Post-COVID, if we look at it, the stress and expectations on the health system in the country and even around the world has gone up many times. And most of, her, most of us have gone through it. As a result, the expectation from medical professionals has also multiplied manifold. And here lies the challenge, equipping our all future medical professionals to meet these challenges, to meet these expectations of our huge population and equipping our students with all the knowledge and skills that is required. Ayush can actually play a very great role in complementing the allopathic system of medicine and achieving holistic health for patients and even all the international travelers who look up to these alternative Camera. Okay. Okay.
can you hear me sir yes now yes i did not hear you repeat yeah, yes, okay advice no it's your session you have to speak few words okay yes sir thank you dear colleagues shri pratik ji principal secretary sonali ji dr vasunai ji dr khurana ji dr subhash kausik ji dr janardhan ji dr pinakin ji dr tarkeshwar jain ji dr sk mishra ji dr sanjay ji manch se niche upasthit dr umesh shukla ji evam sabhi dignitaries तो पूरे देश भर से पधारे होम्योपैथी फ्रेटर्निटी के सभी प्रिंसिपल्स और भोपाल से उपस्थित सभी वरिष्ठ आप सबको भोपाल में यहाँ उपस्थित रहने के लिए धन्यवाद और आपका स्वागत वास्तव में इस इस सत्र के बारे में जब चर्चा हो रही थी तो डॉक्टर खुराना जी ने मुझे मेरे साथ डिटेल में चर्चा करी और मुझे ब्रीफ भी किया था नेशनल होम्योपैथी नेशनल कमीशन फॉर होम्योपैथी ने जो ये इनिशिएटिव लिया है मुझे लगता है कि होम्योपैथी के शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में ये नवाचार के लिए खुराना जी और उनकी पूरी टीम बधाई के पात्र है होम्योपैथी के क्षेत्र में हम सब जानते हैं कि पिछले कुछ वर्षों में जो एग्जेम्पलरी काम हुआ है वो उसकी प्रशंसा सब और हो रही है होम्योपैथी एजुकेशन के लिए जो पिलर है कॉलेजेस वो कॉलेजेस के स्टेक होल्डर्स उनके डिसीजन मेकर्स आज यहाँ उपस्थित हैं और जो इन्होंने एजेंडा फिक्स किया है आज के वर्कशॉप के लिए इंटरेक्टिव सेशन के लिए वो भी बड़ा इंप्रेसिव है कई बार क्या होता है जैसे मैं बहुत कम बोलूंगा क्योंकि पहले ही समय ज्यादा हो गया है मुख्य रूप से इनोग्रल के लिए नहीं आए हैं यहाँ दिन भर में हमें काफी काम करना है लेकिन मैं आई वुड लाइक टू टच अपन इम्पोर्टेंट पॉइंट जिसमें इतना बड़ा जो काम हो रहा है कई बार हमें लगता है कि इस प्रकार से इकट्ठा होने का लाभ क्या है देश भर से लोग यहाँ आए हैं इतना ज्यादा खर्च होता है इतना समय भी लगता है लेकिन ये बहुत गंभीर विषय है इसलिए कि 250 से ज्यादा कॉलेज के स्टेक होल्डर्स प्रिंसिपल या उनके मैनेजमेंट के लोग या उनके सीनियर प्रोफेसर यहाँ पर उपस्थित है ये पहली बात दूसरा उन्होंने देश भर से पंद्रह रिसोर्स पर्सन पंद्रह से ज्यादा एक्सपर्ट को बुलाया है और एक्सपर्ट सिर्फ होम्योपैथी के नहीं है वो एन है जैसे विशाग भास्कराचार्य इंस्टीट्यूट गांधीनगर से जिनके आईटी में काफी बड़ा काम है और लर्निंग में के लिए विशाग एन बना रहे हैं वो भारत भारत सरकार का इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ नेशनल इम्पोर्टेंस है कई सीनियर प्रोफेसर को बुलाया गया है सी के डायरेक्टर जनरल भी वहां पर हैं तो ये एक प्रकार से सीरियस एक्सरसाइज है मेरे पहले मैं लगातार सुन रहा था मेरे पहले प्रारंभ में ही आदरणीय डॉक्टर वाष्णी जी ने जो स्वॉट एनालिसिस के बारे में बताया कि मध्य प्रदेश में इतने सारे सुंदर काम जो हो रहे हैं सेक्टर में उसके बारे में बताया तो कुल मिला करके ऊर्जा इस क्षेत्र में बहुत अधिक है उस ऊर्जा को ठीक प्रकार से चैनलाइज किया तो बहुत बड़े बड़े कार्य हो सकते हैं अभी माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी ने पिछले दिनों जब आप गोवा में पधारे थे विश्व आयुर्वेद सम्मेलन के समापन कार्यक्रम में उससे पहले अप्रैल में ग्लोबल इनोवेशन समिट में इन्वेस्टमेंट समिट एंड इन्वेस्टमेंट में भी आप बता रहे थे तो जैसा कि प्रतीक जी ने बताया ग्लोबल सेंटर फॉर ट्रेडिशनल मेडिसिन डब्ल्यू का जो जामनगर में स्थापित हो रहा है 
उसके लिए भी माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी आए थे तो ये सभी उनके सभी संबोधन का आप जरा एक बार देखेंगे तो ध्यान में आएगा कि प्रधानमंत्री जी की अपेक्षा हमारे सेक्टर के पास बहुत अधिक है वो समय समय पर सभी प्लेटफॉर्म पर आयुर्वेद योग और बाकी सभी आयुष सिस्टम्स का उल्लेख करते हैं और उसका उसको एक प्रकार से इस क्षेत्र को हैंड होल्ड करते रहते हैं अभी एस समिट में भी उन्होंने भारतीय चिकित्सा पद्धतियों की बात करी जी के सभी प्लेटफॉर्म पर इसकी चर्चा हो रही है अभी मैं बधाई देना चाहता हूं कि भोपाल में आयोजित टी ट्वेंटी के अंदर भी एक पूरा सत्र उसके लिए समर्पित था और टी ट्वेंटी थिंक ट्वेंटी ग्रुप ने एक बहुत अच्छा रिकमेंडेशन भी किया है माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी की एक अपेक्षा रहती है कि आप ट्रेडिशनल परंपरागत या कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री चिकित्सा पद्धति ऐसा करके आपको कोई प्रिविलेज अपना काम करके दिखाइए और इसी कड़ी में पिछले वर्षों में बहुत सारे कार्य हुए हैं मेरे प्रीवियस वक्ताओं ने इसके बारे में बताया बहुत एग्जेम्पलरी काम हुए हैं और अपेक्षा भी बढ़ी है हमारे सेक्टर की इकोनॉमी भी काफी बढ़ी हुई है पिछले आठ साल में छह गुने से ज्यादा हुई है इक्कीस हजार करोड़ से लेकर के एक लाख पचास हजार करोड़ तक की साइज हुई है सर्विस इंडस्ट्री में भी हमारे जो तो सेक्टर की साइज उससे प्रारंभिक अनुमान एक लाख साठ हजार करोड़ का है तो कुल मिलाकर ज्यादा बड़ी हमारे सेक्टर की साइज है अपेक्षाएं भी बड़ी है उसके अनुपात में कॉम्पिटेंट ह्यूमन रिसोर्स की भी बड़ी दरकार है अभी कॉलेजों में हम लोग फैक्ट्री की तरह हमारे बच्चों को ग्रेजुएट बना करके भेज नहीं सकते दे हैव मोर एक्सपेक्टेशन जैसे माननीय वाष्णी जी ने बताया कि ये सब नीट क्लियर करके आते हैं बेस्ट होते हैं सेक्टर में उनकी अपेक्षाएं भी होती है जब वो आते हैं तो एक्सपेक्टेशन और उन एक्सपेक्टेशन को आपूर्ति करने के लिए हमें अपने आप को हमारे सेक्टर में खास करके एजुकेशन में जिनके लिए हम आज यहाँ बैठे हमें अपने आप को कॉम्पिटेंट करना पड़ेगा सो देट वेन दे गो आउट एज ए प्रोडक्ट दे प्रूव देम सेल्स एज एज ए कॉम्पिटेंट एच आर इन दील्ड ऑफ आयुष पर से एंड स्पेसिफिक टू होम्योपैथी क्योंकि हम यहाँ होम्योपैथी सेक्टर के लोग सब एकत्रित हुए हैं तो ये अपेक्षा जो है ये अपेक्षा इसलिए है कि जिस तेजी से सेक्टर की ग्रोथ हो रही है उस तेजी से यदि हमने इसको एच आर को कॉम्पिटेंट नहीं बनाया तो हम पिछड़ जाएंगे और वो एक प्रकार से होगी जैसे सभी पूर्व वक्ताओं ने कहा कि अभी जैसा माहौल है अभी जैसी जैसे आयुष सेक्टर के लिए अपॉर्चुनिटीज है वो नेवर बिफोर है पहले कभी नहीं था इसको कैपिटलाइज करने के लिए उसको यदि सबसे जबरदस्त आवश्यकता है तो कॉम्पिटेंट ह्यूमन रिसोर्स की है और वो कॉम्पिटेंट ह्यूमन रिसोर्स यदि हम नहीं नहीं जनरेट कर पाए थ्रू क्वालिटी एजुकेशन थ्रू लार्ज स्केल रिफॉर्म्स इन एजुकेशन एंड रिसर्च तो हम पिछड़ जाएंगे इसलिए मैं फिर से एक बार नेशनल कमीशन ऑफ होम्योपैथी अपने उनके लीडर चेयरमैन डॉक्टर खुरा जी को बधाई देना चाहता हूँ कि आउट ऑफ द बॉक्स थिंकिंग के साथ ही आज का ये कार्यक्रम आप कर रहे हैं क्योंकि ये इंटरेक्टिव है आप सब इसमें पार्टिसिपेट करेंगे आपस में चर्चा करेंगे और और उस चर्चा के माध्यम से एक प्रकार से हम अपना अपग्रेडेशन करके जाएंगे मैं ये आप सबको बता अधिक आनंद हो रहा है कि ये जो इसकी थीम है इसके जो सब्जेक्ट्स है उसमें आपने नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी के साथ एन क्या अलाइनमेंट कर रहे हैं उसकी चर्चा कर रहे हैं कैसे अलाइनमेंट कर रहे हैं फिर आपने जो कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड डायनेमिक क्यूरिकुलम जो प्रचलित करने का संकल्प लिया है उसके बारे में आप सेंसिटाइज करेंगे हमारे हायर एजुकेशन में ये प्रॉब्लम जेनेरिक है इट इज नॉट स्पेसिफिक टू होम्योपैथी सभी सेक्टर में नॉट ओनली मेडिकल एजुकेशन सभी सेक्टर में, में अभी भी क्लासरूम टीचिंग के माध्यम से इंफॉर्मेशन डिसमिनेशन को ही एजुकेशन मानते हैं लार्डली नॉट ऑलवेज तो वास्तविक शिक्षा इंफॉर्मेशन डिसमिनेशन नहीं है वास्तविक शिक्षा छात्र के मन में जिज्ञासा पैदा करना उनके प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग एप्टीट्यूड को एनहेंस करना और उनको उस क्षेत्र के विशेषज्ञ बनाना है और उस क्षेत्र में आपने बहुत अच्छा काम प्रारंभ किया है और कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड डायनेमिक क्यूरिकुलम को मेरी मेरा निवेदन है सभी लीडर्स को जो यहाँ उपस्थित है उस वजह ठीक प्रकार से समझे जो यहाँ आए हैं उनसे जरा इस विषय में चर्चा करें और इस नए अप्रोच को 
टेक होम के रूप में अपने साथ लेके जाए उसको नीचे ट्रांसलेट करें अपने शिक्षकों के माध्यम से छात्र तक ऐसे ही आपका एक दूसरा नया इनिशिएटिव है इलेक्टिव सब्जेक्ट्स का आपने ये निश्चित रूप से बहुत बहुत इनोवेटिव आउट ऑफ द बॉक्स कार्य किया है क्योंकि मेडिकल एजुकेशन में इलेक्टिव का कॉन्सेप्ट अभी तक था नहीं अभी और नेशनल कमीशन ऑफ इंडियन मेडिसिन ने मिलकर के साथ में मंथन करके इलेक्टिव का जो ये पूरा इको बनाया है ये काबिल तारीफ इसलिए है कि हम सब जानते हैं कि मेडिकल एजुकेशन इज एन इज नॉट ओनली ए साइंस इट इज ए साइंस बट इट इज एन आर्ट ऑल्सो तो इट इज एन आर्ट एंड साइंस तो जब हम मेडिकल एजुकेशन में उस परस्पेक्टिव को भूल जाते हैं जिसमें हम सोशल कनेक्ट करते हैं उसको इकोनॉमी के परस्पेक्टिव से देखते हैं सोशोलॉजी के देखते हैं उसको हम दूसरे मेडिकल साइंसिस के परस्पेक्टिव से देखते हैं इंटीग्रेटिव अप्रोच लॉट ऑफ पॉसिबिलिटी ये सॉफ्ट स्किल्स की आवश्यकता है हमारी कम्युनिकेशन टेक्नोलॉजी की जरूरत है तो ये सब इलेक्टिव्स आपने डाले हैं और ऑल दी स्टूडेंट्स विल बी एबल टू गेट और दे हैव टू डू सम इलेक्टिव्स ये बहुत बड़ा इनोवेटिव स्टेप है विच इज स्टिल अनएक्सप्लोर्ड है मुझे लगता है कि इससे जो कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड आपके एच डेवलप करने का जो गोल है लार्डली वो आप इसको अचीव करेंगे फिर आपने रिसर्च मेथोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट का भी संकल्पना किया है ये भी बड़ा एक प्रकार से प्रशंसीय कदम है जिसे प्रारंभ से ही ग्रेजुएट लेवल से ही स्टूडेंट्स को रिसर्च रिसर्च के बारे में एक जिज्ञासा पैदा होगी एक मेडिकल एजुकेशन टेक्नोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट भी आपने एनविसेज किया है एक प्रकार से बहुत नया कदम है एडमिशन के लिए काउंसिलिंग का भी आपने संकल्प लिया है ये भी आपका जो कार्य है ये नया है जो उसके बारे में आप लोगों को बताएंगे तो ध्यान में आएगा कि यहाँ आने क्यों आना चाहिए उसके बारे में यदि उनका ठीक प्रकार से सेंसिटाइजेशन होता है तो फर्स्ट चॉइस ऑफ एडमिशन करके भी होम्योपैथी में बाकी आयु सेक्टर में अभी बहुत सारे लोग आ रहे हैं लेकिन ये प्रवाह के रूप में उसको हम लोग कर सकते हैं नेशनल टीचर एलिजिबिलिटी टेस्ट है उसकी उसके बारे में डॉक्टर खुर्रा जी ने बताया लेकिन मैं इसमें एक विशेष बात करना चाहता हूँ कि ये एक एंटा थ्रू एंटायर इकोसिस्टम ऑफ एजुकेशन कॉम्पिटिटिव एज लेके आएगा क्योंकि शिक्षक यदि एलिजिबल होगा तभी पढ़ा पाएगा और यदि वो नहीं होगा तो नहीं पढ़ा पाएगा तो शिक्षकों को भी अपग्रेड करने का एक प्रकार से मौका मिलेगा ऐसे ही एग्जिट टेस्ट की बात हो रही है एग्जिट टेस्ट भी सभी कॉलेज को एक एक कॉमन प्लेटफॉर्म पर रखेंगे हुएवर विल डिलीवर दे स्टूडेंट विल आउट परफॉर्म हुएवर विल नॉट डिलीवर दे स्टूडेंट विल बी सफर तो इसलिए जो सक्सेसफुल एंटरप्रेन्योर्स हैं वो अच्छे के लिए प्रेरित होंगे एजुकेशन में नई ताजगी लेके आएंगे ऐसे बहुत सारे आप लोगों ने होम्योपैथी कमीशन ने जो कार्य किए हैं उसको नीचे तक ट्रांसलेट करने के लिए आज का ये कार्यक्रम है और मैं पुनः एक बार आप सबको बधाई देना चाहता हूँ और आप सबके समय के लिए एक आपका सबका धन्यवाद करना चाहता हूँ नमस्कार
uh, on, on your behalf. Um, then I request our president, uh, Mark, Dr. K. R. Janardhanan Nair, to please kindly welcome Dr. Ashok Varshne. I would again like to welcome uh, Shri Rahul Sharma ji. I think we got disconnected. I think he's connected again, sir. We welcome you on virtual mode. So, uh, a round of applause for him. He's patiently waiting. For I request Dr. Pinakin and Trivedi ji, sir, President BERS, to kindly welcome Shri Pratik Hajela ji. Our special guest, uh, Srimati Sonali Pongshye Vyangankar, uh, who is also there on virtual mode with us, we would like to welcome her. Madam, welcome to the ceremony. Dr. Lakshmi, you can take over. Further, I would like to request Dr. Subhash Kausik, sir, to present uh, Subhash Kausik, sir. And I would like Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir, to present Momento and Bukhe to Dr. Subhash Kausik, sir. Now I would invite Dr. Parihar sir to present a bouquet and a memento to Dr. K. L. Janardhana Naya sir. <laughs> Further, I would like to request Dr. Avasti sir to present a bouquet and a memento to Dr. Pinakin and Trivedi, sir. Keep the applause going. <laughs> now I would re request Dr. Juhi Gupta, ma'am, to present a bouquet and a memento to Dr. Tarakeshwar Jain, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Mangesh Jatkar, sir, to present a bouquet to Dr. S.K. Mishra, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. P. N. Pal Chaudhary, sir, to present a bouquet and a memento to Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir. Thank you all dignitaries and the guests who honored them. Thanks a lot. For further, um, without wait, doing ado, I would like to request Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Gupta sir to please give few thankful words to the audience. <coughs> Honorable dignitaries and leaders of homeopathy, aap sabhi ko namaskar 
आप सभी का अभिनंदन स्वागत इट इज एन ऑनर एंड प्रिवलेज फॉर मी टू एक्सटेड ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ईच वन ऑफ यू हु इज प्रेजेंट वर्चुअली एंड फिजिकली विद अस एंड हु हैज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड टू द सक्सेस ऑफ दिस फर्स्ट ओरिएंटेशन एंड ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम फॉर प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ होम्योपैथी कॉलेजेस ऑर्गेनाइज बाय द नेशनल कमीशन फॉर होम्योपैथी दिस आइस ब्रेकिंग इवेंट वॉज कंसीव्ड एंड डेवलप्ड एज अ स्ट्रैटेजिक इनिशिएटिव बाय द कमीशन टू सी अलायंस विथ ऑल अवर स्टेक होल्डर्स फॉर द बेटरमेंट ऑफ होम्योपैथी टीचिंग एंड प्रैक्टिस इन सर्विस ऑफ द नेशन मध्य प्रदेश द हार्ट ऑफ इनक्रेडिबल इंडिया इज ऑनर्ड टू विटनेस दिस ग्लोरियस इवेंट अवर हेल्ड हार्ट फेल्ड ग्रेटिट्यूड टू द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ आयुष फॉर प्रमोटिंग एंड गाइडिंग अस विद देयर फाइनेंशियल एंड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव सपोर्ट ऑलवेज स्पेशल मैंशन of the guidance and support of shri vaidh rajesh kotecha ji secretary government of india ministry of ayush our sincere gratitude to shri dr ashok varshne ji member advisory committee government of india ministry of ayush the torch bearer of the growth of holistic health with ayush in the nation we humbly express our special thanks to honorable shri rahul sharma ji joint secretary government of india ministry of ayush for his unconditional continuous support to nurture this meet with folded hands we express our gratitude to honorable श्री प्रतीक हलेज हजेरा जी प्रिंसिपल सेक्रेटरी गवर्नमेंट ऑफ मध्य प्रदेश डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ आयुष एंड ऑनरेबल श्रीमती सोनाली पी वायंगनकर जी मैम हु हैज बीन ऑलवेज इंस्पायरिंग अस विद देयर सपोर्टिव जेस्चर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ स्टेट गवर्नमेंट इन एवरी वेंचर ऑफ होम्योपैथिक एजुकेशन एंड सर्विस and not only restricting to activities of commission thank you sir thank you ma'am we cannot forget to thank the remarkable leadership of dr s k mishra sir principal government homeopathy medical college and hospital bhopal and his never tiring team for providing floor to this event and creating such an ambiguous environment for the homeopathy family assembled in the city of lakes from across the nation the participant representatives of each homeopathy college from every nook and corner of the country whose presence upholds the desire to take homeopathy to the horizon with nch our heartfelt gratitude to the friends of print and electronic media for providing wide coverage to the event importantly the doordarshan and the public relation department of state government of madhya pradesh with all leading print and electronic media personnel here i extend my thanks for all perceptible and imperceptible support from new life laboratories persons from security people from bsnl people from catering services mpb madhya pradesh electricity board and personals of ayush auditorium team and of course each family member of the national commission for homeopathy besides thanking you all i took up privilege to mention few names who has been always with me with silence and behind the curtain none other than deputy secretary government of madhya pradesh shri pankaj sharma ji and my members of the commission shri 
Dr. Hitesh Purohit sir and Dr. Gautam Ash sir. I thank you all once again on behalf of commission and I apologize if something happened inadvertently, I beg pardon for the same. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. And we are also so thankful for welcoming us to your beautiful city. Uh, there is some special mention of uh, guests who have just joined us. Uh, Shri Pankaj Sharma, Deputy Secretary, Department of Ayush, Madhya Pradesh. We can just welcome them with a big uh, applause. And Dr. Umesh Shukla, he's a principal and CEO, Pandit Khushi, uh, Khushilal Sharma, Ayurvedic Institute, Bhopal. And now, uh, I think we need a tea break. So uh, there's a break for 10, 15 minutes for high tea, and you can proceed towards the dining area. And we will start the technical session soon after that. Thank you so much. There is an announcement. Those doctors who have missed registration, they may go to registration counter and get their registration.
after going through all the changes that we have made in the regulation, the salient features that we convey to you through these regulations, eventually in the last session, we all will be having open discussion. There you will all have a chance to interact with the all commission officer bearer also about any query, any doubt that you have regarding the regulation, you are always welcome to pose your queries and we will have an open and healthy discussion. See, the prime aim of uh, whether it is commission or whether it is any educational body all over the India, whether it is in a college or a university, prime objective of every institution to promote and to ascertain and to assure a good quality education in homeopathy. For that, all common purpose, we all are gathered over here. I hope everyone agree with my this notion. I don't think anyone would disagree because that is the our main objective for forming the commission also. And uh, one one word which I could pick and sentence which I could from the speech of uh, Dr. Ashok Varshne when he was talking about the students who are appearing in the meet and eventually he used one word which always hurts as a teacher, as a practitioner, as an academician. This word always hurts that our students feel inferior when they go in the field. ये सबको hurt करता है कि नहीं करता है सर हम सब एक ही बिरादरी के लोग हैं मैं यहाँ खड़ा हूँ आप वहाँ खड़े हैं इतना ही फर्क है एक दिन आप यहाँ खड़े होंगे मैं वहाँ खड़ा होऊँगा मैं वहाँ बैठा होऊँगा तो इतना ही फर्क है ज़्यादा फर्क नहीं है हम लोगों में हम सब एक ही बिरादरी के लोग हैं तो ये सब ये जो शब्द है ना कि हमारे यहाँ जब बच्चा आता है और जब पास होकर निकलता है तो अपने आप को वो इन्फीरियर महसूस करता है ये शब्द बहुत हर्ट करता है ये सेंटिमेंट को एकदम चुपता है कि ऐसा क्यों वाई वेयर वी आर लेकिंग हम क्या ऐसा नहीं कर पा रहे हैं कि हमारे यहाँ से जो बच्चा पास होके निकलता है वो उतना कॉन्फिडेंट फील नहीं करता अपने आप को इन्फीरियर फील करता है और डॉक्टर वॉश ने तो होम्योपैथिक डॉक्टर नहीं है उनका जो परसेप्शन है वो एक कॉमन मैन का परसेप्शन है वो एक टीचर का परसेप्शन नहीं है वो एक होम्योपैथिक डॉक्टर का परसेप्शन नहीं है वो एक कॉमन मैन का परसेप्शन है तो कॉमन मैन के मन में ये फीलिंग है कि होम्योपैथिक से जो डॉक्टर बन निकलता है वो कहीं ना कहीं किसी न किसी लेवल पे इन्फीरियर फील करता है ये बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है हम लोगों के लिए और ये बहुत बड़ा पेनफुल पॉइंट है और अगर इस पॉइंट को हम अगर टाइमली एड्रेस नहीं करेंगे तो यकीन मानिए हम उठ जाएंगे हम रह ही नहीं पाएंगे तो ये बहुत ही हाई टाइम है कि हम विचार करें हमारे पाठ्यक्रम में हमारे शिक्षा नीति में हमारे पढ़ाने के तौर तरीकों में क्या ऐसी कमी है जिसकी वजह से जो हमारा बच्चा है वो अपने आप को इनकॉम्पिटेंट फील करता है तो ये एक मेन ऑब्जेक्टिव है जिसको ध्यान में रखते हुए कमीशन का गठन किया गया और इसी को ध्यान में रखते हुए इसी इसी दिशा को अपने अंदर सोचते हुए एजुकेशन बोर्ड की तरफ से रेगुलेशन बनाए गए हैं जो आप सबने देखे हैं तो हमारी जो जर्नी है वो इन कॉम्पिटेंसी से कॉम्पिटेंसी की तरफ है ये जर्नी हम सबको करनी है और इस जर्नी में कमीशन का रोल खाली रूल्स और रेगुलेशन बनाने का है लेकिन कोई भी रूल रेगुलेशन मैंने डब्ल्यू में भी ये बात कही थी कि कोई भी रूल रेगुलेशन तब तक प्रभावी नहीं हो सकता जब तक उसको अप्लाई करने वाले हमारे आप जो साथी लोग हैं वो ये नहीं ठान लेंगे हमें इसको अप्लाई करना ही करना है अदरवाइज हम कोई भी रूल रेगुलेशन बनाए इट विल नॉट स्टैंड एनी मीनिंग अनलेस यू गैज आर इन सपोर्ट ऑफ अस यू आर होल्डिंग अवर हैंड्स वी आर होल्डिंग योर हैंड्स एंड देन ओनली वी कैन मेक एनी रेगुलेशन टू बी इफेक्टिव एंड जो हम विजन लेके चल रहे हैं वो हम अचीव कर पाएंगे तो मैं कुछ सेलेंट फीचर्स जो इस रेगुलेशन के हैं वो मैं आपके आपको डिस्कस करना चाहूँगा एक अगर आप हम देखें बी एच एम एस की जो डेफिनेशन एक्ट में मुझे नहीं लगता है आप में से कितने लोगों ने पढ़ी है मैं उम्मीद करता हूं सभी ने पढ़ी होगी पर उस डेफिनेशन में अगर हम देखते हैं तो कहीं कुछ बड़ा डिफाइन किया है डेफिनेशन को बड़ी इलेबरेटेड डेफिनेशन है द बैचलर ऑफ होम्योपैथिक मेडिसिन एंड सर्जरी शेल प्रोड्यूस ग्रेजुएट्स हैविंग प्रोफाउंड नॉलेज ऑफ होम्योपैथी विद कंटेम्प्रेरी एडवांसमेंट इन द फील्ड सप्लीमेंटेड विद नॉलेज ऑफ साइंटिफिक एंड टेक्नोलॉजिकल एडवांसमेंट इन मॉडर्न हेल्थ साइंस and related technology along with extensive practical training be able to function as an efficient holistic health care practitioner in health care service in the urban and rural area dekhiye bahut badi zimmedari hai agar aap definition ko dhyan se padhe aur usko agar atmasat karte hain to bahut badi zimmedari hai colleges ke upar bhi aur commission ke upar ki hame ek aise homeopathic graduate produce karne hain jo na sirf shikshit doctor ho खाली डॉक्टर की ही डिग्री उनके पास नहीं हो वो एक बहुत ही जिम्मेदार नागरिक भी हो जो देश के हर कोने में जाके इफिशियंटली कॉम्पिटेंटली काम कर सके अपनी सर्विसेज दे सके ये हमारी सबकी मिली जुली जिम्मेदारी है और इसी को ध्यान में रखते हुए रेगुलेशन में जो बदलाव हमने किए हैं आप सबने पुराना करिकुलम भी देखा है 
और पुराने सिलेबस भी देखे हैं पुराना एम भी देखा है और आपने नया रेगुलेशन भी देखा है और सभी जानते हैं कि काफ़ी व्यापक बदलाव हुए हैं लेकिन उन बदलाव के पीछे जो कारण है वो है जो हमारे एक्ट का जो पर्पज़ है जो कमीशन का पर्पज़ है हमें वो अचीव करना है बहुत रेजिस्टेंस आए बहुत विरोध भी हुआ जो हमने बदलाव किए क्योंकि कहीं ना कहीं वो कहीं ना कहीं कुछ हितों को वो कहीं ना कहीं एड्रेस कर रहे थे जिनकी वजह से बहुत रेजिस्टेंस भी डेवलप हुआ लेकिन फिर भी जो मैंडेट कमीशन को मिला है जो ऑब्जेक्टिव कमीशन लेके चल रहा है डेफिनेटली वी हैव टू गो फॉर दैट इ रेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ एनी अमाउंट ऑफ रेजिस्टेंस वी रिसीव वी हैव टू इम्प्लीमेंट आवर पॉलिसी एंड फॉर दैट वी रियली वॉन्ट यू ऑल गेस्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड वॉट आर द रिक्वायरमेंट एंड हाउ वी हैव टू प्रोसीड फर्दर दिस इज द वन मैकेजम एज आई टोल्ड यू वी हैव टू मूव फ्रॉम इन कॉम्पिटेंसी टू कॉम्पिटेंसी एंड दैट इज दन मेजर रीजन वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मैंडेट इन द रेगुलेशन इन द एक्ट इट सेल्फ इन द नेशनल कमीशन फॉर होमपैथी एक्ट इज द इम्प्लीकेशन एंड इम्प्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड डायनेमिक करिकुलम सो द करिकुलम इज एंटायरली गोइंग टू चेंज द टीचिंग पैटर्न आर एंटायरली गोइंग टू चेंज and very soon we will be having the already we have made it in public domain and soon it will be uh, implicated in colleges also we have devised the first year bhms competency based uh, dynamic curriculum already and soon it will be conveyed to the colleges also where we have elaborately defined that any particular subject that you are uh, teaching in the classroom should be focused on developing the competency it is not the purpose of teacher to just go in the classroom and take the uh, A, a traditional form of lecture and uh, i am also basically a teacher i know very well if i am if i am teaching in a class of 100 students i know out of those 100 students only 10 are there who are genuinely conceiving what i am teaching them rest uh, all are either passing the time or not so much connected and the purpose of class is not fulfilled we all know this very well because we all are basically teachers but our aim is that any student who is enrolling for homeopathic courses they should have this competency whatever they are being taught in the classroom should be practical enough that they feel confident and they are able even to the last batch student who is in there the class should be able to understand what is being taught to him and that is what is taught is managed and the directions are given in the competency based dynamic curriculum i just want to share a brief information also because this uh, this cbdc program is going to be effective in the coming session and uh, we are soon organizing zone wise meeting we will address to we will go to every zone we will call to that particular zone colleges especially the teachers of first bhms because we are beginning with the first bhms only and it is uh, since the regulation has already become effective so now it is the high time that all the teachers of first bhms should be sensitized should be well aware about how this cbdc is going to take place and what changes what methodology they have to adopt while teaching matter medica while teaching repertory while teaching organon or anatomy or physiology these or the pharmacy which are the core subject of first bhms now so that is the main prime purpose and we are conducting the zone wise meeting and i just want to give information we have sent the mails to all the colleges also the colleges of maharashtra colleges from gujarat and colleges from goa we are going to organize our first cbdc meeting workshop in pune in dy patel university from 13 february to 16 february so it is my request to all the principals of that particular region that please depute one faculty of first phms of each subject each subject on the particular day we are keeping session for anatomy on 13 14th is for physiology 15th is for pharmacy and 16th is for organ and repertory and matter medica so accordingly you have to send your faculty it is a mandatory provision because unless our teachers will be sensitized about, about cbdc we will not be able to achieve our target and we don't want this regulation to remain limited only in the papers it has to be implemented and whatever the assessment university is going to take in future aap sab logon ne regulation dekha hai assessment pattern is also drastically changed to jab tak aap us tarike se padhayenge nahi tab tak aap usko assessment bhi nahi kar payenge assessment pattern is drastically changed so it is very essential that every zone teacher is well sensitized about the intricacies of cbdc how it can be implemented in the classroom how the assessment can be done everything is very well elaborated our cbdc team has worked tirelessly and very hardly and main aapko batate hue mujhe bahut acha bhi lag raha hai ki ye jo banaya hai ye banane wale sab hamare homeopathic doctor hai mujhe aisa lagta tha ki ye cbdc ka jo pattern hai jab maine pehli baar dekha to mere bhi thode se mujhe laga ki how it is possible to make such kind of elaborated curriculum i inquired in the other commissions also nmc took one and half year to prepare this first MBBS CBDC curriculum NCISM took one year to prepare 
first P, first PAMS CBDC curriculum, but our teachers, all were our own teachers, they prepared this document within one and a half month. So big round of applause for all the teachers and our entire CBDC team. We have Dr. Muni, Dr. Bipin, and Dr. Payal Bansal who guided them effectively. And all the teachers did really hard work. They worked day night. And all that curriculum is prepared by those teachers only. But it is my humble request to all the principals of all the zones. We will be notifying the date periodically. But the first program is scheduled from 13 to 16 February. I make it a point. Every first BHMS teacher should be present in that program. So that is my humble request to you all. Then coming to the curriculum. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, you all know very well. Is it visible? I think it's poor. Yeah, it's poor. But I, I'll read out. Uh, we will be beginning our session with the foundation program. Aap logo ne sabne regulation dekha hai, so I will not go detail mein nahi ga, time is also limited. But we have to begin with foundation program. We have very well designed foundation program that is now part of regulation also. As in an exam, you all might have gone through. So when you are beginning the session, because I know that 18 February is the last cutoff date of enrolling admission in the BHMS program, and then you all have to start the session. So to begin with, you can start with the foundation program. This is the 10 days exercise, six hour teaching, directed mainly for the various things which are already listed in the foundation program. And this is not only related with the homeopathy, but it is related with the some extracurricular exposure also, how to develop interactive skills, how to develop some IT skills, how to develop some emergency health management procedures. All those are the part of foundation program. And I feel in the very beginning, when a student is enrolling to become a doctor, they should be able to understand their responsibility, how they have to work in the community, what are their responsibility, in which stream they are going on, all these are the part of foundation program and that has to be started from the very beginning. Then uh, we, are, we have also proposed online attendance system of various teaching and training activities. And clinical training is an essential part. As you have seen in the uh, definition of BHMS also, that more focus is given on the clinical training. Now, in our earlier curriculum and syllabus, clinical training, usually or the ward posting usually used to, used to take place either from the end of second year or from the third year. Most of the colleges used to send doctors or students in OPD in the third BHMS only, not even in the second year. But now we have proposed and we are uh, initially initiating this step that our students who are enrolling in the very first BHMS, they should go in the OPDs. Reason is very clear. Because uh, we know how many dropouts are there. You all suffer from that, that the person who is enrolling for the first, first BHMS, they stay in the first BHMS, but their whole goal and direction is towards to qualify the next need. What I I have seen this, that even the 80% students are is, is still there, more focus is towards that, uh, should I get selected for the next need. So, what is the class of the class? It is दूसरा जो बड़ा ड्रॉबैक जो मुझे करिकुलम में लगता था कि जो हमारा होमपेथिक इंट्रोडक्शन है, that used to start late. We were not teaching mathematics in the first BHM as the way it has to be. We were not teaching organ and in the first BHM the way it has to be. Repetitive used to come quite late. The होमपेथिक ओरिएंटेशन जो उसका होता था, the beauty of होमपेथी, effectiveness of होमपेथी is used to counter either from the end of second BHMS or third BHMS. So we don't think that we are in field, we can do in that field. So what is our scope, what is our limitations, what is our homopathic science? And what can we do to level the disease? This can't happen until a new child goes to OPD and sees the disease that I am reading, the disease is also the disease. Because the confidence, whether it is a doctor, whether it is a student, it can be developed when the disease is fine. And our ultimate test is when it is in our clinic. It is in our ultimate test. It is in our clinic. All the universities fail. All the degrees fail if you are in the clinic. और जो satisfaction, जो confidence हमें जब महसूस होता है, जब हम clinic में मरीज ठीक करते हैं, वो confidence ही हमें हमारे बच्चे को on day one से देना है। उनको मालूम पड़ना चाहिए कि homeopathy की beauty क्या है और homeopathy कैसे ठीक कर सकती है। That will certainly boost the confidence and clinical skills also. That is the one major reason why we are starting clinical training from the very first day. It is not mandatory that you send to every student in the OPDs also, but you can send to the peripheries, you can send to the communities. एक बड़ा एक अनफॉर्च्यूनेट पार्ट है कि हमारी कॉलेजेस का कम्युनिटी आउटरीच प्रोग्राम बहुत कम होता है। हमारे इंस्टिट्यूट्स बहुत कम कम्युनिटी में जाते हैं और ये एक वजह भी है कि कई बार अगर आसपास कहीं किसी एरिया में जाओ हमारी इंस्पेक्शन टीम कई बार जाती है और पूछती है कि यहाँ पे कोई होमपेथिक मेडिकल कॉलेज है तो वहाँ के आसपास के लोग भी नहीं जानते कि यहाँ पे कोई कॉलेज है भी क्या क्यों क्योंकि हमारी कम्युनिटी आउटरीच नहीं है 
तो ये बहुत जरूरी है कि हम कम्युनिटी आउटरीच बढ़ाएं वो हमें डबल इफेक्ट देगी ना केवल होम्योपैथी पॉपुलर होगी बट उसी कम्युनिटी में रहने वाले जो बच्चे हैं जो उसका इलाज लेते हैं जो उसका इलाज लेंगे वही हमारे फ्यूचर एंड रूलिंग स्टूडेंट भी होंगे तो कम्युनिटी आउटरीच बढ़ानी बहुत जरूरी है इसीलिए हम चाहते हैं कि फर्स्ट ईयर से हमारा बच्चा न सिर्फ पेरीफ्री में जाए न सिर्फ ओपीडी में जाए बल्कि कॉम्युनिटी में जाए कॉम्युनिटी की प्रॉब्लम को समझे उनको अंडरस्टैंड करें और इस हिसाब से अपने को ढालने की कोशिश चालू करें तो दिस इज दन मेजर स्टेप दैट वी हैव बीन है प्रैक्टिकल ट्रेनिंग वुड स्टार्ट ऑन द फर्स्ट बी एच एम इट सेल्फ देन अनदर इम्पॉर्टेंट फीचर फॉर विच कोटेचा सर ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एंड इट इज द मैंडेट ऑफ कमीशन ऑल्सो दैट वी आर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग इलेक्टिव देर आर सर्टन कंफ्यूजन ऑल्सो अबाउट द फॉर्म ऑफ इलेक्टिव अबाउट द ऑपरेशन ऑफ इलेक्टिव हाउ इट विल बी इम्प्लीमेंटेड इन द कॉलेज सो वी हैव ट्राई टू मेट एवरी थिंग इन इन आवर रेगुलेशन वेरी क्लियर बट स्टिल इफ देर इज एनी कन्फ्यूजन वी कैन हैव वी कैन डिस्कस वेरी ओपनली इन द आफ्टरनून सेशन टुमारो टुमारो एंड यू कैन शेयर योर वीज एंड वी कैन ऑल्सो अप्लाई यू वॉट आवर डायरेक्टिव वॉट आर आवर पर्पज वाइल प्रपोजिंग इलेक्टिव बट द मेन पर्पज इज दैट स्टूडेंट शुड ऑल नॉट ओनली रिमेन लिमिटेड टू द नॉलेज ऑफ होम्योपैथी ऑल्सो ओनली बिकॉज दे हैव टू गॉन गो इन द कॉम्युनिटी दे हैव टू रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर दिस कंट्री ऑफ इंडिया ऑल्सो फॉर द सोसाइटी ऑल्सो सो उनका ओवरऑल डेवलपमेंट होना चाहिए इसीलिए हमने तरह तरह के इलेक्टिव प्रोड्यूस किए हैं जो हमारी साइंस से अलग जो भी स्ट्रीम्स हैं चाहे वो अदर साइंसेज को लेके हैं चाहे वो आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस को लेके है चाहे वो कम्युनिकेशन स्किल्स को लेके है अलग अलग तरह के हमने इलेक्टिव डिजाइन किए हैं और पैटर्न हमने ये रखा है कि हम फर्स्ट ईयर से ही सेकेंड सेमेस्टर के बाद से ही बच्चे को इलेक्टिव में एनरोल करना है वो इलेक्टिव उनके लिए मैंडेटरी रहेंगे दो तरह के इलेक्टिव होंगे एक इलेक्टिव हम ऐसा प्रपोज करेंगे जो हर बच्चे को करना ही करना है वो उसके लिए मैंडेटरी है और एक के लिए हम एक लिस्ट प्रपोज करेंगे इट वुड बी लिस्ट ऑफ लेट्स से टेन टॉपिक्स इट विल बी प्रपोज बाय द कमीशन इट सेल्फ एंड आउट ऑफ दैट टॉपिक ही हैज टू सेलेक्ट वन तो दो इलेक्टिव हर साल में बच्चे को फर्स्ट ईयर में सेकेंड ईयर में थर्ड ईयर में करने ही करने हैं दीज आर द मैंडेटरी प्रोविजन एंड दे विल बी रिफ्लेक्टेड द ग्रेडिंग ऑफ इलेक्टिव वुड बी रिफ्लेक्टिंग इन द यूनिवर्सिटी मार्क्सिट ऑल्सो सो इफ एनी बडी हैज नॉट गॉन थ्रू इलेक्टिव हैज नॉट कम्प्लीटेड इज इलेक्टिव ही विल नॉट बी अलाउड टू अपेयर इन दी summative examination of the university so this is very clear and it is very important aspect also although all these exercises would be online there were many question whether the college himself has to conduct the elective or the commission would conduct now it has been taken up by the commission that commission would conduct is it as an online activity we will provide the course content we will provide the speakers student has to enroll in our website for the elective there would be certain hours of lectures by the experts and then soon after the lecture there would be assessment and according to the level of assessment there would be grading and every student has to score minimum c grade there would be a b c d e five grading every student has to score minimum c grade for being able to register for the final university examination i hope this part is clear but still if there is any doubt about the operation of electives we can discuss in the afternoon session then we have introduced certain new subject also uh, as you all are aware about the department that has been changed we have added fundamental of psychology in the first bhms earlier in our regulation we proposed it as a separate subject but later on the comments came that it should be the part of organon only so now we have merged it with the organon but there would be a paper for this particular uh, stream there would be 50 mark paper for the fundamental of psychology then there is essential of modern pharmacology there had been many accolades from the different streams and there had been equally criticism about the application about the inclusion of modern pharmacology in bhms curriculum this is modern essential of modern pharmacology is being included in our curriculum and the purpose is very clear we are not allowing we are not proposing this course content for the purpose of practicing allopathy not at all because if you study our regulation and then on the other side on the parallel side if you go through the regulation of uh, ethics board you will uh, find that it has been very clearly mentioned in the regulation itself why talking about the ethics no cross pathy is allowed so the purpose is very simple that we just want our student to get the knowledge because we are receiving patients from every sphere and we all are aware that most of the time patient is coming to us when let's say he is coming from asthma but he is coming to us for the treatment of asthma or for the rheumatoid arthritis with a history of long intake of steroids of many nsaids and variety of drugs they have been using since long and uh, many time we are not able to make out whether this is the disease portrait or a drug portrait so in order to understand the symptoms of uh, 
the drugs that he has been consuming for the long period of time, we have introduced this uh, subject in the BHMS curriculum. The purpose is very clear, just to make aware, just to make informed student about the pharmacokinetics of various drugs a, a, a patient is regularly using in his healthy life. That is the only purpose. And besides that, our students are many times suffering and depriving from various posts, like they are having a community health officer services post, community health worker post, where our students are not able to enroll because of the non-inclusion of these uh, knowledges. So that is also one of the reasons why we have included this. But this, not at all, our regulation never says that anybody after studying these essentials of pharmacology would be in a position, would be allowed to practice allopathy. It's a, it's a big no. It's very clear. And then another important subject, as Sir told, that research is an essential part of our system. And uh, very less focus and attention was given to the research in homeopathy. Either it used to be the part of PG education or you go for the PhD, then only some research implication used to take place. But we might know none of the science can survive, survive unless it is based on research. And research is a continuational evolutionary process. It doesn't come in one day. So our effort is to imbibe the seeds of research to prepare the graduates who are having that insight, that aptitude to conduct research in future. And that is the reason why we have included research methodology and biostatistics in our BHMS curriculum also. Earlier we proposed it as a separate department, but uh, we received many suggestions that since the syllabus is very brief, we are just proposing a 50-hour study. Of course, in PZ and PhD courses, they are having the advanced knowledge about the research. But in BHMS curriculum, since we are proposing a brief introductory profile, so that at least they can develop aptitude. And that is the reason why now this department is clubbed with community medicine. So community medicine, we have stressed a bit more. Hours are also increased. And uh, there would not be a separate department for uh, research methodology, but that will be a part of community medicine. But again, there would be a separate paper. In final year, there would be a separate paper for this particular aspect. So these are the major changes that are being taken place. Another big change, yes, sir. take back. It's moving itself automatically. No, it is connected. Probably hold on the on the screen where I am talking. This is going to go further. Or back, or back. I am just on the second screen. Another important change is duration. As we all know that our earlier syllabus was, earlier pattern of division of PHMS was uh, 12 month, 12 month, 12 month, and 18 month. But now we have reversed it. You all are well aware that now the first year would be of 18 month, second year for 12 month, third year for 12 month, final year for 12 month, and then one year compulsory rotatory internship. That is the scheme that we have included, and we have now included sufficient hours, sufficient syllabus for Metromedica, for Organon, and we are introducing repertory also in the first PHMS. The reason is very clear that we want our homeopathic subjects to be introduced in the very beginning. All the intricacies, all the salient features of our subjects should be very well versed with the student even in the first PHMS. So these are the major changes. And then another important fe feature is because, as I told you, it is an evolutionary process. We have to go along with, we have to go together, and we have to advance also. And that is the one reason why there is a description about SMART. SMART is a, a committee that uh, HEB will form in consultation with the commission itself, which will be indulged on regular evolution of syllabus. It's not that once we prepare the curriculum, once we design the curriculum and our work is done, it's not like that. It is a regular evolutionary process and the design of committee is made in such a way. It is, there is one core committee where beside other senior faculty teachers, there would be experts from some other streams also. 
Same way we have subject expert committees also. There also not only we have the subject expert, but we have some other technical experts also. And the purpose is that we have to advance. We have to consume and accept all the advancement, technical advancement that are going to change, take place in our other systems, in our neighboring area, in our education system, in our national education policy, in our health policy, whatever changes are being taking place, our committee would observe they will meet and they will eventually propose to the board for the implications. So it is a very important change and we don't have to stay on the curriculum that is being designed just now. We have to evolve and we have to make further changes also. This I already spoke. I will not repeat the things. Uh, next slide, please. But I have to do it myself. Emphasis on clinical training. I already spoke about that. Electives, I already about. Then another important feature is internal assessment. Earlier it was not the part of our examination, but now it is a mandatory part for every BHMS examination. There would be periodic test and there would be term test also. Six month term test and three monthly periodic test. That will be the essential part of every BHMS examination. And unless a student is qualifying internal assessment, he will not be allowed to appear in final examination. Like elective, he has to clear all the internal assessment and the passing criteria is minimum 50% mark. So unless he is not able to achieve 50% mark in internal assessment, he will again be not allowed to appear in the university examination. In fact, we have prepared a format for the mark sheet also, which we have shared with the university people also. That mark sheet will have a clear reflection about the grade of electives and about the scoring a student has done in the internal assessment. Although the weight of internal assessment, we wanted to keep it 20 marks, but we are, there were many reservation and comments that giving this much percentage of marks in the internal assessment may invite some ambiguities also. And that is the reason why we became a little moderated and now the weight of internal assessment is 10 marks. And that will be in the, in the manner of oral viral uh, viva examination. Oral examination, viva examination, you can conduct in various ways. If you go through the, uh, all the outlines of the regulation, you will find that we have defined many ways in which you can assess your students. It is not just the oral examination or viva examination. It can be even a project presentation. If you are satisfied that a student is good enough in presenting a particular given project, you can assess that student for the internal assessment. So there are many ways that we have listed in the regulation itself, which will be very helpful in assessing the student on internal level. But it is very essential part and every student has to qualify all the internal assessment in order to be qualified for the final BHMS examination. Minimum marks required, 50% uh, is the passing criteria for uh, qualifying for the next BHMS. Examination pattern we have very well defined in curriculum also, but the theory examination shall have 10% mark for MCQs, 40% mark for SAQs, short answer questions, and 50% marks for long explanatory questions. This is the examination scheme <coughs> we have shared with the university also, and we expect that from the coming session this scheme will be implemented in all the colleges and university. Attendance is a very important part. And we are uh, making sure that 75% is the minimum attendance a student need to have for appearing in the examination. And for that, I know this is a very tricky uh, situation. It is very difficult to bring a student in the classes regularly, but we are preparing such kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, after my presentation, there would be an online presentation by BISEC team, which is an uh, uh, institute located in the Gujarat. Uh, and this team is given assignment by the government of India, Ministry of Ayush, for developing a portal which is known as Education Life Cycle Management Portal. And from there, the student, the moment they enter in, this, in any institute after qualifying need or through counseling, the moment they enter in the institute, they will be enrolled in that particular portal. And their entire life cycle in the institute would be governed by that particular portal. So it would be very difficult for a student now to take uh, this uh, facility of non-attending the classes. If they are not attending the classes, they will not be allowed to appear in the examination. And eventually this entire activity would be somewhere governed by the commission also. It is not only the institute which is monitoring the student attendance of a student, 
it, is, it would be the commission also which will be able to see at any moment of given time that how many students are available in a particular college of Maharashtra in the given time and in, in, a, in a given lecture. We will be able to see through a master dashboard that the system is so foolproof and competent, there would be a short demo of that system also because eventually you guys have to implement that system also. So everything would be monitored online. So we don't want that our students simply remain enrolled for the namesake in the register and they don't come in the classes. No, they have to present in the classes also. Conduct of examination, there will be a regular examination and a supplementary examination and the difference and the gap between the one examination to supplementary examination we have reduced uh, to three months now. And uh, rest of the things, I think you all can go through the regulation itself. Everything is very clear. But again, if you have any kind of doubt about the conduct of examination, about the chances, about the attempts, you can certainly have, uh, we can have discussion in the afternoon session also. Assessment would be in the form of formative and summative. So assess, a student shall be assessed periodically to assess his performance in the class determine the understanding of Bachelor of Homeopathic Medicine and Surgery course material and its learning outcome. This will be a continuous phenomena. If you go through the, if you go through the draft of CBDC, which I will share very soon with all the colleges, and you will realize the draft itself is prepared in such a way that assessment would be a regular phenomena. Once you complete any particular exercise, any particular topic, any given uh, heading of a subject, automatically there would be an assessment. So assessment would definitely be a regular part now. It will not be a one-time activity in the year. It will be a regular phenomena once you enroll yourself or once you start teaching through CBDC pattern. That is the beauty of CBDC. The important thing is that what you have taught yesterday, how much your students has grasped. That we really need to know. So that would be a continuous phenomena. Periodical assessment shall be carried out in practical and at the end of teaching of a topic or a module on a particular portion of syllabus. And this is the scheme uh, which we have shared in the regulation also. For the first BHM, since it is the one and a half year course, we have two terms and three periodical tests. And for rest of the BHMS, we have one term test and two, two periodical assessment. And all these would be uh, essential for every student clear in order to become eligible for going to the final BHMS examination. These are the summative assessment and uh, I don't need to go in the detail. You all might have gone through the regulation also. This will be conducted by the uh, university, but there will be a double evaluation system also. And depending on the number of students are present in the practical examination, accordingly, you have to decide how many internal examiner you need to have, how many external examiner you need to have. That is all made clear in the regulation itself. And these are the number of lectures or the teaching hours which are given in the syllabus. Uh, and uh, as you all can see that in the first year, lecture hours are 1071 and non-lectures are 975. In second BHMS, lecture hours are 942 and non-lectures are 462. In third BHMS, 895 and 509. And fourth BHMS, 731 and 673. So that is the pattern how the theoretical lectures and practical lectures on the non-lectures hours will be going on. In first year, there is 60 hours of foundation course also and that assumes and that sums to 2046 hours in total. Migration of a student during the study, migration can be permitted, but there are certain guidelines which are very clearly mentioned in the regulation itself and following to those guidelines, a student can be migrated from one college to another college or from one university to another college, depending on the situation, conditions they are posing and the requirement they are fulfilling. So that is made clear in the regulation also. And then a very important program is compulsory rotatory internship training. This we have elaborated highly. And uh, we have introduced uh, an introductory program and a finishing program. And in introductory program, you have to orient the student about the internship, about the job aspect, about the future perspective. There are many things. If you go to the draft exclusively and exhaustively, you will find there are many changes which are directed. The purpose is that the student who is enrolling for the internship should be well aware about the uh, pro about the future prospecting, what he can do when he go in the field, what are the other options, everything is very clearly defined. And internship is also made modular now. And there would be two options. The one option is that uh, the entire internship is being done in the college itself, in the collegiate hospital itself. The another option is that he can choose to stay for two months in a community health center, in the primary health center, in the any research unit of CCRS or in any NABH accredited medical hospital. 
So these two options are available, and it is up to institute, not for the not for the student to decide which option he is choosing. We have made it very clear. It will be the responsibility of the principal or the medical superintendent to op to adopt which option is amicable for a particular student. That has to be decided and discerned by the uh, teacher or the administrator or the superintendent of the hospital itself. And then internship would also be evaluated in a proper way. There would be research project also. And that is the one major reason why we have introduced research methodology in the BHMS final year curriculum. Because the students should be well aware about the research protocols, about the different uh, modalities of the research, so that he is able to accomplish his research project during internship in a very comprehensive manner. Otherwise, nowadays I see that the internship projects are just mere uh, namesake projects are there, no one is deeply involved, but we really want that the internship project should be done seriously, it should be followed by the processes, and uh, uh, students should be well about, about the all research modalities. So, uh, internship would be evaluated, it will be scored also, it will be graded also, and according to the grade, student will be able to obtain certificate from the medical superintendent or from the principal, whoever is the administrator of hospital. So, that is very clearly made. Now, there are some common questions which are available or which are, uh, of course, uh, popping up in everyone's mind that when it will be applicable. So, as I told you very clearly that uh, this become effective from the day it is notified. So, there is no confusion about this. This is effective. And the moment you are going to start session in your college, you have to adopt this new pattern of DHMS of 18 months. According to you have to retain your faculties. According to you have to develop your departments. And according to you, you, you have to teach in the colleges also. And as far as the curriculum is concerned, as I already told you, that commission is in process of organizing zone-wise seminars. Although time is, I know, time is limited and uh, we have to make it implemented. But we are trying our level best that we organize all four zones work wo workshops within a one month time. First week is directed for the uh, western zone where Gujarat, Maharashtra and Goa is included. Next week we are going to organize in the all the colleges of south probably in Bangalore or in Hyderabad. Then we are going to the east and then we come to the north. So this way we are trying to finish uh, all CBDC workshop within one month time so, so that at least one teacher of each college of each particular subject would be in a position to take up the uh, CBDC pattern and to sensitize and to start teaching in that way. That is the main uh, aim of our college. And another important feature that I will talk in the MSR also that, where we have told that every medical institution has to set up a medical education technology unit in the college. This is a mandatory provision. And the reason is because since we are evolving and many technical advancements are taking place in the education and we have to remain in consonance with the NEP also and with the other system also. So it is very essential to have medical education technology department where the teachers uh, need to have some orientation about the MIT workshop which also commission would conduct regularly. We will provide certificate also so that you can use those teachers those particular department for the further dissemination because it is not possible for commission to call every teacher of college and to start organizing workshop, no. We will train some of your teachers about the education technology also, about the CBT also. But now this is the responsibility of principal, of the director of the college to further disseminate that knowledge to every individual department. That is the main role of medical education technology department in the college itself. Now coming to another regulation that is uh, 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 MSR which you ordinarily used to say is now converted, it will be now popularly known, popularly known as MES, it is Minimum Essential Standards. This regulation is also in the words of notification, it has uh, been uh, uh, kept on the public domain in the, in the September itself. And we received, as I told you, thousands of comments, good, bad, all, everything was there. We analyzed those comments and then we put in the uh, commission meeting also from there. Also, I am happy to inform that from there also it has been approved now. And now it will go to the ministry for the legal waiting. And soon after legal waiting, it will be gazetted. So more or less, the whatever features that I will display in the MES itself, you can assume that they are implemented now because it has already obtained the commission approval. And just we are waiting for the legal uh, competencies. And once it is legally approved by the law ministry, it will be gazetted on the Indian Gazette also. 
And these are the major changes about the department. I already told you now, instead of 12, there will be 13 departments. One more department for the yoga, because this is uh, one basic Indian science which we need to promote also, and which is uh, very good for the holistic development of entire uh, system of health. So we have incorporated yoga for health promotion, and some hours of yoga are uh, divided in all the BHMS. In all four BHMS, there are certain hours of yoga teaching, yoga practices, which are the part of uh, their curriculum also. And this department, earlier we thought of putting in the uh, college itself, but now we have relaxed that this yoga department can be located either in the college or in the hospital as per the convenience of the uh, operating body. For that, we don't have any reservation. Uh, regarding the land, because uh, uh, existing colleges, uh, of course, we are not making any change because whatever the infrastructure they are prevailing right now, they can continue with that, although we want that even the existing college should come up with the higher changes, with the changes, with the positive changes that commission has defined in MEC, MES. But it's still, they may take their time also, and I know it is not possible to make the overnight changes, especially in terms of infrastructure and land. But uh, for the new coming colleges, it has been made at entry that if the college is located in the urban area, there has to be 2.5 acre land. My colleague, Dr. Jadkar, will give more explanation about this part when he will talk about the new establishment of colleges. But the, in the rural area, it has to be 3.5 acre, and in the urban area, it has to be 2.5 acre. And hospital building, we prefer that it should be located in the same premises, but if by any reason it is not possible to have the hospital building in the same premises, then up to five kilometers, they can establish hospital also. And it is always good that uh, there should be an interconnected, kind of, we prefer that at least hospital should be in the same compound, either as a separate building or as an interconnected building, interconnected building. And the land should be clearly demarcated for the purpose of empathic education only. We received this practical problem while conducting this inspection many times that one piece of land is demarcated for homeopathy also, for Ayurveda also, and we have caught many such cases where it has been found that one, uh, one the same land is uh, allotted for BAMS also, and the same land is allotted for BHMS also. And since both commissions are working parallelly, we are just up and down, and many times we have seen that these kind of disparities are available in many of the colleges. So it is very clear now the college has to be exclusively demarcated through the resolution for the homeopathic college only. It is very clear now. Entire capacity uh, is uh, you can apply for up to 100, up to 100. We have uh, left the provision of 60 intake capacity. These uh, standards are designed for any institution which is going to impart education minimum for 100 seats. This is the entire capacity. Commission has a power to call information. I don't need to go that in very much delay. And if uh, any way these standards are not followed or if there is any way of observance of failure to imply these regulations, as you all know that MARB is regularly conducting inspections and assessing the uh, part one data from the, obtained from the colleges on the basis of then existing MSR, but now every institute, whether it is new or old, would be assessed on the basis of these new regulation also, only, and not also, I term use the term also, it's not also, it's only, only on the basis of these MES 2022, and any student which failed to uh, comply these regulation would be penalized as per the section 20F, 28F of MARBH of the NCH Act, and the uh, and the penalty can be in any form. It can be the denial of permission, it can be the uh, subtraction of seats, or it can be the financial penalty also, as in when it is being decided by commission from time to time, that will be conveyed. But any failure to comply these regulation would result into penalty for the clause, so for the college. So this is something very clear. Then, uh, there are three schedules in this MES, Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3. Schedule 1 talk about some mandatory requirements, uh, which is biometric attendance, which is now made uh, uh, essential for every individual college. The attendance will be accepted only when it is registered on a biometric attendance, and the commission is in process of installing Irish-based attendance system very soon. We, we have already contracted to the vendors, and they have started working also, and soon, there would be a centralized iris based attendance system installed in all the colleges and the team from uh, uh, centre would go to all the colleges, they will visit, they will guide, they will uh, uh, make the learning session also and this would be implemented very soon. But till then, 
whatever the biometric pattern is applicable has to be followed correctly and the attendance will be counted only through biometric attendance system. There would be closed circuit TV we have already enabled in a different part of MES where and how it has to be installed we have already clearly mentioned. Teaching room should be well equipped with uh, internet facility also and we have also made provisions of installation of a smart board in a phased manner. We don't say that uh, in the very first year you have all five smart boards. It can be upgraded in the phased manner at least two smart board per annum. Website, uh, there are many changes which are given in the website also. You just go in that particular section and you will realize that most of the information has to be kept on the website, even the record of OPD, uh, lecture record, everything has to be very clearly put on the website. There should be a very exclusive dashboard for every individual college and the, uh, the intent is that commission is able to view because it is not uh, many times feasible to send inspection team physically to every part of India. We don't have that much big force with us. So we are in a process to evolving a scheme where we don't need to go for inspection. Commission ka jo ultimate intent hai, sir ne bhi abhi apne lecture mein kaha tha. Our ultimate intent ye hai ki hum ye inspector raj hi khatam karna chahte hai. Hum nahi chahte ki koi bhi inspector college mein jaye aur record aap se maange. Hum chahte hai ki aap apna record apne aap apne system pe upload kare aur wo itna transparent ho ki hamara yahan pe server mein baitha hua jo hamare technician hai, jo hamari team hai, usko assess kar paaye, usko understand kar paaye aur uske accordingly aapko na sirf permission mile balki aapko grading bhi mile kyunki ek jo hamara ek bahut bada mandate commission ka hai assessment and rating criteria uska purpose hi yahi hai ki jo assessment assessment ho wo sara online ho aur usi ke accordingly aapki jo qualities hain infrastructure mein aapke academics mein aapke hospital side mein jo aapki qualities hain uske accordingly institutes ko jaise nac rating karta hai jaise nabs credential dete hain waise hi hamara commission bhi rating dega and this will be very helpful because aajkal ke jo bacche hain wo bahut aware hain aur jab bhi wo kahi admission lene jate hain na sabse pehle dekhte hain university ki ranking kya hai to definitely any institute which is maintaining a high ranking would always be benefited in terms of admissions also and in terms of raising their fee also that will also be the part of that ranking so uh, that and that is why we want a system which is so much transparent that there is no physical inspection needed everything is uh, well uh, maintained at institution level in such a transparent way that any moment of time we are able to assess what is your OPD in a particular time in a particular year in a particular day how much patient are being actually seen these all systems are going to take place in very soon. My colleague Dr. Dharmendra Sharma will also talk about the learning management system, how it will be effective and uh, how these all transparencies can be actually practiced and seen. Then we have introduced small group teaching facilities because we don't want that a, a class of 100 is taught by one single teacher. There will be some division of the students, minimum, uh, maximum 30 students in a one small cl classroom, sit for a one particular uh, topic, have an interaction. The only aim is that whatever you are teaching should be equally grasped by the students. Biomedical waste management system has to be implemented. Department-wise requirements are already listed in Schedule 1 that you can see uh, in the schedule itself. Uh, in uh, in new college certainly we have made many ch many changes earlier for the establishment of a new college there was requirement at side of college humko kareeb 1775 square feet ka square meter ka humko area chahiye tha lekin abhi jo naye regulation bane hain uske accordingly har college jo naya establish hona chahta hai unko 2940 square meter area 2940 square meter area is essential for any institute which is coming for the new establishment. Beside that, any existing institute which is running with the 60 capacity or 50 capacity, if they want to upgrade to the 100 seats, it is very clear now that they have to follow the new regulation. There would be no any leverage whenever you are willing to increase your intake from 60 to 100 if you want to go, existing colleges also, you have to follow the new regulation, the new infrastructure norms, new building norms and new departmental norms that you have to follow. Then in existing colleges, you have to make three changes in your existing uh, infrastructure also because as I told you, research methodology is now clubbed with community medicine. So we have increased the area of community medicine. Now it would be 100 square meter. And since we have established two new units, there is one medical education technology unit for which it is essential for existing institute also to have a 40 square meter area. And yoga is also introduced and for that also we require 40 square meter area in the existing institution. So these are the three changes that we have made essential for the existing medical institution also. 
regarding staff, uh, of course, um, there are some changes that we have made department-wise, which have been conveyed in the uh, MSR also. And uh, there are a few things which I uh, earlier also I announced when, when talking in the WSD, that there were many queries that if you have the higher faculty and you don't have the lower faculty, so would it count in the eligibility? So now it is very, very made it very clear that if a higher cadre faculty is available in any particular department, and if there is a scarcity of lower cadre department, it would be entertained. This is made very clear and that will be acceptable now. And uh, we have seen, especially in government institution, where we, we many times see that the teachers are sent on the deputation. And the period of deputation sometimes becomes unlimited. It is said to be six months, but the, uh, the teachers are not coming back for the two years. And eventually the academic suffers. So these kind of practices will have to be stopped. If any teacher is sent on the, uh, on the deputation, then for that particular period, a new teacher has to be appointed, whether it is on the contractual basis or on the regular basis, that is up to the, up to the college management. But that has to be supplemented by or for the period of deputation for which the teacher is sent to other department. So this we have clearly uh, mentioned. And uh, it is also uh, made uh, for, uh, for the teaching of modern pharmacology and for the teachers of fundamental of psychology, we are not proposing the regular faculty because the teaching hours are very limited. Just 50 hours teaching you have to impart for a sense of modern pharmacology and 50 hours for the resumetology. For that, we are uh, not proposing a regular teacher, rather we are giving an option that you can hire a visiting faculty from the nearby medical college and the qualifications are also defined in the uh, schedule three. And according to that qualification, you can hire a visiting faculty for teaching these two particular subjects. But there is one major change from now onwards, so once this MEC is effective, MES is effective, there would be no guest faculty or visiting faculty in the, col in the college. Guest faculty are totally abolished. For the teaching of yoga in context to homeopathy, a yoga instruction shall be appointed on a regular basis with qualification as specified in Schedule 3. And this is the structure of uh, uh, teaching faculty in every individual department. I just uh, uh, spell out Mathematica, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. Organon, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. Pharmacy, one professor, one reader, and one lecturer. Homopathic repertory, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. Anatomy, one uh, professor, one lecturer, and two lecturers. Oh, sorry, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. In physiology, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. In forensic medicine and toxicology, it can be either professor or reader, and one lecturer. In community medicine and research methodology, one professor, one reader, and one lecturer. In pathology, it can be one professor or one reader and one lecturer. In gynecology, one professor, reader, and lecturer. Practice of medicine and essential of pharmacology, one professor, one reader, and two lecturers. So in total, every college has to manage 40 faculty in their institute. This is the mandatory provision. And there is no provision for guest faculty or part-time teachers. And then we have introduced one more aspect in MES, that is the practicing consultant for modern medicine or homeopathy. The purpose is that in order to sensitize our student about the modern techniques, about what is ongoing in the other specialties of field, about uh, to take the expertise in many cities, we have many senior homeopaths who are practicing for the last 30, 40 years and disseminating their knowledge to students. But they are not academically associated. So now the student uh, colleges has a facility. They can avail the services of such experts once in a week, twice a week, depends on the acumen of, uh, on the desire and acumen of every individual in medical institution. But we propose that at least four lecture from such practicing consultant of different stream should be there in every institute. The purpose is very clear that we just want our student to have different kind of, different set of mind, different set of knowledge, different set of experience, more exposure to be given to the student. And that can be done for the, for the, for, for, from the segment of allopathy consultant and from the segment of homeopathy consultant also. And what are the qualifications required that we have mentioned in the regulation itself. And the very sensitive part uh, for which uh, we have made a very used proposition and uh, we expect and we, uh, we think and we also propose also that every institute should be given uh, not only about the government institution, government institution, whatever the norms and the pay structure they are following, they can carry on following the same pattern. But for the private institutions, 
for the institution which are attached to the private university or deemed to be university or central deemed to be university, they have to follow this salary pattern which is also given in the institutes, in the regulation also. And uh, of course, this is the minimum prescribed salary and we are not restricting anyone for the higher than this. They can go to any extent, but important part. <laughs> So this is the salary structure that is being proposed by the commission. We uh, we are receiving many calls and many comments also, and we have analyzed also. And uh, this is to be followed by the uh, commission, uh, by the every institution, whenever they are uh, giving jobs to their teachers. And we have clearly defined the category. This is seven CPC uh, to be implicated in every every medical institution. And for uh, for uh, medical officer also, because earlier it was told that you have prescribed salary for the teaching staff, but what is the provision for hospital staff? But hospital of staff also, the same pattern has to be followed according to the cadre of officer. But uh, for RMO and for MO, at least uh, a medical officer should get 50,000 per month and RMO, a senior medical officer, at least 70,000 per month. So these are the uh, structures which are being proposed by the commission and it will be part of MES also. For any clarification regarding this, we can have a discussion tomorrow. Otherwise, discussion agar abhi shuris bho jayenge, Last, ne next slide. Then for the non-teaching also, uh, we have made provisions as uh, those lab attendant, lab technician, librarian, assistant librarian, UDC, LDC, the minimum wages, salary of non-teaching staff or medical institution hospital shall not be less than minimum wages as prescribed by the respective state central government for a skilled and non-skilled pen power. This you have to follow in your institution. And another important part is for hospital where you have to go for the NABH accreditation and every institution, right from the notification of this uh, regulation, every institution has to enroll for NABH to take the entry level certificate in the one year and to take the uh, uh, full accreditation within two years. This is mandatory for every teaching hospital. And uh, we have defined the sizes of outpatient area. We have also given the provision of peripheral OPD also, although peripheral OP OPDs are not mandatory for every institution. But if they want to increase their central pool data, because the number of minimum required patient in OPD are being also increased. And we know it is a difficult task to achieve. So in order to support your central pool of patient in a hospital, we have created again this facility that you can send your doctor in the periphery from where you can, or you can send in the community from where you can have the patient pool in your central OPD also. And that can be number of peripheral, can be five, can be 10, in the range of 25 kilometer of your college. These are the distribution of indoor patient department, general medicine, pediatric, these you all know, you might have gone through in the regulation also. And the bed strength is also increased now, the minimum number of OPD required for a teaching institution having 60 intake capacity is 200 and for the 100 it is 300. Then uh, this we have uh, establishing in all the institution and this is mandatory for existing as well as the new institution to establish an emergency unit. And uh, the purpose is that uh, our students should be able to handle, to understand, to know about the critical care, to know about the emergencies, how they can deal if something is happening right in their neighborhood. And being a doctor, if they are being approached socially, and if they are not able to give the CPR, if they are not able to give these, uh, not able to do the suturing, they will not count it as doctor. So that is the reason why that is skill lab or emergency unit, ye do humne har college ke liye mandatory kiya hai, chahe wo naya ho, chahe purana ho, ye aapko rakhna hi rakhna hai, skill lab and emergency unit. And what are the criteria of managing emergency unit? What are the requirement of having in the emergency unit? They are all elaborated in the regulation itself. Then these are the common requirement for the hospital, central laboratories, clinical teaching room. Clinical teaching room has to move karna way Next. Clinical teaching room is another important part which is also added to the new as well as existing teaching institution. There should be a separate clinical teaching room in every hospital for the purpose of giving the bedside training, giving the uh, roundup or the grand rounds or for the purpose of uh, 
uh, making uh, information or sharing information about a particular patient who is visiting in the OPD. You can take in the clinical teaching room and there you can examine, you can give information about the patient, you can talk about the homeopathic aspect, you can talk about the practice of medicine aspects. So that part has to be covered in the hospital itself in the clinical teaching room. Uh, requirement for OT and labor room, they are all defined clearly. And then uh, in Schedule 2, uh, we have uh, the requirement about the Schedule 3 is about the qualification of teaching staff. They are also very clearly and elaborately mentioned in Schedule 3. You may all go through in the Schedule 3 and see what are the required criteria. There is one important thing that I want to convey that these regulations will be effective whenever these are regulations are effective. The norms for the qualification of teachers will be effective only after the publication of regulation. Otherwise, whatever, whichever teacher is recruited in any particular department till now or the before the publication of this regulation are regularized on their particular department. There will be no disparity any anymore. Wherever they are right now, before the publication of this regulation, wherever they are right now, they will be accepted as such. But any new appointment that you are going to make has to be followed these Schedule 3 guidelines. This is very clear. Another question which comes is about the promotion. The rules of promotion also applies under the regulation on which you are appointed. It's not that the rules of promotion will be applied uh, after the salient feature of these regulations. In which regulation, if you are appointed as per the regulation of 2002, the same rule of promotion will apply over you for the existing teacher. For the new teacher, rules will be as per the new regulation. So this is very clear. There have been many confounding questions about this. That uh, uh, whatever the rules of promotions are there, whether you are appointed in 1983 or 2002 or 2013, the rules where you have been appointed will be applicable for you. This is very clear. So uh, then qualification of hospital staff is also given in detail of in this schedule 3. And uh, uh, these are uh, some of the major criteria which I really wanted to convey through the regulation. But uh, the regulations are so large that I cannot discuss every specific point of regulation over here. But you make your point. You go through the regulation. You have gone through MSR also. You have gone through ME, uh, this uh, graduate degree regulation also. You make your points. And whatever comes your mind, we will sit again in the tomorrow afternoon meeting. Raise your queries and we will be able to answer as much uh, our regulation and our act allows us to say. We will answer your queries according to that way. So thank you very much for patient hearing. And uh, we'll go towards the other two regulations. My colleague, Dr. Charter, will take over and he will talk about the establishment of new colleges. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, collective session. Though exhaustive, uh, you have mostly covered all the parts. Thank you very much for enlightening us. Now, I would like to invite our member, Dr. Mangesh Jatkar. He is a member of Homeopathy Education Board. He has a vast experience as a clinician, as a perseverant academician, and a logical thinker. I, in, I invite him to explain the procedure for establishment of new homeopathic medical college. Welcome, sir, Dr. Mangesh Jatkar. Thank you. I uh, wish you all a very good afternoon. After a very nice, elaborative, and a marathon session led by our respected president, Dr. Jain, sir, I will just be covering a few points. Uh, which he has not mentioned and which are important from getting the permission point of view. As far as the MSR, MSC is concerned, all these regulations which we are now formulating all run hand in hand. So it is not an individual regulation as such. So to begin with, I will uh, start speaking on a regulation which is now So for permission to establish a new college and increase intake of the existing colleges, now as already Jain sir has mentioned that all the colleges who are running a 60 student course have to either upgrade or and if they want to upgrade in their intake capacity, they have to apply to MARBH, that is the board which will regulate all the new applications 
along with the applications for the establishment of the new colleges. Now, what is the way they have to apply and to whom they have to apply? Establishment of a new college, any person intending to establish a new medical institution shall submit the scheme along with an application in the prescribed form specified in the regulation. Whereas increase of intake capacity, that is the same procedure they have to apply, that they have to make an application in specified form in the regulation. Eligibility for making an application for establishing a new medical institution. Basically, we have to understand what is the objective that is impart quality education about homeopathy. Now, there are certain no objection certificates which the uh, which the applicant has to procure. That is the permission from the state government. an NOC from the state government, an NOC from the department of Ayush, obtain an NOC from department of Ayush, a department of Ayush of health of the state, a no objection certificate should clearly specify the academic year of starting of the medical institution and the approved course for which they are applying. The no objection certificate granted is valid for a period of two years. Priorly, these uh, no objection certificates were the validity of such certificates was not mentioned, but now we have made it mandatory that it should be mentioned very clearly that the validity of these certificates is for two years. The similar thing is for increase intake capacity, no objection certificate from the state government for increase in the intake capacity of the Omnipotic Medical College. No objection certificate from intake capacity shall be obtained from Secretary, Department of Ayush, or Health Department of the state. The NOC should clearly again specify the academic year of increasing the intake capacity and the approved course. Next. The next point that they have to see is, back to back, has obtained the consent of establishment of a new medical institution from a university. So consent of affiliation is the next part which the person who is applied has to also apply to the university concerned, either the central university, the state statute, which shall be valid again for a period of two years. The new establishment has not already admitted students. Now, this is a very, very important factor which we have to take into mind and consider that there are no students admitted or to the standard course or training for the proposed new college. The college which wants to have the institute which is proposing to start a new college owns and manages a homeopathic hospital. Now, this is a point which is already mentioned by uh, a president that owns and manages a homeopathic hospital in accordance with the provisions of regulation of the National Commission of Homeopathy. Let me add here that the applicant who is applying has to have an established hospital at least one year prior to making his hospital, which should be a functioning hospital. And he's in a position to provide performance of a bank guarantee from a scheduled bank of 2.5 crores or a 50 lakhs deposit in the name of the National Commission for a period of five and a half years till the first batch passes out. And this deposit will be without any interest. Whereas for intake capacity, the concerned officials from the Department of Ayush have to go and inspect those colleges to see whether they are having the requisite infrastructure to fulfill the requirement for the number of seats they have applied and the space, where equipment, and other infrastructure as specified in the regulation and has completed a period of five and a half years of undergraduate course, only then they will be eligible to apply for increase in the intake of capacity. And it should be recognized by the central or commission, uh, central government or national commission for running the undergraduate course. The maximum number of uh, admissions in the undergraduate course does not exceed 100. Now, according to the new regulation, the maximum students it should be 100. Now, the land requirement here, we have said that it should be minimum four acres or not less than four acres in non-agricultural non land in a single piece in rural areas or three acres in urban and hilly areas. This is the land requirement, but now it is in a process as Sir has mentioned that we have reduced it to 3.5 acres and 2.5 acres in the regulation that is coming. 
there should be a separate building for the hospital and the college as per the requirements in the minimum standards. Next. Phase wise specific requirements of new medical institution, a homeopathic medical institution seeking permission for starting a bachelor of homeopathic medicine and surgery program under the provision of section 1 of 29 of NCH Act 2020 shall establish infrastructure and manpower in a phased manner as the provision in the regulation. Before the admission of the first batch of students, the medical institution should have at the time of submission of the application, there should be a fully developed hospital, which I have just mentioned to you, a building with a functioning homeopathic hospital at least one year before the date of making an application, having appropriate number of beds, just as just now we have mentioned, the number of beds according to the seats, bed occupancy and outpatient department attendance corresponding to the annual student intake capacity as specified in the regulation about which just sir has mentioned. All teachers with the requisite qualifications in the regulation required for the first professional year teaching should be available. Now those are the requirements which sir has just mentioned in the MSR. At least one specialized doctor or clinical teacher, each of surgery, gynecology and obstetrics, practice of medicine, departments appointed for operating the hospital in accordance to the regulation. A library with 2,000 books, sitting capacity of 100 students and two librarians and a pew. These are the basic requirements even when you are starting the first year degree course. A properly furnished and well equipped two lecture halls. Teaching departments, laboratories and museum essential for the first professional year teaching as prescribed in the regulation. A medicinal plant garden is mandatory for the first year BHMS with at least 5,000 tree, 500 trees. The medical institution shall be visited at least six months in advance. Now, this is a criteria which will be followed year after year, that once the first year's batch is admitted, six months prior to the beginning of the second year, it will be inspected to see whether it is fulfilling all the requirements which are necessary for conducting the second BHMS course in terms of clinical facilities, laboratories, equipments, all these things will be verified and three classrooms should be made available at the second year, at least six months prior to the beginning of the second year course. Now, this same thing will be followed six months prior for the third year and for the fourth year with requirements according to the MSR as mentioned <coughs> priorly. To ensure proper provision of teaching and training material to the students, the medical institution shall process, possess all the required equipments, machinery, etc. in the teaching departments, hospital laboratories and dissection hall, library, pharmacy and other units of the institution in sufficient numbers as specified under the regulation. Next. Fees to be submitted along with the application. Now an application and scheme to be submitted shall be accompanied with the following admission fees by way of a demand draft or pay order or online transfer payable to the National Commission for Homeopathy, New Delhi. Now to establish a new medical institution, it is 5 lakhs fees at the time of submission of the application. To increase admission in undergraduate course of study or training, it is 4 lakhs. Now authority to whom the scheme and application is to be submitted, as I said previously, the application and scheme shall be submitted to the President Medical Assessment and Rating Board for Homeopathy as per the regulation for receipt and processing of the application annexed to the regulation. So these are the slant features about the new regulation that is coming up for permission to establish a new medical college and for increase in the intake capacity of undergraduate colleges. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your useful presentation. Now, I will be presenting a small presentation about the recognition of qualification. Uh, this is the regulation, National Commission for Homeopathy Recognition of Qualification Regulation 2022. The regulation covers majorly the six parts under the subsection 2 of section 55 of NCH Act 2020. It covers the manner of listing and maintaining medical qualifications granted by university or a medical institution in India under sub clause 1 of section 35. Similarly, this clause will cover the listing and maintenance of medical qualifications. The information which has been already listed in the second schedule and third schedule 
shall be listed as per the format given. Next is the manner of examining the application for grant of recognition under subsection 3 of section 35. Examining the eligibility criteria for the grant of recognition. The medical institution shall be located in India. The medical institution shall be duly permitted by the National Commission. Nomenclature of medical qualification by uh, awarded by medical institution or university is approved by National Commission or the Government of India or the erstwhile CCH. Duration of the course and evaluation system of medical qualification should be defined by National Commission, Government of India or erstwhile CCH. Similarly, syllabus or the curriculum should be adapted for the course as recommended by the authorities. Uh, what will be the application procedure? Application need to be done in a form A for undergraduate course, form B for the postgraduate course. There shall be a non-refundable fee by online bank transfer and this application is to be made within 45 days of completion of each academic year. It, it is to be done at the end of each academic year for the undergraduate course and for the postgraduate course. This process need to be initiated uh, at the completion of their internship or the PG course. Uh, what will be the timeline? The timeline for, for the Homeopathy Education Board National Commission shall to examine and process received application need to be uh, addressed in a six months after receiving the application in the commission. In case if the deficiencies are found, then the opportunity to rectify the deficiency shall be given to the applicants and in case if fail to fulfill the deficiency, application shall be rejected with the reasons. Another part covered under this regulation is the manner of preparing an appeal, referring an appeal to the commission for grant of recognition under subsection 5 of section 35. In case of decision of denial by the Homeopathy Education Board, the college management through university can apply to the commission within 60 days from the date of communication of such decision. The aggrieved university or medical institution may submit duly field appeal offline or online in a specified form C for undergraduate course and postgraduate course. Commission will take the 60 days period for the making a decision whether to grant the recognition or to deny the recognition. Commission may direct the Homeopathy Education Board National Commission to grant the recognition and include such application with reasons. There is another opportunity of second appeal in case if the deficiencies are found, then opportunity to rectify the deficiency shall be given to applicant and in case fulfill the deficiency, applicant shall be rejected with the reasons. In case of refusal of grant of recognition of medical qualification by commission, the second appeal can be made to the central government. This duration for this second appeal is 30 days from the date of communication of such decision or lapse of specified period by the commission, provided that before disapproving such appeal, in case if the deficiencies are found, an opportunity to rectify shall be given. Such appeal shall be examined by the central government as per the eligibility criteria, and central government decide the recognition, may grant to such medical institution, may direct the commission to grant the recognition. And if the central government decides recognition may not be granted to such medical institution, the go central government may reject or dispose such appeal. Another part cover under this regulation is the recognition of qualification of outside India under section 36. Uh, what are the eligibility factors? The eligibility is that university or medical institution that are located outside India, duly permitted by OPEX bodies or regulatory authorities of respective countries, offering education in homeopathy system. Application sh form shall be available from the website and with the uh, non-refundable fees, it is to be submitted to the commission.
authority to whom the application is to be submitted. It is the chairperson national commission to whom the uh, outside India qualification recognition form is to be submitted. After processing the application by commission, decision uh, shall be communicated to the applicant, apex body or regulating authority of respective country. In case the commission decides not to grant the recognition, commission shall give a reasonable opportunity of being heard by offline or online to such authority before refusing to grant such recognition. There is opportunity to prefer an appeal to the central government addressed to the Secretary Government of India. Such appeal shall be examined by central government if central government decides that recognition. Same procedure is followed for the recognition within India and outside India. What is the next? Next is the listing and maintaining of recognized medical qualification. This shall be like country code, name of university, name of college, recognized medical qualification, abbreviation code, validity period, and the digital code. Now we are processing uh, to the software generated digital code you will be getting the digital code automatically by the software. Once the medical qualification is recognized as per section 36 or 35, it will be displayed on the website and in the life management cycle software. Thank you very much for patient listening and uh, we will be regularly dealing with the queries of the recognition of qualification. Thank you for the patient listening. Now, moving forward, uh, we are uh, next session with the competency-based dynamic curriculum. We have a renowned visionary, Dr. Bipin Jain, with the experience in the educational management. I am glad to invite our next speaker, Dr. Bipin Jain. He will be deliberating on fundamentals of CBDC framework. I welcome you, sir, Dr. Bipin Jain. So good afternoon and uh, uh, as you have all uh, listened from morning that we are dealing with the newer uh, dimensions in homeopathic education and uh, the competency based dynamic curriculum is now going to become a center of education, delivery, processing, assessment and outcome. <coughs> So I'll just give you a very brief idea about what is it. Since we are running uh, late, so it will be a little more briefer. So we will be dealing with acknowledging why do we need to shift from what we are doing. We will state the salient feature of competency-based curriculum. We will, I will make you aware of the legends of uh, CBDC framework and determine the need of institutional capacity building to implement the CBDC. This was a 1988 uh, declaration, a Edinburgh declaration and it was uh, a by medical education body world and they had recommended at that time to produce doctor who will promote the health of all and what they expected a doctor who is trained as an attentive listener, careful observer, a sensitive communicator <coughs> and effective clinician. And they were trying to propose that he should not only be able to treat some sick but he should be able to prevent and promote health. Now these were 1988 declaration. And what declaration further says that education has to shift 
from hospital to community, from a traditional curriculum contained to national health priorities, not what we have experienced during COVID. From a passive mode of receiving to the active, self-directed, independent and continuous medical education. From an information and recall system to achieve professional competence and practice social values. From experts in content to an educator and reward on par with researchers. So your educationists and researchers, they have to be at par. The goal has to be not cure of the disease, but prevention and promotion. And methods of teaching, it is 1988, from compartmentalized and linear to integration in science, practice, problem solving in clinical and community, that is competency based. These were the 10 key features. He is a uh, master or he is a boss in uh, what I can say, medical education technology. He is an authority, Hurdle. He uh, put down the 10 key features of medical school of the future. It should be dynamic in time. It should be, uh, there has to be integration of basic science and clinical medicine. Importance of teaching and teacher recognized. Student as a partner and not as a client. Rather than having a standard uniform curriculum, you should adapt a curriculum with adaptive learning. So it should be dynamic and go on changing as per the need. Creative use of technology. Program focused assessment for learning. So it, it, the assessment has to be based on program and not structured uh, like, you know, compartmentalized what we are having now. Rather than working in isolation as a department wise, we should work in collaboration. I'll just rush through. I mean, how do we interpret the Hanemanian aphorisms into the principle of modern education? Aphorism number one is the aim of physician. Two is an objective of medical education. Three is an educational concepts, curriculum and syllabus. Three and four. Five and six is training methods and technique. So all six aphorisms cover major part of education methods. What should be the content? Train teacher as educator and reward them adequately, which is what uh, Tarkeshwar sir was sharing. Curriculum and examination to ensure achievement of professional competence, social values, concept of outcome-based and competency-based medical education. Promotion of health and prevention of disease and integration of education. Active learning, self-directed and independent study and the problem-solving capacity by end of graduation. These were the program outcome we defined uh, in our meeting of experts. So I, I would just like to share this program outcome. We can uh, make changes if required further. What is a program outcome of a BHMS graduate? He develops the knowledge, skill, ability and confidence as a primary care homeopathic practitioner to attend to the health needs of the community in a holistic manner. Correctly assess and clinically diagnose common clinical condition prevalent in the community from time to time. Identify and incorporate the socio-demographic, psychological, cultural, environmental and economic factor affecting health and disease in clinical work. Recognize the scope and limitation of homeopathy in order to apply homeopathy principle for curative, prophylactic, promotive, palliative, rehabilitative, primary health care for benefit of individual and community. See, please, uh, I mean, the focus is common and primary health care and not secondary and tertiary health care at a level of BHMS. Willing and able to practice homeopathy as per medical ethics and professionalism. Discern the scope and relevance of other system of medical practice for rational use of cross-referral and role of life-saving measures to address clinical energies. Develop the capacity for critical thinking, self-reflection and a research orientation as required for developing evidence-based homeopathic practice. Develop an aptitude for lifelong learning to be able to meet the changing demand of clinical practice. And he develops the necessary communication skill 
an enabling attitude to work as a responsible team member in a various healthcare setting, that means national program or a government setting, and contribute towards the larger goal of national health policy, such as school health, community health, and environmental conservation. These were the program outcome of BHMS. Now, this is a table which uh, tells us that the, the structure and process base is a current and how does it changes to the competency based. Current is the current, uh, the, the process of teaching is more content knowledge and acquisition. We want to change it to outcome and knowledge acquisition. Uh, the teacher centered to learner centered, teacher to learner then a teacher and learner as a team in a learning process, knowledge acquisition to knowledge application, single subjective major to multiple objective majors, proxy to authentic and the real task of profession, that means uh, more, than, more than simulation, you have to be in a clinical uh, thing, gestalt evaluation to direct observation. You, you have to observe students directly performing. Norm referenced to criteria referenced. I mean, we have been given structure, you have to evaluate and done. Now we have to create criteria for each uh, evaluation. Emphasis on summative. So this is emphasis on formative, so regular assessment. The program completion is a fixed time and we can have more of a variable time. Just take you to the template. These are the foundations of homeopathic education, man and environment. Again, since we don't have time, homeopathic philosophy as a center for a competency base. Travelling from case-based, problem-based, web-based e-learning, community-centered, from integrated teaching learning methods as an action learning as a part of it. And that is only way we can achieve outcome competency-based. So all subjects have to be studied from homeopathic perspective. This is what Dr. Takeshwar sir said. Emphasis on the applied aspect of organon and homeopathic therapeutic an applied aspect of all subjects to be explored from the outset. <coughs> now, I, I'll just explain you in the brief whatever uh, template we have created. So, what we worked was, we have uh, decided the no national goal, institutional and learner goal, that what will be the goal of a BHMS program and how they will be contributed to national goal, institutional goal. Then the program outcome which I have shared with you all, we derived that. Then there are general competencies. I mean the person should be able to perform and develop general competencies like collection of information, formulation of problem, problem solution. Now these are the general capacities a student should develop so that he is able to uh, solve the problems in a different situations which even if he has not faced, so you develop a mental capacities, physical sustenance, all these capacities needs to be built. Then the course outcome, what will be the outcome of the subject? So we start with the national goal, institutional goal, we connect to the program outcome, then the course outcome. Program outcome is a complete BHMS, uh, what we will be achieving. Course outcome is a each subject, what we will be achieving at the end of each subject. Then defining the content of the each subject, that means the, uh, the areas of subjects which have to be taught. Then what are the specific competencies we are looking for? And then what are the specific objectives out of those competencies we are looking for? So once we have defined that, in each topic you will have something which student must know. You will have something uh, sorry, you, you will have something which student only should know and not do. You will have something in which you will have a student should know and know how. 
there are some skills which he shows under your observation and some skills which he does independently. So we will divide all those uh, objectives into this. Then each of those objectives we will classify into cognitive effect and psychomotor, like what we are classifying in homeopathy is a sub, uh, symptom classification, emotion, intellect and behavior in that sense. I am making it. And then there are certain Gilbert's level, when you will receive the whole material, I mean it is a level at which somebody is able to perform certain uh, task. Then each of these have to be classified, must know, desire to know and nice to know. Then what teaching learning methods you will be using and the, then what assessment methods will be done and how this subject is getting integrated with other subjects in the same year or the ensuing year or how this subject is going to get unfolded in a years to come like organon there is there for four years, repertory is there for four years, mathematica is so how they are going to get complex, simple to complex. I'll show you the template. This is one example of repertory template. So generic competency is gathering and integration of information. Subject area is introduction to repertory. He should know. The specific competencies get acquainted with the tools required to search for remedy. Then what are the, uh, when we are looking into introduction to repertory, what are the specific objectives students should be able to achieve is uh, define the term repertory. Explain the meaning of repertory, discuss the origin of the word repertory, list three uses and limitation of repertory. So they are all cognitive because the, he should know and then whether he, he should be able to remember and recall or he should be able to understand or apply. So there are different levels of Gilberts. The de de definition, define the term repertory is must know, explain the meaning of repertory is desirable, desirable to know. Discuss the origin of the word repertory is nice to know. So, I mean, when we know this, we are even able to plan the uh, assessment. Because then you know that student should know at least 70% must know and he should pass out of it. Then what methods, teaching, learning, so lecture, small group discussion, lectures, so uh, with each of these objectives, what uh, teaching, learning methods? And then what are the examination methods, MCQ, SAQ, Viva OS, and then what is the integration in a departmental, so uh, horizontal integration with Mathematica, Organon of Medicine, and spiral integration in second, third, and fourth year of repertory. I think it looks complex, but once you go through the preamble and take up this, this is what we are doing. Only thing is we are doing it in a structured way so that we are able to create an evidence and we are able to assess the student. What is important is assessment of the students so that we can certify that he is competent. I was just reading Hurden's one article. He said that in one of the incidents, one patient died because of the nurse's incompetencies. So what investigative agency did, they not only explored the uh, incompetency of the nurse and the negligence happened, they went back to that college who has trained her and how they have declared her a competent thing. So that, that is that level of uh, back. So competency does not mean just passing BHMS. Competency means that he is able to operationalize things and demonstrate what is expected out of it. So after 10 years, somebody may come to your college and say this fellow has passed and still is incompetent into this, so we'll have to give the explanation. That's what that article says, that it's, it's from uh, Europe. And if you want to do it, the centerpiece is teacher. So curriculum designing, teaching methodology and assessment, taking to educational research, the change of teacher's role, which uh, Munir sir will be further taking up. And change at the level of students, teacher, parents, community, employer and management, 
and we need to change the infrastructure, human and monetary resources. This is the need of our and we should do it. It requires change in approach and attitude of all the teachers. We look at the resources and management of stakeholders to the implementation of this change and teacher is the centerpiece of this reform. So what is important is at the end when the student passes out BHMS, we as a stakeholders, as a teacher and management should be able to declare that at least he has these minimum competencies to go in a uh, outside world and demonstrate as an homeopath. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening us with the medical education and technology. Now we will have a short break of 30 minutes for the lunch and all are requested to join at 3 p.m. for the next session of Dr. Munir Ahmed. It's a request that we finish the lunch within 30 minutes. Then we have very important discussion from Dr. Munir Ahmed, sir. So it's a request to all to join after uh, having lunch and uh, positively auditorium at 3 p.m. Thank you.
if the learner is to be the focus of all educational activity, there could be two models. The model where the teacher is uh, dominant, is in a dominant position, or the model where the teacher is collaborating to engage the learners into their learning. Obviously, the second model would be one which is more appropriate, where we engage the learners into their own learning. And how do we bring about this transformation into the mindsets of the teachers is what will create the success factor, success factor for this curriculum. And this session is on the teacher's preparedness for CPDC implementation. At the end of the session, at the end of the session, you will be able to recognize the need for faculty development in homeopathy education and this specific reference to the competency-based curriculum, which I already have explained in the previous uh, slides in the induction process. You will be able to illustrate education as a system as per the WHO, explain the significance of the components of curriculum, curric educational spiral, and identify a framework for teacher capacity building to implement the CBDC. These are the objectives that I have set for this session, and we will see by the end of the session how much of these have sunk into our understanding. To understand education as a system, as per the a promotional understanding of WHO, we can define education in which education is a continuous process that intends to bring about desirable changes in the behavior of learners. And these two desirable changes and the behavior of learners are the two critical aspects in any educational planning, management and evaluation. And the students will understand this, will learn this, when they are able to acquire knowledge, improve skills, and develop attitudes. When we say the students are developing competency, there are various phases through which the students pass through. And there's a model called Rifus model, which explains how this competency can be achieved in a person who is a novice to somebody who develops as an advanced beginner and becomes competent, beyond that, they can even become proficient and expert. And this is the basis for uh, the philosophy of designing the CBDC. If the CBDC has been constructed on these principles, the implementation also would follow the same principles. Therefore, we need to understand these concepts as at a conceptual level, as philosophies, so that we can implement uh, a successful CBDC curriculum. This education has three major components. Or the curriculum has three major components. One is the learning objectives. That is, what do we expect the student to be able to perform or the student to be able to know? What are the competencies that we expect in the students? We state them in very clear and unambiguous phrases, terms. So once the learning objectives are stated, then we have to identify what would be the means and guardrails for enabling the students to be able to perform or achieve this, which come from the teaching learning methods and media. And once the teaching is done, the next phase is to identify whether outcomes have been achieved that we conduct in the form of assessment methods. Assessment methods. And all these components are interdependent. They support one another, and they derive support from one another. This is the basic model of any curriculum, designing curriculum implementation and curriculum evaluation. Now let us see each of these components. What are the different tools or the toolkit that the teacher has to uh, develop in order to implement any curriculum? Now as the leaders of any education institution, it becomes a responsibility to capacity build your teachers and this is a toolkit which every teacher must have. To understand how to learn about the learning objectives, 
there are certain tools. Basically, the entire learning can be classified as cognitive, affective, or psychomotor domain. The three domains, according to Bloom's taxonomy, which is the most widely accepted educational tool, educational planning tool. Beyond this, once we classify the learning into cognitive, affective, or psychomotor, in fact, this has been already done in the CBDC curriculum. Once we identify what are the uh, learning objectives, cognitive, affective, psychomotor, then we need to classify our strategy, uh, stratify them into the entry level learning, intermediate level learning, and higher level learning. So this has, can be achieved with the model or with the tool called as Gilbert's model, uh, which is the most popular educational technology tool in uh, supported by WHO. So once we have the layering of learning done at the entry level, intermediate level, and at the higher level, these need to confluence into a single stream of competency, which we can understand by using the Miller's pyramid. So these are the three basic tools. Beyond that, when we say the specific learning objective, the specific learning objective will have certain features, six features which are there. So any specific learning objective which is written or has to be written must have these six components, six features. And each of the specific learning objective will have four components of the act, the content, the condition, and the criterion, which make it a complete uh, objective. Just as we have Boning Asan's uh, four elements of symptom to make it complete, similarly we have four components of specific learning objective to make it complete. Now, when, these, when we speak of the education objectives or goals, these can be at the levels of either uh, a program level, or course level, or specific learning level. And this uh, already Bipin has already spoken to you about. And beyond that, we also need to prioritize learning because not all learning is of equal importance or equal criticality. We need to create the priority of learning using something called as a classification of must know, desirable to know, nice to know at 70-20-10 ratio. So this, these are the tools which one can use for planning for education. If it is a curriculum implementation, if it is a lesson planning, if it is an assessment, whatever it is, the entire education process starts with the statement of education objectives. So once the education objectives have been stated, the next level is to implement the teaching learning methods and media, to identify what are the teaching learning methods and media. The whole purpose of identifying what is a teaching learning method and medium is to create an immersive environment for the students to learn. So when we talk of teaching, learning, designing, there is something called as universal design of learning, UDL. This is the most commonly used, uh, you could say, model for uh, uh, teaching, uh, teaching learning. What it says is the students must get an entire range of opportunities to learn. It's not just one lecture. It's not just one uh, PowerPoint. But they need to have an entire range of options to learn, which they can choose, which is most appropriate for them. So, basing on this, there are five factors. A combination and permutation of these can identify which is the most appropriate teaching learning method. It could be based on the group size. It could be based on the domain of learning. Then, to match this teaching learning method, in fact, teaching learning method is what the teacher does or whatever the teacher makes the students to do. It could be a lecture, it could be a seminar, it could be a group discussion. Whatever the teacher does is a method. Now we are coming to the medium. Medium is what the teacher uses. It could be a, a blackboard, it could be a model, it could be a chart. Whatever the teacher uses or the, whatever the teacher makes the students to use, will be a medium. Now coming to the identification of medium, we have a tool called as uh, Dale's Cone of Experience, or Cone of Learning by Edgar Dale, basing on which we can identify which is the most appropriate uh, teaching learning medium. It could be either projected medium, 
a non-projected medium. What is even more important is how do we match the method and the medium. There are certain methods which are appropriately matched with the medium and the combination of these will deliver a better learning experience. <coughs> Once the teaching learning is done, we need to get into the assessment mode. When we get into assessment mode, <coughs> before we go further, I would like to draw your attention. In the competency-based competency curriculum, there is something called as programmatic assessment. Programmatic assessment, program, programmatic assessment. This is the hallmark, this is the hallmark of competency-based curriculum. What it means is, there are multiple data points about each student's performance, which are collected over a period of time at different levels with different criticalities. And these have to be combined to get a kind of complete 360 degree opinion or judgment about the student. So this programmatic assessment can be better explained when we use the tools which tells what is the approach, formative or summative, what is the model, direct method or indirect method. And each of these tools will have certain features. The assessment tool has to be valid, reliable, objective, practicable and specific. So when we are identifying the tool, we need to see whether these features are there in the assessment tool. So once we have all these factors uh, factored in, then we can identify the different assessment tools which can be based on which is the domain, what is the level in the domain, what is the medium of performance, learner performance, and specifically what are the different tools. So those tools are there which can be discussed at length maybe at a different uh, place. Now coming to the actual, uh, you can say brass tacks, what is expected of you as a teacher, as a, as a principal to be able to do. What you need to do is to establish something called as a curriculum management committee. It could be part of the, the medical education technology cell or it could be even apart from it. So there has to be a curriculum management committee within each institution. And this committee will have the mandate to conduct faculty sensitization and development at the institution level to ensure appropriate administrative and governance practices in the institution and more importantly to provide a kind of student conditioning for professionalism because if it is only one way where the teachers are trained but the students are not capacity built to understand what is his competency and what is expected of them what are their professional obligations it becomes a kind of uh, it, it's not a recipe for success therefore you need to factor in the audience as part of the stakeholders to build confidence and capacity in them also and also create a culture of uh, continuing professional development. These are the activities that the curriculum management committee in each of the institution must be tasked with. Only then you can expect this curriculum to see some success. One of the models that I have personally felt useful is the uh, learning organization model or the fifth discipline by Peter Senge which has five components, five supportive components and this has been my mainstay of whatever developments that I do. Once we have all these processes in place then what we can expect is a curriculum which is constructively aligned. In fact, constructive alignment is a buzzword in any higher education uh, parlance and by uh, John Bix, who has been the proponent of this constructive alignment and one more model of uh, uh, learning taxonomy, we, we can talk it of maybe at a later stage, maybe at a higher level. So this is what would be expected, like you have the expected outcomes, learning activities and the assessment, all constructive aligned into a single stream. For this, I propose three verticals for teachers, teachers training, a foundation course, a basic course, 
and a short course or an advanced course for the teachers and a basic course for all the principals and the departmental heads in uh, education leadership. Now, this can be either coordinated by the apex body or by the universities or by a consortium of colleges or individual college, whichever way. But this is a model which I have felt is more useful. If there is another model, you can adopt it, not an issue. But some kind of a training is a must. Now, at the end of this session, are you able to recognize that there is a need for faculty development in homeopathic education? Illustrate education as a system consisting of the definition of education of WHO. Explain the significance of the three components, learning objectives, teaching learning methods, and assessment methods as interconnected components of curriculum. And identify what could be the framework for a successful implementation of CBDC. Now, before I conclude, this is called sandwich effect. You state what you expect the students to be able to perform. Now, in this case, the audience. What do you expect the audience to be able to perform? Say it, and then, then uh, show whether you are able to. Ask whether you are able to. This is where the learning can be anchored better. And if you look at each of these objective statements, each of these statements tells what the learner will be able to, or the audience will be able to. It doesn't tell what I am going to do. So the focus is shifting here from the teacher domination to the learner engagement. And this is a kind of uh, um, living model of how any educational, comp any educational program has to be developed. I will uh, conclude with this quote, which resonates with the slogan that we started. Learner is the focus of all educational activity. I don't think there is any scope for questions. So I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very thoughtful session, and definitely we will take uh, use of it. I now welcome uh, Dr. Garmendra Sharma. Uh, he will be uh, deliberating on learning management system. He is the principal of D.Y. Patil Homeopathy Medical College, Dean Faculty of Homeopathy, Dr. D.Y. Patil Vidya Peet Pune. I welcome Dr. Dharmendra Sharma. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very thankful to Dr. Kurana, sir, and Dr. Tarkeshwar Jain, sir, for having me here for this small presentation on active learner engagement during uh, using LMS and the advantages of CBDC. At DY Patil Vidya Peet and at DY Patil Homeopathic College, we have already implemented the LMS and the CBDC, which has been included in the curriculum of the DY Patil University. And uh, I'm here to share you my experiences about that. The learning objectives of this session is, what is an LMS? Everybody talks about LMS, but what is it actually? Actually, we were going to have Bizac team talking before me, so I thought this all would be covered in that. Uh, what are the types of active learner engagement? What is the need for it? And how to ensure it? and the need to regularly create the content, the need to regularly upload it on the LMS, and how to use the LMS in actively engaging the learner. An overview of competency-based dynamic curriculum and the process involved in its advantages and implementation. The learning management system is an online teaching learning platform provided in the ERP 
which is the enterprise resource planning software. What is active learning? Is learning actually happening in our colleges? We all as principals of colleges, we go through a regular routine of conducting the BHMS course or the MD course. But if we actually ask ourselves this question is that are the students actually learning? The teachers are going to the, to the class, they are teaching every day, but from the student side, are they receptive enough to learn all these things? So if learning is not happening, the need is that there should be attention, there should be curiosity, they should be interested, there should be passion shown by the students, their behavior, cognition, and their emotions. So an active learning is a method of learning in which the students are actively or experientially involved in the learning process and where there are different levels of active learning depending upon the student involvement. Bonwell and Edison state that students participate in active learning when they are doing something besides passively listening. According to Hansen and Moser, using active teaching techniques in the classroom create better outcome for the students. It is further noted that by utilizing learning strategies which can include small group work, role play and simulations, data collection and analysis, active learning is purported to increase the student interest and motivation and to build students critical thinking problem solving and the social skills. <coughs> what is the need for the active learner engagement? To promote a meaningful learning experience and to motivate them to practice a high level of critical thinking and the application of knowledge. These are the types of active learner engagement with the LMS. LMS. So you have the syllabus, you have the timetable, you have the advanced teaching plan uploaded. You have e-content which could include PDFs, video links, videos on dedicated YouTube channels which can be uploaded on the LMS. The lecture register, the lesson entry, the attendance of the students are also marked on that. The discussion forums with interactive platforms and problem-based learning, case-based learning, all these things are possible if you have an active LMS system in your college. You can have even the assignments uploaded. You could have a formative assessment, objective MCQs, as well as the subjective SAQs and LAQs. <coughs> How to ensure that your learning actively engages via the LMS? So you regularly create, every teacher can regularly create and upload the e-content on the LMS. The regular lecture entries, lesson plan entries, marking of attendance, create meaningful content that has been peer approved and assignments to be given at the end of every topic. Like uh, Tarkeshwar Jain was saying, it is a continuous process of evaluating the students uh, when, when you are teaching. At the same time, at the end of every lecture, at the end of every day, the student can be evaluated in whatever he has learned and whether he has actually learned what you have taught him in the class. So that there's a discussion forum you can have the problem-based learnings, the case-based learnings, and you can have assessments, grading of work, assignments, and SAQs, LAQs, and MCQs. This is the applicability of the learning management system at our college, which we have done. So we have the graduate attributes, the program outcomes, the course outcomes, which are visible to the students. So every student has got an identity card, and with that identity card, he has a number which is his ERP number. So once he logs it onto, the, onto his computer, onto his mobile or computer, he's able to see all this information is available to him at the flick of a button. So he can see what are the graduate attributes, the PO, COs are visible to the students and they can, which have been precisely defined in the CBDC for the BHMS program, as well as all, all the courses. The syllabi for all the courses has been uploaded in the LMS. So the students can access the syllabus at any time, at, at any place. The timetable is also there, so students can access it from anywhere, anytime, if she forgets what lectures are scheduled for the next day. The assignments are uploaded regularly by the teachers to assess the students at the end of a lecture. This helps them assess whether the student requires competencies they have been achieved or not yet. This also helps in identifying the slow learners and taking necessary steps to improve their performance in the final university examination. The e-contents are also there, the video links are there, the discussion forum, it has been used for the problem-based learning 
and the CBDC, the assessment, grading of work, assignments, the MCQ, LEQs, all these become a part of our learning management system. The college has ensured transparency in its teaching, learning and timely completion of syllabus through these methods. So these are few advantages which everybody can get after once we start with the LMS, these are the advantages everybody will get. So it is teacher specific, like every teacher has got an ID and that teacher can upload, go on the ERP and before the teacher goes to the class, he uploads his lecture on the, uh, on the uh, ERP. The students can read the lecture before they come to the class. So they have their questions ready before coming to the class. So this becomes an advantage to teach them. In case a student misses the class, the lecture is already there on the ERP, so he actually does not miss a class. He can read it any time. So all the graduate attributes are there, the syllabus is there, lesson plans are there, and the e-content is uploaded. This is an example I'm giving you just a dashboard. This is my dashboard, which you can see over here. So you select the program, the course outcomes. You have the Bachelor of Homeopathic Medicine Surgery. These are the various courses, Forensic Medicine, Pharmacy, Materia Medica, Paper 1, Paper 4. This is the Department of Forensic Medicine and these are the course outcomes which are there. Once the student knows what are the outcomes of the course, he focuses on them and he wants to learn those course outcomes and he wants to become what you actually want him to become. This is another uh, dashboard which shows the practical demonstration of the syllabus visible to the students and their faculty at any place. So this is the whole syllabus which is there, undergraduate homeopathy which is there on the LMS. This is the, uh, again the practical demonstration which shows you the details of the timetable. You can see the print is a little small so I don't think you can read it from there. This is before the lecture. We have divided our syllabus into, like uh, Munir sir was saying, in must to know, must know, desirable to know. So this is what students need to know. So the student knows that this is something like we have the Homeopathic Central Council Act or the NCH Act now, the Consumer Protection Act, workman. these are the things which he needs to know in forensic medicine. So he will focus on this, that without knowing this, I cannot pass the examination. And this is good. If he's a better student, he would want to know this also. This is again the e-content which I have uh, uploaded over here. You can see the different uh, videos which are there on the net. This is again, uh, I have uploaded over here a list of all the, uh, this is an assignment done by the student. So what the student does, you have given him an assignment, he completes his assignment, he scans it and he uploads it on the ERP. The teacher can correct it on the ERP itself and give the marks. This is a subjective exam paper. This is an example of the uh, question paper which the student has uploaded on the ERP. This is a, a, there is a discussion forum. Like this is a discussion forum where student can ask a question and the teacher can respond. And all students can see this and learn from that. The advantages are it brings transparency and objectivity in the teaching learning process of the college. It also helps to assess the attainment of the course outcomes. It helps to identify the slow performers and the advanced learners and initiate necessary steps accordingly. It has also improved the overall result of the college. It keeps the teachers, students and parents in link with each other in terms of attendance and performance. Like we were just told that uh, if the father wants to see that my son is in the class, he can just log in, he has got an ERP ID, he logs in and he knows whether his student is in the class because attendance is not taken in the master, attendance is taken on a face recognition software which is passed to every student in the class. He looks at it and his attendance is marked. So the father can check whether his attendance is there. So it also helps to spark the critical thinking ability in the students and it has made teaching learning a more interactive process. So now we are at a crossroad, actually homeopathy is at this crossroad where at one end you have the advancement in homeopathic education, competency based, which we are trying to introduce now. And one end you have the traditional homeopathic education. At one end you have homeopathy which uh, says whether it is dynamic or spiritual. And the other end you have a technologically driven evidence based homeopathy. So we are here at the center and we need to actually find which road we need to take. So let us have a quick overview of the competency-based education. It must be remembered that the purpose of education is not to fill the minds of the students with facts. It is to teach them to think. 
I'm going a little fast with this. Outcome-based education clearly focuses on organizing everything in an educational institution around what is essential for the students to be able to do successfully at the end of their learning experiences. We have the graduate attributes, the program at, uh, outcomes, the course outcomes, the mapping of CO with po uh, POs, and like uh, Sir already talked about the Bloom's uh, levels and the Gilbert's levels, and the course attainment analysis. These are the different POCOs which already Sir has discussed, so I'll just go through them fast. The main aim of the competency-based dynamic curriculum shift to the SPICES model. This is the SPICES model, student-centered, problem-based, integrated, community-based, elective, and systematic. These are the uh, same thing, so I won't repeat this again. These are the results. These are the advantages. These are the, some of the challenges which we faced during the implementing this competency-based curriculum at our college, in which the training of the teachers was done with respect to innovative teaching, learning, and assessment methods. So all the teachers were trained. They had three months courses, six months courses, along with the uh, MCI. When MCI trainers had come, we included the homeopathic teachers also in that. And that is how everybody learned about this in advance. Allotting each outcome to a teaching learning method and the assessment method. The orienting teachers on the toxinomy and the domains. So in Maharashtra, we had the Maharashtra University of Sciences, which uh, did the medical education basic as well as the advanced courses. For courses like Materia Medica Organon, four years, planning all this for four years was a huge task. And training of teachers on the course outcome analysis was also difficult. And the training the teachers on the use of the learning management system. The steps we overtook to overcome these challenges, we had massive faculty development programs for teachers in each of the above aspect. We had separate university center which we have developed at the DY Patil University for professional education and faculty development called the UCPEF and D. The homeopathic education technology unit has also been established in our college which works in close guidance of the UCPEF and D. This we call this homeopathic education technology unit as HE2. And we have round-the-clock monitoring, weekly review meetings, basic workshops in health education technology, massive upgradation of the infrastructures, we have smart classrooms, and uh, we have advanced laboratories for research. To conclude, the adoption of an outcome and competency-based homeopathic medical education approach will help produce competent homeopathic physicians imparting safe, rational, and judicious homeopathic treatment to the needy. It is rightly said that John, don't just Teach your children to read. Teach them to question what they read. Teach them to question everything. This is the most important thing. So us homeopathic students also need to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Of all this time, we have always been focusing on the MSR. And we focus on everything. And we have taken this word minimum, which Dr. Hanneman has talked about, the minimum dose and minimum everything. So we have incorporated this minimum into our lives. So we want minimum education. We want minimum work, we want everything minimum. It's time to change and it's time to make it maximum and think beyond the MSR and think beyond the minimum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Monica, Consultant Medical Assessment Rating Board, for further proceeding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rupali. Uh, so now, uh, the next session, let's move on to the next technical session, which is the core of academic excellence. Uh, we'll be speaking on research. The topic is the good clinical practices, conducting research requirements for research infrastructure. We have with us the team from CCRH, Dr. Sobhash Kaushik, who's the Director General of Central Council for Research in Homeopathy. He's also a member of National Commission for Homeopathy. He, is the chief co he has been the chief coordinator of organizing various national conventions and uh, seminars all over the country. Other than the PhD in homeopathy, he also is a graduate in biology and postgraduate in business administration. And he was a recipient of WHO fellowship for the year 2016-17 on statistical methods for epidemiological and clinical research at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, UK. Uh, may I please invite Dr. Subhash Koshik? <clears throat> He's accompanied by uh, Dr. Divya Taneja. She's a research officer, CCRH. She has a research experience of more than 15 years at CCRH. 
New Delhi, and she has been involved in Ayush Helpline for COVID, Homeopathy for Healthy Child, Extra Mural Research Scheme for the Ministry of Re Ayush, Harmonization of Drug Proving Protocol, and various other campaigns. May I please invite Dr. Devya Tanija? She'll be coordinating. Okay. And uh, I'm also inviting Dr. Haleen Kaur. She is also a research officer with CCRH, and she also has experience of 15 years of uh, a research which is uh, she has been an editor of Indian Journal of Research in Homeopathy and uh, uh, official journal of CCRH. She also has over 20 articles in peer-reviewed journals. She designed a study to explore the role of homeopathy in serving the moderate and severe cases of COVID-19 in an integrated manner which was conducted in AIMS Hospital, Jhajjar and St. George Hospital, Mumbai. So may I please welcome the CCRH team. Over to you. Yeah. Greeting to everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers for holding this mega event, and I'm happy to be here today. How to move the slide? Uh, yes. So basically, under the aegis of Ministry of Ayush, Central Council for Research in Homeopathy is an apex research organization in homeopathy which undertakes, coordinates, develops, promotes and disseminates scientific research in homeopathic system of medicine. Through its different institutes, at present we are having 34 institutes and units all over the India, where specific research studies are conducted along with provision of clinical services with laboratory facilities and also IPD setups in selected, selected institutes. So basically, CCRHC engages in multidimensional research. Here you can see we are doing a lot of things from cultivation of medicine plants, drug standardization, drug proving, clinical verification. Like in cultivation of medicine plant, we have one place of 12 acres, more than 12 acres at OT, with a greenhouse and cultivated fields and herbarium. In drug standardization, which involves development of pharmacognostic, physicochemical, and pharmacological parameters of raw drugs, and for finished products, standards are provided for inclusion in the homeopathic pharmacopoeia of India. Our basic research involves a study of physicochemical properties of high dilutions, biological activities of homeopathic medicines, mechanistic and pharmacological actions of homeopathic drugs. We are also engaged in drug proving, our oldest program of CCRH. Then we are into clinical verification, where we used to verify the symptoms obtained in the drug proving in OPDs in various disease conditions. We are having clinical validation part, where we do validate the symptomatology of drugs in specific clinical conditions. Besides this, we are into clinical research. A lot of clinical research studies are going on. We are into epidemic studies, identification of genus epidemicus, distribution of genus epidemicus, and identification of prophylactic action. We are into public health studies, homeopathy for healthy child, swast suction program, integration of homeopathy in NPCDCS, outreach camp and survey studies. So research in India is undertaken by CCRH. Studies have been taken up by colleges, NGOs, hospitals, both in private and public sector, under the EMR scheme of Ministry of Ayush. When this EMR scheme, we used to provide 70 lakhs for each project. Also, students' thesis and dissertation at post-graduation and doctor's levels are an important research component within the country. Many accommodations have undertaken research on their own accord, purely through their own interests. Now it is expected that research department at educational institutes pick up research in a strategic manner. Uh, currently, the Ayush, including homeopathic knowledge, is largely based on tradition, which is at the topmost. However, it is desirable that medical practice is evidence-based for which the pyramid needs to be inverted to ensure that traditional knowledge and know-how are built upon the systemic studies to develop treatment modalities. We have to do just inverted this. Nowadays, the tradition is like this, and we have to require this, we have to go like this.
Here you can see this is the evidence pyramid. We have to go like this only. So here the hierarchy of study design is used to translate the result of studies into clinical practice guidelines. And most importantly, we should publicize the good work through publications. Whether whatever we are documenting, be it case report, case series, results of observation study or RCTs, systematic reviews or meta-analysis, we shall do it with utmost sincerity and without any bias. So we have individual brilliance, but at institute level we are not. एक मैं आपको बताऊं कि हम सारे के सारे बहुत अच्छा क्रिकेट खेलते हैं जितने भी मेल्स स्पेशली यहाँ बैठे हैं और सब बहुत चौके चक्के मारते हैं वो अपनी गली में खेलते हैं अपने घर में खेलते हैं अपने फील्ड में खेलते हैं पर आज का युग जो है वो डाटा का युग है तो हमारे पास डाटा नहीं है हमने कितने चौके कितने छक्के मारे हमारे पास रिकॉर्ड नहीं है जबकि हमने बहुत सारी सेंचुरीज मारे हुई है तो आज की तारीख में वो बलवान है जिसके पास डाटा है और जैसे अभी सुबह भी इनोग्रेशन में भी बात हो रही थी कि आज का युग जो है कंपटीशन का नहीं है कोऑर्डिनेशन का है तो वी हैव टू सी द इंटीग्रेशन अमंग ऑल दीज आयुष सिस्टम्स सो दिस इज आल्सो अप्लाइड टू अवर प्रैक्टिस बिकॉज वी डोंट हैव रिसर्च कल्चर दैट्स व्हाई वी आर नॉट एबल टू एड एनी फ्रॉम अवर साइड टू द बॉडी ऑफ द नॉलेज एज वी नो रिसर्च रिसर्च इज मेड ऑफ टू थिंग्स री मीन्स अगेन एंड सर्च टू फाइंड आउट तो सर्च ऑफ सर्च produce some facts out of a knowledge we all have one belief so that belief is our hypothesis so knowledge is defined as justified our belief finding of the justification is research and research is regarding justified true belief so research is a process of inquiring and investigation systematic and methodological and which is to increase the knowledge and research objectives are to generate new knowledge gain familiarity with a new phenomena or develop new insight into a phenomena and the last thing is review and synthesize the existing knowledge this should be the type of research in homeopathy we have so many instructors on homeopathy as at morning we was telling about sort analysis strength weakness about changes and threat so this is the slide for that if we know that we are doing what we are doing it would not be called research would it albert einstein ne bola tha so in research initially it's foggy it's your passion that drives you search part is both for learning and discovering research is always open ended in research you are the one who questions and you are the one who answers there is nothing like success or failure in any research what is important that what you expect and what you have discovered the most important thing is that you should convince with your results whatever they are so science is simply common sense at its best that is rigidly accurate in observation and merciless to false in logic as we say ki who is pretty which is less ugly and who is ugly which is less pretty so we have to take this connection out of our research projects so this research process these are the some stages six steps are there when we talk about formulating and clarifying a topic or a research question or research objective area of interest should be broad review the literary research we have to figure out the gaps work done and work not done then designing designing the research with clear concept type of research what we are going to do collecting of the data collection of the data then analyzing the data and write up up must follow a structure and these are different type of research on the basis of objective you can see exploratory we are going to explore then descriptive describing the explore whatever we have explore then correlation relationship between two variables then experimental then explanatory and on the basis of outcome or classification we can see the fundamental basic this is all theoretical no product we can receive from this then applied the action for immediate solution of a burning problem problem in the population and on the basis of logic there are two type of deductive and inductive on the basis of process qualitative and quantitative qualitative is of emotions may not be indigenous to that group where is quantitative almost all clinical research reproducible in nature when we talk about qualitative and uh, so i'll come later these are the characteristic of research 
Objectivity means research without bias. Subjectivity is biased. Anything which has different meaning for different people is subjective. That is, say for example, indigestion. If one, someone say to, I am suffering from indigestion, so you may think about constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, anything. And what is subjective? This uh, subjective, the anything which is, has mean all for all, that is objective. The, suppose one say ki, it's Texas. So objectivity, if we talk about it, subjective symptom change ho sakta hai, apne, apne perception. Ke se. Lekin objective is that we observe kare ek Then reliability, consistency, getting same or similar result can be termed as verifiability. Then validity stands for accuracy, procedure, research instruments, tests, etc. Accuracy is degree to which research process, instruments and tools are related to each other. Then general, general ability, degree to which research findings can be applied to a larger population. Whereas systemic research should follow a definite procedure. And replicable, it can be verified by others also. These are the different recipes for research. You can, no need to read out all. These are the area of interest in terms of relevance, innovation, acceptability, cost effectiveness, and ethical issues. This is our, this is our publication. What is this is a peer-reviewed, uh, pioneering open access, peer-reviewed homeopathic research generally in India. This is quarterly publication, and you can all access it free online from our, your mobile and computer also. So these are the famous publications of CCRH. These are same. These all publications can be purchased from CCRH. You can write to CCRH publication at gmail.com. Online purchase is not available now, but it will be initiated soon. Now these are the latest CCRH activities with educational institutes. We have MOU with, I think, 40 colleges right now. And we have joint research project on drug proving clinical research. Then we have scholarship scheme, STSH and MD scholarship. STSH is for undergraduate students, and MD is for good dissertation. Then visit of students to CCRH center, technical assistant to colleges, training workshop we are organizing. Clinical posting thesis work at CCRA centers during UG and PG. And we have different experts from private sector and other sectors in our different committees. This is the scholarship I think all of you know, this STSH program. This is the short term studentship. We are giving 20,000 to each student and this time we have given to 97 students from different colleges. Another scheme is quality MD dissertation scheme. This is for 25,000 and I think we have selected 37 students for this program. This is the same. This is a further elaboration of these slides. This is the time, basically this is the timeline where you can submit your proposals. Your student can submit the proposals. This is the data. This is the data of under STSH. And I think uh, Gujarat and West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, maximum students we are getting from Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, and these are the topics where they are doing research. The main is clinical research. 77% are belongs to clinical research, then drug standardization, agro homeopathy. <coughs> so we are having this vision with colleges, what we want from you. These are the activities of CCRH with collaboration of your colleges.
this is the paper first one is these are the list of 50 colleges from where we have taken this data first paper and these two second and third paper is from the collaboration of Bhopal College. Yes, sir. During COVID-19, this is the distribution of arsenic album 30. So we have six lakhs data with proper follow-ups. And because this under the NCH Act, research policy is an integral component. So research can not be held in isolation by a single body. So the BHMS degree regulation has an additional provision for development of a department of research methodology and biostatics along with the already existing department of community medicine. Other than the activities being taken by the department of community medicine, this department needs to identify strategic directions for research in the institute. The scope of work of the department can include various research activities with the ultimate outcome for incorporation of research evidence in education and enhancement of professional accountability. So how research can be undertaken in colleges and inculcating in students will be taken up next by Dr. Harleen. Please come. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, and uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think uh, our uh, Director General CCRH, Dr. Subhash Kaushik, uh, he has given a very crisp outline of uh, how to do research and uh, what are, uh, how is CCRH enabling research in colleges and uh, what are the various schemes that we are providing to encourage research in uh, academic circle. So I am very quickly going to uh, can we have the slide bigger? Uh, maybe if I can go from, yeah, thank you so much. So um, basically medical colleges, we don't have a better ideal ground for innovative research. You know, now we're not talking about homeopathy here, we're talking about medical colleges. Barely for the plethora of clinical exposure that it offers. I don't think that there's a better place if you want wide range of researches wide range of clinical, uh, you know, symptoms and diseases. So anything from head to toe. I think that's the best way, best platform to inculcate research inclination in the mind of students. If that is where the seed of research is sown, it will definitely bear fruit eventually. So medical colleges literally are cradles of innovation and knowledge creation. One, because there's exposure. Second, because the youth always want to do something new. They're always downloading new apps in their mobile gadgets because they are looking for innovation. So I think it's all about encouraging them that why don't you create one? If you like innovation, if you're always looking for something new, then the profession needs you. So maybe it's just about channelizing their energies into research mode. So research in colleges can be the source of generating high caliber human resource for research in homeopathy sector, which if channelized properly, may bring much needed recognition to homeopathy. The exposure that students get in a medical college for clinical research is an apt resource for designing cohort studies. So cohort studies, observational studies, where you do not really need a comparator, where you just have to observe the difference that is happening with simple homeopathic prescriptions before and in the follow-ups and then after is something that only needs just bare minimum guidance of how to document your studies and how to scientifically you know, give basis to them by recording evidence properly. That's about it. So I think cohorts is something, observational or interventional studies are something that every college, it's the smallest from the, the smallest to biggest, can be taken up right into OPDs. If you have a minimum OPD of 100 patients in a day, your, your people, your, your students have enough ground for researchers. And also, RCTs, why not? I mean, why, do, why, why can't colleges think of randomized control trials? So RCTs do not have to be only CCRH domain or only a research specific person's domain. RCTs are simply, simply a study gone finer just because we have a comparator and a randomization added to it. 
So I think what we really lack is first the, the basic, very basic know-how of research methodology. RCT might be the gold standard, but conducting RCTs doesn't require much except for just very basic understanding of what research is, what clinical research is about, and just, just comparing it. That's it. So I think if you have a comparator available, or if you can take a placebo, if, if ethically it's allowed, if you have, if your college is attached to an allopathic college, where you have, uh, you can have uh, simple researches by, by a small MOU, I think that's the ground for doing RCTs, which is a gold standard for clinical research. But I understand, I think we all understand that a medical teacher is very different from a college academic teacher. They have so many, so many multiple responsibilities, ranging from undergraduate and postgraduate teaching to clinical work in OPDs and in IPDs, administrative assignments, assessment related work, being a guide for postgraduate dissertation and mentoring. However, despite all of this, last but not the least, doing quality medical research is also an important responsibility, which would improve patient care, medical education, would prove the effectiveness of homeopathy and will benefit the society at large. So I think medical teacher definitely has a lot of responsibility, but uh, this is one thing that cannot be understated. Now, encouraging students for research is always a challenge. It's not only in homeopathy colleges. This is the data that you can see. is from uh, a published uh, piece uh, from medical colleges all over India. So I'm talking about conventional medical colleges here. Six to 10 medical colleges of India publish more than 60% of research papers and index journals out of the existing 450 medical colleges in India. So this is 2016 data, so it might not have changed that much now. So the point is that this is the state of affairs. The medical colleges that are doing researches are doing researches anyway. So 60% of data is actually coming from those 10 medical colleges. And 450 medical colleges lag behind. The rest of the colleges lag behind. But I mean, let's not be, let's not imitate them in this. Let's try to change this for our homeopathy colleges at least. And the prerequisites are uh, many, but most of them are available. We need good mentors who have a good track of research capability. Now, when we say research capability, it might not be that they have published at least 10, 20, 30 clinical research papers, but they, they have research know-how. They have been a part of one or two clinical researches, but they, they have a good hold on what clinical research is about. So they can be a good mentor to, uh, to, the, to the students and aiming to develop a tradition of research in college. So just like we have tradition of you know, classical practicing in medical colleges, in our homeopathic colleges. We have a tradition of, uh, you know, respecting Samuel Henneman. We have, a, we have, so colleges have their own traditions. So can research be one of the traditions in the college? For the kids, for the students, for the undergraduate, for the postgraduates to imitate? Can we have something like, okay, so-and-so senior of mine did such a research that he got MD dissertation uh, scholarship or maybe SPSH, or maybe our uh, so-and-so professor did a research that was published in an international journal. Can this become a tradition? So if it's a tradition, then your students are bound to get affected because it's a tradition in college. It's not a mandate. So I think that bridge from mandate to tradition is something that has to come if we all unitedly work towards it. And encouraging fund seeking from reputed departments. So there are fund providers if there are some really good research proposals. Then there are good fund, pro fund uh, providers also. Um, I'm reading the second point from up, by the way. Anyway, so do we have a pointer here? Yeah, OK. So, it, uh, so Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science and Technology, CCIH, EMR. So there are many, uh, many schemes of Ministry of Ayush, of Ministry of Science and Technology, of CCIH through collaborative scheme. He also offers funds for, uh, after of course, perfect scrutinizing. So this can be initiated. I mean, the inertia has to be first overcome that why would they fund us? Any simple proposal, if it's methodically written, can be approved. Technically, see all these funders, they are here to do handholding also. 
they know that the first proposal they, they would get might not be the perfect proposal. But they, if there's a room for improvement, and if there's potential in the proposal, then the hand-holding also happens. So I think this, if this kind of a, a fun-seeking behavior can also be encouraged, and then subscription to reputed research journals is very important. And not only subscription, but also assuring that at least the faculty is reading those research journals to tell them, to, to share, you know, just like we share the current affairs of, uh, of daily happenings in, in our class. You know, today this happened, so and so thing happened. How about just sharing a very good research paper? You know, today uh, it's a very important day for all of us because today somebody has published such an important research in homeopathy and it has taken us a, a step closer to validation. How about just sharing it with your people that I have important news to share with you? So I think that that comes with, you know, with just kind of inculcating this kind of behavior. Regular workshops on research methodology, research writing, clinical trial registration, and good ethical practices. You can never have enough of them. We being a CCI scientist, we are, we are also learning research methodology till date. So I think regular periodical workshops should keep on happening. And more, but most importantly, the urge to explore the unknown and contribute. I know everything comes with added responsibility, incentives, and all that, but the urge should be inbuilt. The urge to explore the unknown, very important. <coughs> so research hurdles are there. We, have, we all have busy schedules, students have busy schedules, faculty has busy schedules. We have inadequate knowledge of research methods can be worked upon. Deficiency in writing skills can be worked upon. Lack of infrastructure, lack of funding. There are ways to improve that and inertia to embark a new journey. These are some very common research hurdles. Now, research competency is very different from research literacy and research capacity. Building research literacy is the first step. Because first, you have to be able to understand and critically evaluate research. So research literacy can, very, can just come from attending many research methodology classes or uh, reading, making, developing a habit of reading a lot of research journals. That can make your research literate. And what will make your research, what will enhance your research capacity? If you, you know, you have conducted a couple of researches and you have the ability to conduct research. You know that you can now, not, you don't only understand research, but you, you are now in a position where you can carry your research out. But then research competency is, develop, is building a mastery of important learning outcomes at acceptable levels of performance. You know, you can do a research and then you can do a quality research which is reproducible. Is something that will be the step ahead. And that is our ultimate aim. And your confidence, the more you do that kind of research, will actually make your research competent. So that should be our aim to, to at least um, aim to make our teachers research competent. This is the infrastructure very broadly stated for research. And these are basically, you know, one, one of the many things that you would be needing as a stepping stone for research. But I think many colleges already have most of these, if not all of these. It's just to start from somewhere. I mean, the lab facilities, I think mean, most of the colleges who have OPDs, they have laboratories, they have uh, clinical facilities, they have uh, college students, uh, PhD scholars, PG scholars, and they have uh, a lot of clinical exposure already. So of course, the preclinical researchers, if uh, the colleges can afford, is something uh, that should not be ignored. Very, very uh, growing and promising uh, area for homeopathy research, where we can, uh, you know, answer the placebo uh, claim on us that preclinically, how are we proving all these, uh, you know, medicines if uh, there's no effect? So that's one thing, and of course, competency that, that we just discussed. And funds is something that if you have built a nice proposal, I think you, you have your college and then you have other fund providers also to enable good researchers. Of course, research settings are various, but then let's, let's look, look at what Dr. William Osler, the famous pathologist, has to say on research. He says, patients' wards are greatest of research laboratories. There's never been a greater research lab than a patient ward itself. It's just that we should know what is researchable in this ward. So it's for us to answer that question. But every patient ward 
has a lot of scope for research. So fundamental research, of course, uh, has a lot of aspects to it, uh, like uh, core sciences, if we can have alliance with the physics, chemistry, and zoology, and botany scientists, and drug research, pharmacy, pharmacology. These are basically uh, more for the PG students and the PhD students if they really are very keen to do something on that. And of course, the uh, other uh, areas are, focus are drug sanitization and validation of drugs where uh, CCIH is also doing a lot of work, and if uh, somebody's interested, then we can even uh, share the know-how that we have on drug standardization and drug validation researches. So uh, basically, I think uh, one thing that is, a, that is an initiative for any research is literature review, and sometimes I think we just fall short of this very, very important exercise. Literature review is something that you, you might be having a broad subject in your head, but changing your broad subject in your head to a research question, to a well-defined research question, is what literature review is going to do for you. So if your basis of literature review is not apt, then you might just think there's no research on something which is already well researched. Or probably you might just have a wrong research question because you did not look at the right, resource, right sources. So I think it's very important that this kind of capacity building that is done to the PG students, that these are your research engines. Just don't do a Google uh, search and say that, okay, I have just found these many hits. That's a very, very first level uh, research uh, literature review. So I think this is what, these are your research engines. And then you have camp specific homeopathic search engines. This is something that the students have to be oriented upon right in the beginning before they even you know, think about submitting a synopsis. And then the trial registers, of course, we should not ignore that. It's very difficult to publish your research these days if you are not CTRI registered in India, and then your international uh, registration sites as well. So it's very, very important that we know right at the beginning that clinical trial registry of India is where we have to submit our research for every clinical trial, every trial that we do on human beings. CTRI registry is very important. So I think uh, this is the clinicaltrials.gov.in is the website, and, and the CTRI team is very, very supportive. You, you submit to them and they'll communicate back to you, okay, why we cannot register you, these are your shortcomings, can you come back, with, come back to us with this? So it is, it is actually a couple of teething troubles that you will face, and then you would know that every student uh, that is doing study can, be CTR, can get CTR registry is not actually climbing the mountain. And then, of course, the manual search sources will always remain the authentic ones. So there are some uh, priority research areas in homeopathy, and now I've taken some part of it from Homeopathy Research Institute while they are, uh, they are always uh, you know, up to date with the researches. And the, the common notion that's coming is that it makes little sense to continue to put a whole system of medicine on trial by point scoring. research No, it's not important always that you find a point where research is never done. It is better to concentrate our research efforts on a small number of most promising clinical areas. And you know what? These clinical areas are more or less identified. But good quality researches are still awaited on those areas. We have preliminary evidence. There are systematic reviews on those areas where they have identified that these are the areas where we want more evidence to say homeopathy works. So let's not go and you know, do research left, right, and center on everything. It's better to just focus on a couple of things that already have given us some footage, some, some small evidence, and then we have to build on to further on to that. And then the priority areas like endemic diseases, diseases with limitation in parallel systems of medicine, diseases with high prevalence, preventive role, where homeopathy can pre pre play a preventive role, and role of homeopathy in management of debilitating a terminal illness. Very important, very, very niche area, but very, very, um, you know, workable area. And then, of course, a word of caution, I think you all must be aware, you're all senior uh, faculty seated sitting here, uh, is that your students should not fall into trap of predatory journals. They should be sensitized well in time before they are, you know, winding up their researches or publications, that they have to be very, very aware of predatory journals, which prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship. 
and are characterized by false or misleading. It's very, very difficult. Sometimes, you know, you will hit their website, you're searching for a research, for a good research journal, and you, you just enter um, reputed, uh, you know, research journals in, in camp or in complementary medicine. And then you have uh, three or four, uh, you know, hits where you will find the website very attractive. They would say we'll publish in a, in a week or something. And they will make the publication so hassle-free that you get so tempted to just, just submit your manuscript. Your, your manuscript is ready. And all the other journals are saying, no, these are our author's instructions. These are our guidelines that you want to submit. If you don't have this, then you don't submit. If you don't have that, then you don't submit. Your manuscript is not laid out this way, then we will not allow. And suddenly you uh, come across this website that is saying, OK, just submit it. Just whatever you have, just submit. And you know, but this is, uh, I'm telling you a personal experience of a researcher. He just submitted because the, the process was very simple to submit. And just moments later, he got an email saying that thank you for your publication, and this is your publication fee, and your paper is accepted. Just moments later. So this is how they will make the thing very attractive, you know? And then you are fall, you're fallen free, and then you get all those threatening messages that you're not paying your fee for submission. So we have to be very wary of such journals. And there's a criteria. There's a standard criteria for, for understanding what a pediatric journal is. And there's something called BOS list. BOS list, if you search in Google, you'll be able to go to that website where it has identified a couple of, uh, not a couple, many journals that they think are pediatry. And then there's a, there's a website called Think, Check, Submit that will give you a lot of checkpoints. Whether your journal has this, 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 then it might not be pediatry, and if it has this, 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 it might be pediatry. So you have to be very cautious of that. So this is the, this, uh, uh, you know, flowchart is very uh, simply available online if you want to look for it, and then you can just understand that how to kind of at least identify a likely predatory journal. So uh, this is an example of the email that you will get. Greetings from not easily distinguished from genuine journal. So the person's name is not identifiable. You don't, you, 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 I mean, he will not be known in your profession. And then, you know, they will write, uh, they will write a very big address, like from US, US, UK, while the journals actually belong to middle or low income countries. And they would often include very flattering personalized greetings to you that you are the biggest researcher in the world and that's why we are writing to you that you please submit to our journal or something like that they will write. And they will not really have an academic information also given. So all these things, I mean, don't be happy that, see, I have suddenly become so famous that, that famous researchers, the famous journals are writing to me. No, it might not be the case. It might be the case, but it just might not also be the case. So please be very, very cautious if you get this kind of an email. Try to be very uh, confident before submitting to such a journal. So this is again, they would not, so, so, you know, they would actually flash ISSN number in very big font, as if that's an achievement. ISSN is simply a registration of a publication that you are doing, nothing more. And they will actually give a false impact factor to you, they'll give a fake address, and, uh, and I have seen a lot of good work in homeopathy going to these pediatry journals, and the problem is we can't even reprint those to other journals. When they submit the PT students or the faculty members, they, they submit to pediatry journals, the work is published. And then when they realize that it's, oh, it, my journal was pediatry, now I want to publish the same work in a, in a reliable journal. That's just not possible. The copyrights are passed, and journals all publish original work, so it's not possible to reprint your paper in some other journal. So the, the work is actually gone in drain. So we have to be very worried of this thing. These are, this is a list of uh, recommended homeopathy journals. Um, so uh, I, this is, I mean, there might be more, but what I'm saying is this is at least a good uh, list of journals that, will, that are reputed and that are not predatory and that would uh, give you, bring you some laurels if you are able to publish in these journals. So I think it's better that we be patient with our publications, take our time and get, and you know, getting rejected from a, from a good journal is also a learning process. So don't be scared. If you think that your paper is this level, at least start from a journal that is this level. So your rejections will give you two things. One, learning experience, because your rejection, your, with your rejection, the paper, uh, you know, the, the editor might just tell you what are your, the shortcomings of your paper. And second, 
when you are actually coming back to this level of this, which where you originally belonged, your paper is already improved. So don't be scared or don't, I mean, let your, let your students not be scared of submitting to a good journal. So it's always a learning process. Um, right, so I think that was my part and I now request Dr. Devya to please take over from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Haleem. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we've been talking for the last 40, 45 minutes about uh, research. And uh, somewhere we, it, we've driven home the point that research is a must for our survival. There's no other way out. Uh, keeping, just talking about research, let's for a minute forget about homeopathy, allopathy, or whatever. If you're talking about drug research, there are two things that need to be kept in mind. Whatever input goes into it, Right. There's a lot of resources, there's a lot of intellectual input that is going into it. So ultimately, whatever comes out of it, it is very important that the basic uh, standards... Uh, I missed the slide, okay. The basic uh, standards for the design, conduct, record and report of research are maintained. And at the same time, the patient safety is not compromised, it's well taken care of, and the data is reliable and credible so that it can be used further. Now, this is what the International Council for Harmonization of Technical Requirements for pharmaceutical, uh, of all pharmaceuticals for human use says, and that is what good clinical practices guidelines are. We've come across this word any number of times. But at the same time, we also realize, can I have it on the full screen? How do I bring it, please? Uh, so what is important is, at the same time, a number of other guidelines have come in over the years. And then there are ethical guidelines that have come in from ICMR. And from our experiences at CCRH for res conducting researches for many, many years, we realized that there are certain aspects that were unique to homeopathy, which these guidelines probably could not address to, and that is why we needed a separate uh, guideline of good clinical practices for clinical trials in homeopathy, which was published in 2021. And uh, this compiles all these particular guidelines and taking into consideration the requirements of homeopathy. So what is coming next is the objective why these guidelines were done, just to provide a guiding tool on how to do quality research. And whatever research is done, we are able to do in, a, in an ethical manner and ensure that the data is reliable and credible. And then there were a lot of questions. How do we bring in novel products? What do we do about new drugs? Uh, during COVID times, we saw a lot of WhatsApp messages coming in, but what is the process that should be there? So there were a lot of clashes happening and somewhere down the line, this particular set of guidelines tries to answer those questions as well. So talking about clinical trials, now. This GCP guidelines has got 14 principles. These 14 principles take care of clinical trials. It takes care of participants, it takes care of documentation, it takes care of publication, and all these aspects are addressed in the various chapters that this particular guideline has. So clinical trials, number one, they should be conducted in accordance with the ethical principles that have their origin in Declaration of Helsinki and consistent with GCPH and other applicable requirements. Simply one line about Declaration of Helsinki, it is meant for practitioners who are researchers. And just 37 lines, which can be read in 40 minutes, which is a must for every practitioner who intends to think about research. Even if he's intending to think about research, these 40 minutes of his time is a must before he starts thinking about it. So that is an important aspect that cannot be done away with. And then the research needs to be in consistency with the latest applicable regulatory requirements. So within the GCP, there are provisions for trials, for development of new drugs, validation of pharmacopoeial drugs, emergency conditions, how do we repurpose it? All these were experiences that we've gathered over years. And uh, then quality assurance, and then it also gives a list of authoritative homeopathic books. Talking about protection of participants, yes, there are a lot of guidelines that are there. ICMR speaks of it. This particular guideline takes into consideration those and a couple of requirements required for homeopathy. Like, for example, it simply speaks, whatever ethical committee 
is looking at a project which is homeopathic in nature should at least have a homeopath in it. So this was something that is there in the ICMR guideline but it was never recreated. So that is what this guideline recreates that at least it should have a homeopath in it uh, whatever ethical committee is looking at it and then it gives the composition how this ethical committee should work. Why is it important for uh, uh, all of us here as principals to know this? Because most of us will be appellates to this ethical committee. At our colleges, we would be the forming authorities and we would be the appellates for it and it will be our responsibility that the committee is functioning fine. So that is why these guidelines become very, very important for us to understand and then take them further into our ins educational institutions. Then talking about the team, obviously this talks are, has details of responsibilities of sponsors, investigators, who are monitors, what do they do, who are auditors, what do they do. And how do you do collaborations? If we look at the ICH GCB guidelines, it talks about responsibility of sponsors and investigators. But then we realize that there are absolutely, you know, very uh, sketchy data on monitoring of homeopathic trials. On auditing of homeopathic trials, there was absolutely nothing. So that is why now tomorrow, today, uh, probably the auditing is not happening as it should. But if I'm trying to work upon a new drug, and mind you, I've just been out of college I did my post graduation a couple of years back only and I realized that there's a lot of innovation in our students. They want to work. There's a lot of innovation in our faculty. So what is important is tomorrow if you want to come up with new drugs, how do we do those studies? How do we get those studies monitored? How, we, do, we get, how do we get those studies audited is important. How do we go ahead with collaborations, national and international? And then talking about the drug, we've introduced the term, the investigational product, which is we've introduced this term for the new substance that we are trying to work upon. And then if you look at uh, the international guidelines, they talk of investigators brochure. What happens with homeopaths is when they go ahead with, you know, other organizations talking about it, they'll ask you preclinical data here, investigators brochure here. So this guideline makes it very clear that if, uh, for example, you're working on revalidation or existing drugs, you don't really need an investigators brochure and if, where do you need it and what all should it contain? Then documentation, so obviously protocol is one, then how do we document about the ethical review process and all the steps of documentation that are needed, how do we do it, what should be the, what should come in case records, what should come in protocols. If you look at the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, it also gives a protocol. But then when it comes to drug, it, stops, it is talking about bioequivalence, it is talking about uh, various other factors which we say are not applicable to homeopathy. Then what is applicable to homeopathy? The dosage, the potency, how are we dispensing it? What are sugar of milk? Whatever we are doing it. All these things are applicable to homeopathy and that is what our trial should talk about. Trial protocol should talk about. So documenting procedures and then it also has a paragraph on electronic data processing because that is what is needed for future. Then talking about publication, it also talks about conflict of interest, then responsible authorship, peer review processes. So all these, uh, these guidelines gives you basic understanding of all these aspects as well. So this was released last year and this is a very small publication and this publication, uh, these are the chapters. What I was speaking about was just what all it contains. But if you look at it, this, uh, it talks about what are the prerequisites of a trial, how do you go ahead with the ethical committee part of it, what are the responsibilities, how do we do a record keeping and finally the quality assurance of it. And that's a publication that can be obtained from CCRH. You can write to us on uh, ccrhpublications at gmail.com to get this publication. So what is important is research is not a choice. It's something that is required for our survival now. That is, how, that is the stage which we have come on. And we need to build upon it. And what is important is that whatever research is done, is done in a very ethical manner and no resources are wasted. And that was the idea behind this entire presentation. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Divya Taneja, for the GCP guideline, Dr. Harleen Kaur for her wonderful presentation, and uh, Dr. Subhash Kaushik, sir, for his insight in the research. Uh, now we have a uh, next presentation of life management cycle, educational life cycle management system of Ayush grid. This is the project by the Ministry of Ayush, which connects all the stakeholders, NCH, 
all the teaching faculty, UGPG students, colleges, university, and state councils. Uh, they are giving presentation by video conferencing. Uh, Ms. Gunjan and BISAC team. I welcome Ms. Gunjan and BISAC team for their video presentation. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Am I audible? Uh, you are not audible. Hmm? Hello. Now I'm audible. Hello. Hello. Your presentation. Am I audible, ma'am? Am I audible? You are audible, ma'am. Okay. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Gunjan. I'm an IT project manager in Bhaskar Charya National Institute of Bioinformatics and Space Application. Uh, so currently, we are the auto scientific autonomous body of Ministry of Economics and IT. Yeah. So we are a, a scientific society of Ministry of Electronics and IT. So currently, uh, we are working in sectors of software development, geospatial tech applications and satellite communication so currently we are associated with the ministry of ayush for regarding the education sector of the ministry of ayush so we are developing uh, some of the modules like managing system for the national commission of homeopathy so please next So in the daily basis, each and every student, faculty, uh, commission, PG students, university facing some issues regarding their admission process. Like I am, if I'm taking an example of a student who are giving neat examination after that, he or she should uh, be eligible for the admission any of the college or university. But some of the, you know, manual process it, it will won't be possible for a good uh, qualified need student to get an admission in the good college some of the uh, scam happened with the some of the students for so that's the main idea of the ministry of ius to make one it sector for the ius grid for each and every commission so uh, for currently for nch national commission for homeopathy we design some of the modules which in the stakeholders are National Commission of Homeopathy, faculties of each and every college and university, UG and PG students, colleges, university, and state councils. So uh, we developed different, different um, logins, credentials for each and every applicant by the using of the Aadhaar card authentication. So no one will forged or scam in any of the IT modules. Next, please. So you can see over the screen, there are these main uh, module of the educational sector, which is education life cycle management. And this, you can um, capture whole detail by the one unique ID, which is the Ayush ID. You can capture the whole details of one student from starting to the end. If he or she enter in the college by the application management system, the 
ID will capture their admissions, examination, curriculum, timetable, lecture, attendance, each and everything in through the one ID, a unique ID, which is Ayush ID. So it will be why we uh, came the idea of the IT, one IT sector for the Ministry of Ayush, because it will help to transparency the system and end-to-end -end student and teacher life cycle workflow which is helpful for the commission as well as the colleges university to understand and uh, capture the whole process and hold the data of the life cycle of the student so we have this we designed these some modules as well in the education life cycle management you can see over the screen of the application management counseling admission curriculum management so I'll explain each and every sub module uh, by one by one. So after that, we also uh, associated for design and develop the digital learning platform as well. For that, we have to create e-learning, uh, you know, e-learning modules for which if in, you know, in the pandemic, every student has faced some issue regarding their, you know, learn the new things because there were not so many things in the e-learning. So we designed the e-learning uh, module as well, through which a student can sit at their home and learn so many things. If a student wants to add some elective courses or some um, new courses to in his uh, curriculum, so they can through this. So next, please. So why we add these modules these sub modules in education life cycle management system because these are some of the benefits so a student can reduce the dependency on the manual processes a student should not go here and there like if if some college says you have to go here some admission in the counseling they said for for second counsel you have to go in this state for for third counsel you have to go in another state but by using this module that full fully dependency will be closed then after that single unified platform for all the students in through the one ayush id a un, unique id which is authenticated via aadhaar card authentication student will add all of the uh, things which he required for their um, you know growth so on the one platform he will add anything he can view their curriculum he can view their hostel management, he can view their library, e-learning, each and everything. And the third is the transparency in student and teacher related matrices. You know, some of these students come and uh, give some attendance on the, you know, on the paper and they circulate on the daily basis. That student can't capture their, uh, teacher can't capture their details if the students is available on this class or not. Through this module, teacher can uh, capture the attendance via the uh, devices by the iris recognition concept then uh, same as for the teacher as well colleges and university will capture the attendance of the faculties so if the faculties are working on college side by side they're working out on another college as well but through teacher codes teacher will be captured on the, this it sector modules and no one teacher can work for another different different colleges Third, uh, availability of information on digital format. Some of the students are not aware from the, like some of the CME plans is going to be happening, some new policies formulations by the commission are not aware uh, to the student. So through this, um, new notifications will be uh, given to the student on their ID as well as so they can log in and they can capture if new policy or new notification is uh done uh like past or not they can be uh, aware of that as well personalized learning and ment mentoring so you know so many of the alumni will pass out their colleges after that some of the student wants their uh, career growth uh, advices and feedbacks from the alumni should they should go to this college or not that through this module can done as well we have developed the alumni alumni module as well and that college will provide the ids to the alumni and through the webcast they can uh, communicate with the different different alumni and get their feedback as well next piece so this is the main uh, home page for the nch 
we have developed with the many interaction and discussion with the commission uh, please next so we have provided the sign up and sign in uh, processes as well for after counseling so many student can admit the another different different colleges by this uh, module we have the categories we have the aadhar so no one can because in the neat examination aadhar card is mandatory with the with aadhar card authentication a student can enter in the module otherwise they can't so uh, first they can enter through this and uh, through the aadhar card they can enter uh, next please or otherwise uh, those who don't have a college wants to add their uh, details they can enter through this uh, for the sign up these are the details which we captured next please we have just just wait uh, uh please back please back okay so we have the alumni uh, sign up over here some of the colleges has provided the uh alumni for the registration but some of the colleges do, some of the alumni don't have their login so they can sign up through over here and they can add their all the details on over the form which was provided on the uh, module as well next please next uh please next 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 piece next yeah, yeah. so uh, after neat qualification uh, when the student got their result for the particular college after that the journey will start over here the student can fill their form their personal details basic, basic education details upload their documents as per requirement the college declaration each and everything will be after filling out this form the uh, ayush id will generate to the student now the capturing of their data from their starting to the end will start over here so this is very helpful for ug and pg student to capture their whole details they have not to go here and there and they should be authenticated so this data is authenticated with the nic servers and no uh, of the data will be happen after this um, it structure that's the main reason of the ministry of ayush to create ayush id and make the it structure because currently and i any of the commissioners of ministry of ayush is not having their own uh, database to having this kind of data uh, next piece so after filling all of the things this will be the form of the preview and the person will add and it will be sent it to the college and university for the uh, physical verification next so we have uh, developed some curriculum management uh, module as well as we discussed in the curriculum management so as per the university those who wants to their professional wise they can create curriculum as per the curriculum lecture management will be designed so uh, curriculum will be designed accordingly then the lecture will be designed so it will be very helpful for student to and uh, to analyze which lecture will be helpful for them and which is the courses each and everything will be showing on the student dashboard and as well as on the colleges ncis and nch everything okay next okay next uh abhishek you want to add something on this Yes, ma'am. T uh, three object learning uh, curriculum in a curriculum. T uh, three. Hello, I'm audible, ma'am. Yes, Abhishek, I'm audible. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, curriculum. Uh, any curriculum. T three object learning. Add any object learning like. like topic wise a uh, a3 course and b3 learning objective we add we can add from here ma'am 
next piece Abhishek, please go. Uh, you can explain all the. So over here, the commission dashboard is showing. So they are the right. They have the right. Right, to create a list of any of the college the, the college and university will uh, if they wants to add it will go to the commission first then they will approve the same and regarding the curriculum management if the college will create the curriculum management the new curriculum management that have to be approved by the NCH next Uh, so we have created uh, practical exams as well for the students. Those who wants to give professional wise exam, they can give it through the uh, portal as well. Next, please. So we have created timetable as well. So teacher can create their timetable accordingly. And if uh, there is some guested holidays or state holidays, they can enter. So it will be created for the student that it, on that day is a holiday and be showing the same. Next, please. So we have created day wise as well and weekly wise as well, monthly as well. So they can view there. We have we create we maintain the history as well for the timetable. So student can easily um, get their exam. Uh, they they will easily understand on which date they have the exams and they on which date they have the holidays as well. It will be very helpful for them to understand. Next piece. So lecture management, we have created the templates according to curriculum management, the lecture and management will be created. So whatever the curriculum, they will be created. Next, please. Student attendance, you can see over here, we, Gujarat College, we have one of the college. So we, uh, it's very easy for commission as well as for college and university to get the attendance of the student because we all, we integrate the third party of with the iris recognition. So it will be very helpful. So no forging, no scamming by the student will be done over here because it's iris recognition. So when they look at the camera, they, the capture, the attendance will capture on the daily uh, or by lecture wise. Please next. And same as for the staff attendance as well. So it, if it's uh, staff is presented, so it will be capture the details as well. Next please. Hostel, we created the hostel management module as well for that, for the same. And uh, if person wants to because some of the students who are not from the same state and they wants to add so they can easily next please next next so this these are for the students for the colleges we have created the dashboards next please uh, okay next so student will get the rent as well. How much the rent for these uh, hostel they will get by the college, which is created by the college only. Okay. Library management. We have created the e-library as well as for the students, those who are uh, wants uh, to get, those who don't have the time to go to the library, we have the e-library management system as well. Next, please. Next. Next. Yeah. So we have created the feedback because some of the students and faculty, they have their queries and uh, some problems they don't discuss with the colleges and all. They can give the feedbacks and you can see over here the dashboard will uh, showing the negative as well as the positive uh, feedbacks both for the commission. It will be very useful for the colleges to understand what are they lacking of and same as for the commission they understand which college is uh, doing great job which is which is are having some of the lacking periods so they can think of they can do the this very it, this will be very helpful for the uh, inception as well for the uh, commission to go to college and get what's the issue the students and teachers are facing next please next 
so we created the place because some of the students want some uh, placement so we have created the placement management system as well so over here the uh, college will upload or uh, some of the placements or uh, those those who are job seekers it will be very helpful for the student that will be reflected on their uh, notification sec uh, section that these are the companies who are going to be present in the college for the placement so it uh, you all students are very because in the uh, you know come nch uh, in for the homeopathy students there are not so many of the placements uh, sec uh, companies coming up but in the, currently in the future there are so many uh, companies wants homeopathy doctors so placement management will help the doctors to get their placement through the university on the colleges next so it the, this is the dashboard for the universities so they can be very helpful next please alumni so alumni as i told you uh, in the previous slides that alumni is a very very big part for the students because we all believe in our seniors that whatever they will have faced through the colleges everything the hospitals and all they will guide us the best we we have a fully thought like they are the uh, good guiders which they give the us the feedback the best feedback so that can be we have developed one webcam uh, webcast um, online system for the alumni so they can easily interact with each and every student ug and pg student that very helpful for them which sector they should go and uh, which uh, company is best for their career growth and all so alumni meet is very very important we can do because some of the student has who has passed they can't come just because of their job uh, uh, job they can't come to that particular school again so they, this web application that very helpful for the students for to understand the alumni perspective and feedbacks regarding the college regarding the uh, placements regarding the experiences in hospitals and all it will be very helpful that they we will show we can't show in this uh, slide this is very uh, helpful uh, webinar for these students next please next uh, next please so we have created this dashboard for the commission so it uh, will be very helpful for the commission who they have these they got the all the details on their dashboard seats allotted seats uh, total seats they are having so they can't be scammed by the uh, another colleges regarding their seats so because uh, some of the management uh, seats are also there they have the all the idea regarding that and some of the uh, how many seats are allocated how many good feedbacks given by the uh, seats, seats reward, in school, each and everything next please uh, so we have already showed you uh, this um, dashboard so commission for the commission will be very understandable that uh, how many seats are available how many is there any scam is going on in any states they can uh, filter that as well so all this it structure system will help the students faculties colleges to uh, universities uh, state councils and most of the main uh, commission to capture all the details to the one id only ayush id all the details only one from their starting to end so this is the uh, main idea behind the uh, ministry of ayush to create it structure for each and every commission of the who are associated with the ayush ministry of ayush so uh, next please so i hope i deliver my thoughts to everyone and uh, if anyone having any doubts so we can clear on the call as well thank you so much
these kind of uh, uh, initiatives which we have taken up in NCS since last one and a half year. And uh, thanks to the team who have been working tirelessly to frame up such new endeavors. And uh, I expect that our principals, our faculties, and all the faculties actually should go through these processes in a comprehensive manner. These will be shared in a time to come and there will be a clear cut orientation in zone wise so that we can understand and follow these uh, online system which will be available in a time to come. I think within next two, three months we'll be ready with this whole process coming up online. Second thing, uh, you have now listened to research side also, and I expect that every college should actually uh, document their clinical case records, hospital records, OPD records, even administration records, all in a digital manner in such a way that they are visible on their website, so they will need not to inspect you. That process we want to come up to that level and that is what is our expectation is and uh, you are welcome to ask any queries whenever you can you want to talk to us in the commission you can send those queries on email we will be happy to revert back to you but certainly there are two things which are very strictly which we are following is uh, we will not compromise with the minimum essential standards. That is one thing. And you have to achieve those minimum essential standards in your colleges. Being uh, the administrators of the colleges, please uh, tell your team that they have to follow those minimum essential standards in the colleges so that we are all on the same page. We should form a uniform carnival standards that is the one major aspect which you are now talking about. And uh, third thing, uh, from the research side, many colleges have already done some collaborations with the CCRH, and, uh, but it remained there only on paper. Uh, few colleges, only hardly three or four colleges came up to the CCRH to start collaborative research project. And others, they simply signed and no further activities going on. So kindly uh, motivate your nodal officers who are dealing with this research. And it will be better if you can identify a nodal officer who can take up research in your college. Share those name of those nodal officers to the commission so that we can connect you with the team of researchers so that those kind of mandate can also be taken up in a time to come. And uh, in the next two lectures, which we'll be taking up, is about the records. Dr. Naveen Pawaskar will be talking about those record system. And before that, uh, Dr. Sanjay, he'll be talking about legal provisions. I think these are the two lectures. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Gunjan uh, ma'am, your session was full of passion and priceless knowledge. Consequently, I would like to invite upon stage Professor Dr. Sanjay Gupta sir. He is presently working as a secretary, National Commission for Homeopathy. He worked as a professor of practice of medicine, government, homeopathic medical college and hospital, Bhopal. He was a state nodal officer for joint Ayush malaria control program through homeopathy. He too was a former member, board of governor to erstwhile CCH. For oral presentation, his topic is legal obligation while the college fulfills the statutory provisions. Over to you, sir. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you. I'm happy and encouraged. And today we shall be realizing what happens with the student when they are for such length of time continuously sitting in the classroom. And it has been observed, we, you see the front rows, who they may see at their back, almost hall is full till 15 minutes back. So it is an encouraging thing for the commission. And I know ki we are in short of time and it is the pretty subject where 
the commission does not enjoy good relationship as far as litigations are considered. So I will try to spell out, we reduce this situation of stress and we understand the act in total. So there are minimum litigation and the intent is clear. Because what I feel, the litigations come when our intent is different. But I am sure that when the question of intent is considered, we all have a common intent, common interest, and that is the upliftment of homeopathy, interest of homeopathy, to which nobody would be denying. But even then, we have certain litigations. So I will try to spell out and to make that clear thought in our intent from commission point of view. I should not say commission point of view, but from act point of view. Dear friends, I'm sorry I don't have a PowerPoint presentation with me this time because of business. When you go through this, what all legal binding you have as an institution principal or as a senior faculty of an institution, I think we should go through the first paragraph of the act. And what does the act say? Act says that we have a teaching and a teaching and a teaching which is affordable, शिक्षा हो चाहे चिकित्सा हो चाहे सर्विस हो वो आम जनता की रीच में हो उसका कम्युनिटी पर्सपेक्टिव हो नेशनल हेल्थ गोल को प्रमोट करे और कोई ग्रीवेंस हो तो वो आसानी से मिट जाए यदि ये पांच बातें एज अ संस्थान के प्राचार्य या सीनियर प्रोफेसर या मैनेजमेंट हमारे दिमाग में आ गई तो मेरे को लगता है कि ये जो जितना कोर्ट केस है ये खत्म हो जाएगा और मुझे बड़ा दुख होता है। I have been professor like you और मैं वहाँ देखता हूँ कि कई विद्यार्थियों से फीस बहुत मुश्किल से आती है। कुछ लोग संपन्न भी होते थे, उनसे कलेक्ट करना मुश्किल होता है। और हम दोनों लोग मिलके ये अधिवक्ताओं को इतना पैसा देते हैं जिसका जरूरत नहीं है। तो मेरे को लगता है कि यदि आज इस लेक्चर so as I told you, ki in the very first paragraph of the act, there are the bindings with which we are linked to as an institution, as an individual, or as an, any sort of stakeholder. So if we have that clear intent, so we can have a situation of reduced litigation. Besides that, in the very same paragraph, there is a, our role to contribute to research. And high ethical standards. See, ethics cannot be taught, but they have to be developed. And for that, there should be a source of inspiration. My experience says that when I see people around me who follow meticulously one path, and there are ups and downs, but at the, at the end of the day, there is success, there is appreciation, there is respect. It encourages me ki I follow the same path. So as an institution, I have seen somewhere in uh, some court ki to take one class to make that le uh, uh, one lecture understand to student is something a uh, small work of teacher. It is not fair enough for a teacher. What a teacher should do is he should inspire students and then he rolls by himself. In the same manner, I will be trying ki I inspire you to clear the doubts that in the intent and we have a reduced litigation and things roll on on your part and we become your force. So most of the things when they are being followed means when they are into operation, the operative part, there comes the difference. And what I've seen there at com uh, commission for six months, ki there are two types of sets of cases litigation between us. One is related to government sector institutes and another is related to private sector institutes. In government sector, most of the litigations are related to service matter or where some faculty is involved. Whereas in private sector, I think it is like a rare situation that there is any litigation between a faculty and a management. There may be differences, but there is no litigation. But there are litigations related to mostly permission. And in the last, you can say you, that is something related to recognition of qualification. 
But my dear friends, I say this is not only the three spheres where commission has to act. You understand the gravity of the situation. There is a one office and in that office there is a chairperson who enjoys yeah, who is with the responsibility of equal cadre of Secretary Government of India. There are three presidents of autonomous board who enjoys the cadre of additional Secretary Government of India, which is like Chief Secretary of government, uh, State Government. And there are cadre of Joint Secretary Government of India, nine people in that office, which are equivalent to Principal Secretary in the state. You see one Principal Secretary, how much it works in the state, with what onus it has. So, it, it becomes a larger responsibility from your end to that this commission keeps functioning, the act intended to do so. And there are certain things which should be clear in your mind. Act says the highest authority to decide is government of India. See, whether we like it, we don't like it. But as a democratic country, when it is an act, we have to follow. There may be situation if there are provisions in the act which creates difficulty, but we can sit and find a solution. Secondly, there is the provision that you as a regulatory body, if something is suggested, it has to be followed. If we go into litigation, so how does the system comes up? I don't oppose that any of the stakeholders should not be the part of consultation process. Because consultation will only reduce the litigation. But I also see the situation when there is the time to consult, very few people write to commission. I tell you with honesty, I have been moving throughout the country discussing with stakeholders. Still I have to ignite them, motivate them to write to commission. Because when you write this time, so this commission takes into account so many stakeholders have written over this situation, how to move ahead. But there are certain points when it is outrightly clear that when there is a direction from government of India, we have a limited role. Because as a policy matter, when things have been decided, so there is a situation and I personally feel that most of the time people have written because of that transient difficulty. But once we overcome that, you see we have a good period ahead. Today also I was talking to many principals. They all had one thing in their mind. And what was that? They are worried about admission. But my dear colleagues and seniors, how this situation came up? Somewhere we did something wrong or we missed something doing. I am not uh, examining somebody's act, me or past or something like that. But as an honest person, you see there is a problem into our system. How it must have come up? You introspect. Don't go with my words or somebody else's words. So unless and until you address that situation, it will not be overcome. Regarding fees, there is a bounding upon you. And there is a lot of confusion. But I got a gentleman yesterday. He was from state of Karnataka. And we have a litigation from there. And he understood what this commission is uh, suggesting. I tell you with great authority to communicate the decision of the commission, commission is not interfering in fees deciding procedure. If somebody wants to understand, I will make him understand because this is not the right time. It has certain explanation and that gentleman is here. Maybe he may be communicating to association with whom we are having some litigation. But you make it clear, commission is not interfering, commission is not binding anything. Commission is only set a guideline that to be followed through state authority for fees and admission. <coughs> so don't have confusion, don't waste money, things are clear. Secondly, <clears throat> there are certain compul uh, compulsions and legal boundings with respect to exam. I do understand, but it is upon us how we take up the situation. For example, I tell you there is one test in our act, NTET, National Teachers Eligibility Test. It is not into NMC. Humko kai bar mein dekhta hoon, honestly bole, hoi ye nahi kehta, ki mein Ayurved se bahut achcha hoon. Woh hamesha apna benchmark modern medicine, conventional medicine ko banata hai. Hum kuch bhi kahe, lekin kahi na kahi, hum loog ko kahi is system mein, samajik system jo accepted hai, humko wahan se chalna hai. Ab aap bataiye, ab aap bahar kya kahenge? 
एनएमसी का टीचर बनने के लिए कोई एग्जाम नहीं चाहिए आपके टीचर बनने के लिए एग्जाम चाहिए हाउ डू यू सी दिस सिचुएशन यू कैन क्रिटिसाइज और यू कैन से वी हैव अ सेट ऑफ बेंच मार्क हायर देन देम सो इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन अस बट एज आई टोल्ड यू इट इज अ डेमोक्रेटिक कंट्री देर इज एन एक्ट वी हैव टू फॉलो बट सपोज दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रोविजन we come to the consensus it is not required so it is to be meticulously examined there is a process to discuss over it see if some genuine points are written people are ready to understand and sometimes they call the doctor saab we could see ki something different has been written by you but we are not able to get it what exactly do you want to see so that way that consultation should go on and it will limit our litigation and it will help you understanding the legal bounding which as a stakeholder you have similarly much has been said there are number of litigation everyone is watching towards this litigation what is the decision there neat national eligibility entrance test go through the act but i say the act let us keep act aside it is very clear it need has to be followed because it is written into act me being secretary office bearers of the commission we are bounded if we need to upheld act but you see i tell i give you one example we had certain situation there was a court decision and many people interpreted their way they like this i use i don't say ki everybody has this opinion but i have a reason for it there are two words qualified not qualified you tell me when this question will arise whether you are qualified not qualified unless and until i enter and sit on in that exam that question will not arise this is what i want to communicate this way but there is very clear in the act that this entrance exam is to decide merit with uniformity so that we do the highest order of justice with the student in the form of merit similarly it is with the post graduate exam and commission is taking up some suggestions regarding that and uh, we have an example recently nmc has amended their act so it was if i am not wrong it was in 19 nmc act was in nine, uh, 2019 it was implemented executed and in 22 they came up with an amendment but they had a robust planning they had a robust reasoning and government got convinced so the same procedure we have to follow and at least i say if we will have to be optimistic and have to have faith with each into each other then there are certain obligation as an institution new act there are functions we expect ki institution should have to have activities which facilitate development and training of faculty most of the time what we do is we pick up that msr and we start counting itna room ho gaya hai itna ye ho gaya hai if you ask me personally i say that is only one third part and that should not decide the fate of the college for permission actual fate should be on the simple line it is a good learning center and it has a functional hospital genuine teachers are there genuine teaching is there and we don't need any record sir if somebody is doing there are number of things to demonstrate otherwise wo hum sab usi mein jaate hain mera ek kagaj hai main wo bech diya it is not in the interest of system <coughs> choice is ours i told you it is very difficult to collect the fees and i am seeing people are charging high then there is one more compulsion see this uh, whole act has been रिटर्न विद विजन बिहाइंड ये जो आज का एनसीएच एक्ट है ना ये थानेदारी के लिए नहीं है अभी हम लोग सिर्फ चार साल के लिए एक टीम तो मेरे से भी आगे चल रहे कुछ ऑफिसर्स दे विल बी लिविंग दिस कमीशन एंड आई विल बी लिविंग देयर आफ्टर एनी ऑफ यू अमंग अस विल बी हियर अगेन लेकिन ये सब लोग दिमाग में बैठ ले चाहे हम यहां खड़े हो चाहे वहां खड़े हो ये थानेदारी बंद हो गई है सुओ मोटो आपको खुद को रियलाइजेशन होना चाहिए ये होम्योपैथी के लिए ठीक नहीं है इतना तो नहीं करूंगा है। मैं उतना सक्षम नहीं हूँ उतना सामर्थ नहीं हूँ लेकिन दो कदम हर बार आगे बढ़ूंगा ये इंटेंट इस एक्ट में और मैं जिम्मेदारी से कह सकता हूँ दो आई डोंट डील विद परमिशन बट आई सीन माई अथॉरिटीज 
viewing that picture into the your forms kyunki ek bar kya hua mere ko bole sir mere paas sab kuch hai mere paas koi milne aaya main bola kya kya hai bole sab kuch hai sab print dala humne bola kya kare bole sir permission dijiye humko permission galat mila hai to maine unko bola sir aapke paas sab kuch hai is kamre mein dabbe mein rakh ke rakh dijiye abhi kya karu aapko permission de de to he got the answer तो कई बार ये चीज है इंटेंट से क्लियर होती है कागज में देखेंगे इसके बाद पांच माइक्रोस्कोप है है भैया इसके पास इतना टेबल है भैया सब कहा है बोले बक्से में बक्सा कहा है कमरे में दे दे परमिशन तो नहीं होता है तो वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट कि हमको अपना इंटेंट क्लियर रखना है एंड नथिंग इज परमानेंट कल मुझे उधर ही आना है सो वी शुड हैव दिस क्लैरिटी की एक्ट ये नहीं कह रहा है एक्ट आपको एनकरेज कर रहा है कैसे कर रहा है मेरा सर बेस्ट इंस्टीट्यूट है मेरा नंबर ज्यादा आना चाहिए तेरा नंबर ज्यादा क्यों आना चाहिए भैया आपका नंबर इसलिए ज्यादा आना चाहिए सर देखिए मैं ये नई नई चीजें ये एक्ट का इतना सारा फंक्शन है मेरा एक्टिविटी होता है मेरे कॉलेज में यू विल ग्रेडेड हाई अब क्या होगा ये कमीशन का दायित्व है एक्सक्यूज मैन आई है वॉटर प्लीज तो ये कमीशन का दायित्व है हर बच्चे को हर फैकल्टी को हर पेरेंट को गवर्नमेंट को और कमीशन को ये पता होना चाहिए कि ये इंस्टीट्यूशन का ग्रेडेशन रेटिंग कैसा है क्योंकि हर आदमी ऊपर जाना चाहता है मैं भी बड़े इंस्टीट्यूशन में ही काम करना चाहता हूं स्टेट से सेंट्रल में जाना चाहता हूं सेंट्रल वाला इंटरनेशनल जाना चाहता है ये कब पता चलेगा जब आपके सामने ये पिक्चर है कि इसका लेवल आई है एंड दैट इज माई टारगेट सिमिलरली एक स्टूडेंट के लिए कि उसका अपना मेरिट के हिसाब से वो कहाँ कहाँ टारगेट कर सकता है ये हमारे एक्ट का इंटेंट है और ये इंटेंट हमने नहीं पूरा किया तो दुनिया भर का केस ही केस लगना है और केस लगना भी चाहिए क्यों क्योंकि तो हम एक्ट की भावनाओं के हिसाब से काम नहीं कर रहे शब्दों में घुसे हुए इसके अलावा एक और चीज है कि वी हैव टू वॉलेंटरली डिस्क्लोज और वो कमीशन ग्रेडिंग डिस्क्लोज करेगा और इंस्टीट्यूशन अपना हर पहलू डिस्क्लोज करेगा अभी उसके लिए हम बांधे एक डैशबोर्ड हो दिन भर हो उसका लिंक मुझे दे दो मत लीजिए भाई अपने मन को मत जुट लाइए और हमको मालूम है कई चीजें थोड़ी डिफिकल्ट है और कमीशन इस बात को लेके अवेयर है कई बार हमारा बात हुआ कि पेशेंट संख्या पे बुक बहस हो रहा है 250 कम ज्यादा लेकिन कमीशन को मालूम है कैसे मुश्किल से आता है लेकिन आपका इंटेंट कि भाई मैं 200 तक पहुंचा वो दिखता है दो से दो का प्रयास किया हाथ में हाथ रख के पांच साल बैठेंगे वो 200 से 180 होने वाला है तो एज अ स्टेक होल्डर आप पे लीगल बाउंडिंग ये है कि सतत आप आगे बढ़े सतत अपने प्रयासों में वृद्धि करें और सुअ मोटो करें ये थानेदारी तो खत्म हो गया एनसीएच एक्ट से आप अपना पोजीशन खुद लेंगे कमीशन तो केवल अवार्ड करेगा और आप ही कमीशन को बाध्य करेंगे कि आपको देना ही पड़ेगा मेरे यहाँ ये एक्टिविटी एंड दिस इज दस of functioning in my hospital and this is the genuineness of teaching at my college ek camera camera to kya hota hai ki ek sajjan vyakti hai uske sab kuch chal raha tha wo thoda likhne padhne mein kachcha tha mere tarah abhi ppt nahi banaya abhi kaise batau main padh ke aaya mera content bolega aur aap log hi judge karenge ki ppt nahi bana koi baat nahi to hum sun liye kya kahenge main galat bola kya ppt se nahi bola ye sara cheez sirf supportive hota hai पीपी मतलब ये कैमरा ही तय करता है ऐसा नहीं है कैमरा फेल हो गया तो क्या करे कॉलेज बंद कर दे क्या लेकिन बट ही विल रिकॉर्ड्स लेकिन क्या होता है कि मैं जेन्यूनली बोल रहा हूँ कई बार हमारा फाइट ही हो जाता है वो वर्ड्स में हम घुस जाते हैं वो हमारे इंटरेस्ट के लिए नहीं है मेरे को याद है नाइन्टी का सिचुएशन इसी स्टेट ऑफ मध्य प्रदेश में देर वॉज कॉलेज यूज टू चार्ज डोनेशन इन डिप्लोमा कोर्सेस एंड नाउ हमने इतना रेगुलेट किया इतना गवर्नेंस डाला एडमिशन नहीं हो रहा है We have to introspect. एक क्यों हो रहा है? तो ये एक दो चीजें था. तीसरा आता है को, कोई कोई experience certificate देता है. ये जो government का side का है. As a principal, as a senior faculty, as an administrator, आपको ध्यान में रखना है कि आपका experience आप कैसा देते हैं. उसकी वजह से कितना court case हो गया है. Court case होने से भर्ती नहीं हो रहा है. भर्ती नहीं होगा तो system खड़ा नहीं होगा. कहीं ना कहीं government अपने चर्चा में शासकीय संस्था को पहले प्रायोरिटी देती है जिन प्रांतों में शासकीय संस्था नहीं है वहां प्राइवेट को देती है लेकिन अभी इतना लिटिगेशन होगा आदमी नहीं होगा 
आप सबको ऐसा काम करना है कि यू सेंड दी बेस्ट पर्सनैलिटी टू कमीशन और ये जो कागज आप जारी करते हैं ना वो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट होता है परीक्षा का पेपर जो बनाते हैं बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट लीगल बाउंडिंग है कि हमको ये तय करना है कि वो जो बच्चा है उसने मिनिमम स्किल मिनिमम नॉलेज एक्वायर कर लिया अभी मैं आपको एक घटना बताता हूँ हमारे अपना असेसमेंट रेटिंग के लेके हम लोग बहुत बात कर रहे हैं नीति आयोग से पूछ आया कि एनएपीएच संस्था के साथ मिलके कुछ काम करते हैं कंसल्टेंट आए हमने बोला क्या करते बोले बोले हम लोग एग्रीडेट करते हैं अच्छा भी वो बोले नैक का भी बात आया वहां आप में से कई कॉलेज में नैक भी है तो उनसे पूछा कि आपका बच्ची डॉक्टर बना तो कौन सा मेडिकल कॉलेज में डालेंगे दो चॉइस देता हूं लेडी हार्डिंग और मणिपाल यूनिवर्सिटी बोले लेडी हार्डिंग में डालेंगे बोले अच्छा अच्छा आप काम क्या करते हैं बोले हम लोग लिस्ट बनाते हैं मैं बोला भैया मणिपाल यूनिवर्सिटी को कितना नैक दिए बोले नैक मिल गया इनको लेडी हार्डिंग को बोले नहीं मिला सो यू गेट माई आंसर यू आर डूइंग दैट जॉब You are preparing that list, and your choice is Lady Harding. This we won't want. This commission, this नहीं चाहता है. और ये जब ही संभव होगा, जब आप हमारे साथ खड़े होंगे. और साथ कैसे खड़े होंगे? With a common intent. यदि हमारे intent में देश है, हम साथ खड़े नहीं हो सकते. So I leave upon to you. Then एक और चीज़ है कि we have a compulsion related to इंस्पेक्शन यदि आयोग चाहेगा तो निरीक्षण तो आपको कराना पड़ेगा क्योंकि कई चीजें वी नीड टू वेरीफाई लेकिन वो बताया ना दादागिरी के लिए नहीं होता है मिनिमम असेंशियल स्टैंडर्ड हो रहा है या नहीं हो रहा है इसका भी एक टाइम बाउंडिंग प्रक्रिया है वो थोड़ा जाना पड़ता है उससे सेंसिटाइज होता है कई बार एक्सचेंज ऑफ आइडिया होता है वो सारी बातें हैं देन देर इज रिलेटेड टू अगेन आई से कैसा नया कॉलेज खुल रहा है मैं कई बार देखा कि उनसे पूछा जमीन किधर है तो बोले वो हमारा रेजोल्यूशन है ट्रस्ट ने बैठे और ये कागज है और ऐसा कागज लगाते उसमें बहुत झगड़ा होता है मैं आपको ये बताता हूं कि आपको जमीन चाहिए मैं एक बेचवा लू आप खरीदवा रहे हैं वैसा कागज दे दूं क्या आप जमीन ले लेंगे क्या पूरा पैसा दे देंगे क्या नहीं देंगे भाई बंद में भी आप कर लीजिए यही सारी चीज का जवाब है आप हर कृत को वैसा करिए जैसा आप अपने साथ डील करते हैं आपका आधा प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व हो जाएगा इसके लिए भी एक और उदाहरण देता हूं आई वेंट टू नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ फैमिली हेल्थ एंड वेलफेयर उस समय डीएनबी के डीजी से मैं नाम थोड़ा भूल रहा हूं उन्हें हमको ट्रेनिंग लिया डॉक्टर्स को फाइनेंशियल एंड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ट्रेनिंग तो वो वहां पे चर्चा ये निकला कि डॉक्टर्स लोग भूख डरते हैं जांच बैठ जाएगा हमको ये पसंद नहीं है खरीदते ही नहीं है उतना रूल कौन पड़ता है करके ऐसा है तो उन्होंने आपको एक ही बात बताया आप कोई घर में भी तो खरीदारी करते हैं वहां पे जनरल फाइनेंशियल रूल्स लेके खरीदते हैं क्या एंड यू गो विद बेस्ट डिसीजन वही इंटेंट हमको एक्ट के साथ चाहिए कि हम उसको अपने ऊपर लागू करते तो क्या व्यवहार अपेक्षा करते और जब दूसरे पे लागू करते तो क्या व्यवहार अपेक्षा करते और ये दोनों पे लागू होता है एज अ रेगुलेटर टू दिस साइड एज अ स्टेक होल्डर टू अदर साइड ये दोनों पे लागू होता है कि कोई सिचुएशन पे हमको कैसा व्यवहार चाहिए एंड दिस इज ऑल व्हाट आई वांट टू कम्युनिकेट इन शॉर्ट स्पैन ऑफ टाइम और उसके अलावा आपका कोई क्वेश्चन हो तो मैं आई विल बी हैप्पी टू रिप्लाई बट आई अगेन से गो थ्रू दी एक्ट try to understand the intent of act first and when you understand that intent then you go over the words and you will find i am hopeful we don't have any litigation in between us there can be a difficult situation that i agree but there will be no litigation ghar mein bhi kya hota hai na pati patni ke beech mein tension hota hai kai baar har baar case nahi hota hai wo last hi hai aisa hai karte with this i had aur mere liye taali baja dijiye acha lage
thank you sir i think we are having an open discussion tomorrow so we will put across all the questions and uh, discussion points in the session and uh, thank you for the enlightening session and now we are having our last session of the day the concluding session by dr navin pawalskar he is the director gems homeopathic medical college and hospital telangana uh, he has a rich experience of 25 years in healthcare and uh, clinical care so may i please pass on the stage to him thank you Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Respected principals, uh, senior teachers, directors, uh, council members. Uh, thank you all for your patience. I have been watching everyone. They have been peacefully and cordially listening to whatever has been said so far. I'll keep my talk very short, and I'll be very, very direct. i assure you no philosophy just direct uh, actions that need to be seen in order to be seen as maintaining your records i think the underlining word is a functioning hospital and uh, what do you need to first maintain as records to be seen as a functioning hospital <coughs> so most of us might be of uh, carrying a fallacy that only nch regulates our hospital no our hospital is regulated by eight different ministries okay so please understand our hospital is regulated by health and family welfare environmental ministry ministry of education labor and employment ayush ministry of course department of Art atomic energy finance and commerce so all these agencies are directly or indirectly regulating your hospitals so please remember this word you need to have eight ministries you are addressing to eight ministries at any given point of time these eight ministries are regulating us through different boards and directorates so we have of course national commission of homeopathy is one of the uh, commission then we have district health and family welfare directorate of health and medical education ayush directorate university grant commission state universities atomic energy regulatory board excise department pollution control board water management and sewerage management board state fire and disaster management agency esic epfo foods regulatory authorities labor department and ambulance registration so in short you should have 16 certificates with you 16 departments are regulating you simple as simple as that go to your state and find out which are the 16 departments which are regulated these 16 departments these are the 16 departments which are regulating the hospital this has nothing to do with uh, homeopathy ayurveda yunani modern medicine if you are a clinical established if you are providing clinical care you are under clinical establishment act and these 16 bodies will regulate you irrespective of what is the therapy that you are offering in your hospital so these are the different licenses and approvals that you need for a for demonstrating a functional hospital you need first land registration and stamp uh, departments hospital constructions you have to have state metropolitan development 
authority approvals. State power distribution company will give you a different approval if you are a hospital. Water supply department will give you a different approval if you are a commercial hospital. Sewerage and NOC from sewerage department is a must because you are going to send out biomedical waste, not just in solid form, but also in liquid forms. Your labs are, you know, sending out urines and bloods drained into the system. So you have a separate, uh, you know, NOC that is required for that. Of course, you need dry waste management, which is non-biomedical waste. Then you need a biomedical waste management, a fire license, which clearly indicates what are your fire security uh, measures in case your hospital catches fire. Then hospital registration and clinical establishment from your directorate of medical education, or if, it, if you are in a rural area, then the district health medical officer. You need labor license because you are going to employ non-medical staff, which have, falls under, as somebody was saying in the morning, should have minimum wage scale, so that comes under your labor license. And of course, you need a pollution control NOC. This is not it. There we go. We need patient transport vehicle registrations for transportation of patients. You can't just transport patients in any vehicle. Ultrasound scanning, I think everybody knows we need the PCP and DD registration. You need an alcohol license from state excise department to use alcohol in your laboratories. Registration and birth and death certificate. Sterilization and autoclaving is an authorized thing that you can do under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. District medical officer regulates it. You, if you are going to store oxygen and nitrous oxide, then you need a contract with a legal vendor who has these license. If you are managing a canteen or a hospital catering, then you need an FSSI license and a contracted vendor who also has an FSSI registration. If you are managing homeopathic medicines and dispensing them, then of course your state government, Department of Ayush will give you the license required for that. If you have a functioning OT where any kind of anesthetic agent is used, then you need a prescription drug license for use of opioids. Of course, then you need public provident fund, ESIC, and ambulance registration. You cannot use an unregistered ambulance for transportation of patients. So, in short, you need 22 different licenses to run a hospital. Eight ministries, 16 boards, 22 licenses. Please remember these numbers and you will be through. Right. Do we need all of them at one stage? No, we don't. We can have certain in pre-planning stage, when those who are intending to start a new college, you can have entity registration, society registration, company registration, board of directors, governing body, and bylaws governance in your pre-planning stage. Okay, when your hospital, when you're just conceiving the ideas, these are the, these are the approvals that you need in your pre-planning stage. When you go to the planning stage, when you really decide to go and construct the hospital, then you, before doing that, you need to have clinical establishment registration, land registration, MDA approval, means Metropolitan, Metropolitan Development Authority approval, water board approval, patient transport licenses, pollution control, fire safety and electricity board. This is in the planning stage, even before your hospital has put a brick over there. And when you are actually operating, these are the ones that you need. PCP and DT, AERB, homeopathic drug storage distribution, prescription drug storage license, approval of inflammable gas storages, which you get from fire and disaster management, and autoclave and sterilizations from your district health offices. Alcohol storage, food storage and distribution, Employee Provident Fund, ESIC, Biomedical Waste and Dry Waste Management, these come in the later part. So this is how your 22 licenses get discovered. So if you don't have it, you don't have an entity itself. Right? So the first part of the presentation was for all of us to demonstrate that hospital as an entity exists. So this is what you need first and then your functioning part comes. As to why do we maintain a record in any case? And when should we start maintaining a clinical record when a patient is arriving? The first thing to do is whenever your patient walks in first, 
whether he is a registered patient of your hospital or not, any entry or exit record is absolutely essential. Even if you have just triaged him, the record has to be maintained. What is that record? It is a brief account of personal and medical history of the client, results of diagnostic tests, findings of medical examination, treatment, nursing care, daily progress notes, and advice on discharge. These are the records that are absolutely essential. I'll list them out later on for you. Why are they important that we maintain these records? Because this data is with, sorry, this data contains leads of the treatment and the decisions by the doctor, which are not only important for advising the treatment, but also the decisions are important as a legal decisions that will stand in the courts. It also, our records also indicate effective communication between the two doctors or between the two health professionals. So if your patient wants to take a transfer from your hospital to another hospital, that records that you have created tells the other doctor what you were treating, what were you trying to do with your patients. So I think from all the three angles, maintaining a record, clinical record is essential. Sorry. So, and very clearly, your documentation involves certain rules, regulations, and procedures and protocols. You cannot document it as and when you want. You cannot document it with your whims and fancies. There are two or three things which is very important. They are medical and personal information. So privacy and integrity of the records is absolutely essential. It's an effective professional communication between two doctors or two healthcare institutions. Hence, your records have to be comprehensive and complete. And it has to do with continuity of care, which is very, very important for the patients because patients will migrate from one hospital to another hospital. And it has to do with the treatment decisions. Whatever be your therapy, your treatment decisions should be recorded on the prescription. And it involves certain clear procedures, protocols, rules, and responsibilities, which I will show you in the next slide. <coughs> so what is the use of record keeping? Yes, sab kyu karna? It doesn't fetch us money directly, right? It doesn't generate any kind of funds for us. One, it tells that the patient had ad was admitted in your hospital or had walked in for any kind of care in your hospital. Two, it gives a completeness because you give a complete necessary notes, clinical records, and discharge summaries. It helps you archive your records, which is very, very important in a teaching hospital. I'll come to that point, why we should be archiving this. It gives you a patient statistics. It gives you your statistics for research. It gives you the statistics to upload for regulatory agencies. These are important issues, and most important, what is now going to happen is we are already working with the <coughs> insurance uh, agencies. So your records will be needed to even code the diagnosis. Because without that, your patients will not be able to get any insurance coverage and their reimbursement. So you will need the records to do your coding as well. So these are five different things. Some of them are useful directly to the patients. Some of them are useful for you to you know, up update your regulatory authorities. And some of them are useful for you to understand the continuity of the care. So how many types of records do we have in a hospital? We have basically four types of records in the hospital. There are treatment decision records which essentially are the common records that we use, case records, diagnostic records, vital charts, diet charts, prescription charts, anesthesia charts, input-output charts. This is something that a doctor uses day in and day out. Then there are legal records, like consent forms, death certificates, birth certificate, fitness certificate, disability certificates. These are called legal records, which are equally essential. Then we have quality control records, which essentially speak about infection control in the hospital, your sterilization, autoclave records, SOPs for in infection controls, and patient feedbacks. And the last, your business records, which essentially tells you what is your OPD register, how much is your coffer ringing, how much money you are earning, how much is coming from which part of your hospital, how much coming from IPD, how much is coming from your investigations, 
how much is coming from your OPD. So you need all types of records to run a hospital. So if you want to really demonstrate a functioning hospital, then all these records should be interconnected and available at any given point of time. They are all interconnected records. So these are the registers that one need to maintain in the hospital. A central OPD register, an IPD register, casualty and daycare register, all diagnostic registers such as ECG, USG, X-ray, sterilization, fumigation, autoclave, how many operations you have conducted, type of operations, their classifications, diet registered, medicine dispensing registered and pharmacy stock registers. Further, pathology lab sample collections are also required for quality check because many of the samples get mismanaged and then you have litigations. Blood grouping register, which is now very, very essential. Biopsy sample register, security register and movement, which records the movements of the patients in inside and outside. Remember, very important, if your patient gets discharged at 5 o'clock in the evening and if it is recorded in your movement register and if he suffers an heart attack at 5, 5, you will be saved if you have an entry in your register that he moved out at 5 o'clock from my hospital. So these registers are very critical and legally important. There is an inventory register, a GRN, office inward outwards, birth registers, death registers, MTP, sterilization and most important vaccination registers. If we are going to go with the national uh, health policy, then all these registers are going to be important. You can maintain a physical copy or you can maintain an electronic copy, it does not matter, but these registers are very, very important. So what are different forms that we need to use in the hospital? Of course, there is an OPD case record, which everybody knows. Your IPD case record should have all these forms maintained over there. There should be a requisition form for investigations, which has to be signed by the doctor. And then there has to be an indent form. Even if you are ordering a homeopathic medicine, arsenical 30, it has to be mentioned in an indent form and it has to be ordered from a pharmacy. So, I would suggest that there should be a proper medical records department which does all this functioning. Registration of new patients, retrieval of old case records, this is a very big challenge. Half the time the case records are not retrievable, which causes great loss to our patients because each time he is asked a new history. Can you imagine somebody being asked history five times and that too homeopathic? You know, because your old case record is lost, it is very embarrassing and tiring to our patients as well and it causes a lot of harm to our own system as well. You need to have ICD code diagnosis, mortality and morbidity record should be maintained by the medical records department, birth records and all other records as we have spoken earlier. This is how is a standard flowchart for your medical records department to function. And your medical records department has to function on a 24-7 basis. It is not once in a year uh, assortment of all your medical records. It is to be functioning on 24-7 basis, at least on a daily basis. If, and this protocol has to be mentioned. So a medical record personnel has to be available in the hospital for 24 into 3 duties. I mean 8 into 3 duties. Then you have personal health, medical records and health records which are different different and they have to be indexed in a different way. How do you take care of the health records? One, put them in the safe custody, don't put them somewhere here or there in some boxes. No individual sheet of a record should ever be separated from the main record. You should never do that. Records are kept in a hospital which is not accessible to clients and visitors. So nobody should be able to steal them. No stranger should be ever allowed to enter or read the hospital records. You have legal rights over it. You need not allow others to read those records. Records are not handed over to legal advisors without return permission of the administration. So even if somebody says, I have put a case on you, you have your own time, you have 7 to 10 days to retrieve your record, take a legal permission and then hand it over to the patient. 
all hospital personnel are legally and ethically obligated to keep confidence the information of the records which are provided and all records are to be handled carefully careless handling destroys record if the whole record gets destroyed you are in a soup if part record gets destroyed you are in more soup so better to keep your records intact okay you have to index your records either alphabetically alpha numerically with the index card or with the geographical thing depending on how you want to index it all the records are identified based on biodata that is the demographics of the patient or based on their opd or based on their diagnosis the records are never to be sent out of the hospital without the treating doctor's permission the treating doctor's endorsement is very important without that you cannot send the record out of your hospital well this is how nabh advises you it should have a retrieval mechanism the thing that you see on the top is your retrieval office and the thing that you see in the middle is your indexing office and that is the index record that is there so your medical records department should have three sub parts there is a retrieval office there is an indexing office and then there is actual record keeping that is there i think we should not be doing this right we i think most of us do this let's not do it it's not going to work in future this is what you need to do and this is what nabh will advise you to do all the time unless you have three different departments in your medical report you will not be able to function now these are new records which are legally uh, admissible there is telemedicine recording which can happen which is legally admissible as well as it can be treated as a treating document there is personal health record with a patient can come which is like what you see as a microsoft health world a patient can come and share that data with you directly and say this is a part of my record you can have electronic health records you have digitalized health records which essentially means you have written down in physical form and then you have digitalized them and indexed them it is not as just important to just digitalize and put it in a hard disk you need to index it you need to also know how to retrieve it so there are retrieval softwares available and of course there are remote gadgets like what you see on the orange when your patient might be there in an ambulance this retri this remote gadgets can directly transfer information to your hospital before the patient reaches your uh, emergency ward so these kind of now newer health records are getting created and yes this is a very common question when can i destroy my medical records we are in a hurry to destroy it but most of the times if you are a, just a clinical practitioner in a, in a opd you should at least keep your data for 3 to 5 years 5 years is ideal if there is a medical legal case going on then your record should be maintained for 10 years and plus and if you are if it is a non mlc an ipd record should be kept minimum for 8 to 10 years and the ideal situation now is that you digitalize all these records using a high speed scanner it takes one day to dig to digitalize more than 1000 papers high speed scanners can digitalize it index it and then you can throw off all your records that too after 8 to 10 years so this is a clear mandate as to how you should be using your hospital there is a record section in health and family welfare clinical establishment act which actually tells you about all this and caution please do not photoshop your records you are clearly committing a crime if you are photoshopping your records any kinds of records should not be photoshopped they should be preserved as actual okay so i just put a joke over there your x ray shows a rip broken rib and we have fixed it with the photoshopping so that's not what we should be doing so don't fix it don't fix any of your record try to create a pdf and then put something else in your record and then try to create a duplicate record you will get caught and that will be a problem for you so this is how a functioning hospital should maintain the records the decorum of record maintenance how to take care of your records when to destroy your records this is where the situation is if you want to learn further 
there is research, everybody was talking about clinical research, there is data record maintenance research going on, how, uh, what are the best possible research, that, I mean methods to maintain a hospital records. These are some of the references that you can read through for further reading. Well, I think uh, I finished much before what I was supposed to be and I hope that I have talked straight and straight. I have not done anything here. I have to do this. Thank you very much. Sir, you are So, uh, ABDM is nothing but we are developing a common platform for uh, all the clinical conditions that could be treated with homeopathy through a standard treatment protocols and we have now identified more than uh, 100 conditions for which standard treatment protocols are getting built and those will then be circulated to the treating hospitals to share with the TPAs and based on that the hospitals will be given a certain kind of records to manage and then you will have a collaboration with the TPA and the insurance management which will come into play in a short while. I think we have reached a penultimate phase of that. We have been working over it for the last two or three years. So after this you will be able to handle the hospitals will get uh, insurances for admitting patients under Ayush care, especially homeopathy. That is the thing. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. It's been it's been end of the day, and uh, I really appreciate that uh, everybody is in the auditorium. Uh, somebody mentioned about how our students feel when they are made to sit, but I believe this is worthwhile because this is what is going to translate into future of homeopathy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for the enlightening session and now we will conclude the day. Uh, it has been a long day for everyone I suppose. So we'll meet tomorrow uh, at around 9.30, 9.45 so that we can start the sessions in time by 10 a.m. And uh, you, uh, all of you are requested to please join us for a cup of tea. Thank you so much. There is an announcement for participants. I request you all tomorrow you come up with your TA bill filled. If you can settle your hotel bills morning, it will be easy for us. There will be the representatives from NCH at the counter outside. You fill your TA form along with original bills and you submit and there will be a list to sign you have submitted for record and it will be examined and your payment will be uh, made through electronic transfer. Don't argue at the counter, simply put your bills in original along with TA form. I, I will ensure ki and don't forget to mention your account details. There is a column into it. Don't leave, left it blank. AFSC code and account details are must to get the amount transfer. Thank you. Sorry, just